So we've all heard about this. I mean, it, it's something that we've now lived and worked with for at least 10, 15, 20 years. All governments talk about it. But it's from a geological point of view, it's understanding, or at least to my mind, it's understanding what are the drivers that are going to influence and impact the mining industry, at least the extractives industry in the next 20 to 30 years. What are we going to be looking for? Which minerals, which commodities? How is it going to impact South Africa specifically, but Africa as a whole, and then reaching out into the broader world context? Now, there's a lot of other speakers which are going to tackle specific aspects of this. So my talk is hopefully a general broad overview. I'm going to be touching on a number of other topics which I believe are relevant and will have an impact, even though we don't necessarily always think about these. For interest and for the purposes, I guess, of clarity, um, this presentation will be made available. And what I'm also going to do in conjunction with this is a number of reports and documents that I refer to in this presentation, I'm going to pack together in a data pack, which I'll make available to download. So you don't need to go and you know start hunting around and seeing if all the links I'm used are still active. So where does this get us? Well, probably something which is self-evident, but we don't always necessarily think about it too much is the whole reason for energy transitions and, and moving and doing all these weird and wonderful things is us. So this is what's referred to, thanks Tanya, so this is what's referred to as a cartogram. So it, a cartogram is taking a world map or a map and then expanding it based on, in this case, population numbers, or it can be density or, or any other parameter they want to have a look at. So this is the United Nations prediction of world population in the year 2050. Now, when you start researching critical minerals and energy transitions, there's three critical dates that tend to pop out. 2020, which is obviously gone. Uh, a lot of the plans for 2020 didn't realize. 2030 and then 2050. Are, are the, the next critical dates the um, organizations such as United Nations and World Economic Forum tend to target as milestones for things to have happened. So what we can see is, in general, a very large increase in population and population densities in Asia, specifically Indian and China, Africa, and then effectively reduction in population, at least population density in the developed, in the developed world. This doesn't necessarily always translate into an increase in consumption, but what it does tell you is there's going to be larger pressures on those areas logically with larger populations. Now, what is of interest to a lot of people from a geopolitical viewpoint at the moment is India, uh, I think it was two months ago, overtook China as being the most populated com uh, country on earth. The problem is from an Indian point of view, at least an economic point of view, India has nowhere near the, the processing powers that China does. So for example, if you look at the steel industry, India has approximately 10% of the equivalent processing or smelting um, ability that China does. So even though India has got this massive and well-educated population from a processing point of view and an extractor's point of view, it's still not competitive with China. In the same way, when you start looking at Europe, even though it's showing a high increased density population, a lot of that is due to migration coming from Africa and specifically India at this stage. Countries in Europe are totally dependent on imports of critical raw materials. So for example, France is 100% is the industry of France is 100% reliant on imports of raw materials from outside the EU. But also what happens with people, I mean, obviously people need jobs. So what tends to happen then is people tend to move into cities and we have the process which we refer to as urbanization. And there we are. So this is the current prediction for 2030. So sorry, there's a bit of disconnect with information which is available out there. But as you can see, massive industrialization and urbanization, sorry, massive urbanization occurring in um, the Asian subcontinent, specifically in India and China less so in the Americas and Africa, but you can see there's going to be zones of higher density. Now, as soon as we have zones of higher density, obviously there's energy requirements, there's requirements for housing, there's requirements for jobs, there's requirements for a whole load of things. This tends to be a bit problematic, specifically in the African context, where what we tend to see is 
the agglomeration of people around large areas where there is the potential for jobs. But what tends to happen or has happened historically in specifically the African context, but it's also seen quite strongly in the Indian and the South American context, is that there is no, um, no infrastructure, additional infrastructure development at the same time. So if you start looking at places like, say, Luanda, which in 2030 is predicted to be one of or be the largest sub-Saharan city in Africa, and again, just remember, you need to go and check where the state comes from. It's not always the most reliable. I'm going to point that out in some slides going forward. But what you tend to see in African urbanization, if you start looking at the slides where you're comparing, and I apologize for the quality. This is one of the reports I will upload. When you start looking at somewhere like, say, Barcelona, and comparing that to, say, somewhere like Dakar, you can see that in Barcelona, for example, there's a lot of money spent on additional infrastructure spent. So tarred roads, um, green spaces. So to try and make the city habitable for the populace. In other cases like Dakar, and those of you who've been to Dakar know it's an absolute nightmare to get around because the infrastructure is just not built to cope with the number of people that go there. So some of you are thinking, well, okay, well, that sounds all very well and good and interesting, Mark, but what does that actually mean from a geological point of view or from a, a raw materials extractive point of view? Well, it gets onto this little thing. We need infrastructure. One of the critical things that we need when we're building infrastructure is sand and cement, and to a certain degree, water. Now, sand in this context, just take into account that would include aggregates. The critical thing about this aspect is sand and aggregate in general are not recyclable. So once you build a building and you break it down, you can't use that material, it's lost to you forever. But we also need a lot of cement. So just bear these numbers in mind when we start getting into the next lot of slides where I'm going to be referring to cement and implications of cement and what that actually means to the green energy transition, but also things like energy requirements and carbon dioxide emissions. But as the world grows and the population of the world grows, what we tend to see is obviously a related increase in our energy requirements. Now, what that does tell us is one, our population, and, and some of these are gonna be saying, yeah, sure, but this is self-evident. A lot of times people don't sort of look at the self-evident and try and relate it back to well, what's going to impact on us and as we're going forward. So as the population increases, by default, in any developing society, you are going to need more energy because people need electricity and they want schools and housing and jobs, okay? Energy requirements go up. That is then going to be directly proportional to the size of your population. So as you can see here, Asia, because it's got the largest populations, so China and India, and to a certain degree, Indonesia, will have an expo exponential growth in the energy requirements. Countries with the population is static or shrinking will, in general, tend to have static or lowering, lowering energy requirements, and it's those areas where, theoretically, you can probably make the transition to green energy or renewable energy a lot easier because you don't necessarily have the pressure of a young, expanding population needing jobs and needing security. So one of the things to, when you're looking at these type of slides of data, is to just refer to the type of units that are being used. This one is British thermal units. You'll see things like terawatts and gigawatts as well. So just make sure you're looking at the, the correct units and translate those. But at the same time, we also need to see from a demographic or at least a geographical point of view, where these energy requirements are going to be coming from and what they're going to be used for. So in OECD countries, which effectively um, Organization of Economic Community and Development, so these are what would be traditionally referred to as um, developed economies, so countries like America and the EU. So the economies are there, you know, they've now moved from primary manufacturing into quaternary industries, so a lot of financial service industries. Okay, so they tend not to have such large energy requirements. Economies in countries which are in the developmental stage or they're moving from, you know, not having any industry to moving into industrial society into an industrial based economy they tend to have large energy requirements so as you can see most of these are non-oecd countries so countries which are 
traditionally referred to as emerging economies or what used to be referred to as the third world economies, as they start developing, they're going to need more and more energy requirements. In this case, most of those energy requirements tend to come from primary energy dense sources. Okay, so energy dense sources are oil and coal. So, for example, in, the, in COP26, uh, China and India, if I remember correctly, have been allowed to continue using coal and oil as primary energy sources until 2050 when they have agreed to they're going to start moving to renewables. Other countries, such as the United Kingdom and Germany and France, have indicated that sort of 2030. 2035 is going to be the time that they're going to be dominantly reliable on renewable energy sources. So how do we tend to do this? Well, as you can see, there is a change. Nuclear energy tends to be relatively static. The reasons why is really it goes down to politics. Most nuclear power plants will generate weapons grade nuclear material because of the uh, Nuclear Energy Proliferation Act, it tends not to be, uh, or it tends to be frowned upon a bit for countries to start building nuclear power plants because as soon as you've got a nuclear power plant, like in South Africa's case or India or China, you can build your own atom bombs if you are so inclined. Other countries, so for example, China and India, highly dependent on coal, they have large coal resources, Africa as well, massive coal resources, and for a long period of time, Africa will more than likely be dependent on coal. Even though in the South African context, the South African government apparently has indicated that they want to move away from coal, but that's another discussion which I'm sure is going to come up with other presenters during the course of the day. Renewables, as you can see, massive drive. And again, that is mainly or primarily driven by our developed economies, where there is um, agreements on COP26 and the Paris Accords and various other accords to move to renewable sources of energy. But what did that, does then, that then say to us in terms of, well, okay, so yes, we're going to renewable energy. Yes, we need to develop. Yes, we need energy. Yes, we've got growing populations. So what does that look like again, back into our African context? This is what McKinsey and co said, and I think this is from 28, yeah, 2018 data. So this is a review that McKinsey and company did in terms of Africa. <clears throat> and again, trying to explain why Africa is not fulfilling her potential. As most of us who have lived and worked in Africa will know, just because you're connected to an energy grid does not necessarily mean you're guaranteed of having energy all the time. So for any country to want to develop its economy, you need, and this is one of those, well, it's self-evident, but you need a source of low cost, stable energy if you want to do anything. Okay, so even if you want to move away from heavy industry and you don't want to do mining, you want to go into, service desk or cloud base or any IT industry, you still need a supply of constant cheap energy. Um, server farms, again, everybody going onto the cloud, server farms consume a massive amount of energy and produce a huge amount of heat. Again, it's the type of thing that tends not to get discussed too much because everybody's focusing on carbon emissions from primary industry, but server farms generate a massive amount of heat and they consume a massive amount of energy. So but let's just take us back to the beginning. Where did this all start from? And again, some of this is self-evident and some of this tends to get lost as we talk about COP26 and moving forward to 2030 and 2050. So in 2006, Vice President Al Gore published a book, uh, well, sorry, did a documentary, published a book called An Inconvenient Truth, where he documented scientific findings indicating that the average temperature of the earth was increasing uh, at that stage by approximately one degree Celsius every decade. Implications of this, as was stated round about in, 20, in 2006 was the polar ice caps would be melting, um, the sea levels would rise. So around about 2020, countries such as the Maldives and Vanuatu would be submerged underwater. Now, those things haven't necessarily have occurred at this stage, but the data does appear to indicate that at this stage, on a global basis, there is an increase in temperature. Now, the general logic to this and the accepted belief is this is effectively due to carbon emissions. Um, and the whole 
logic or argument behind our green energy transition is if we continue releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, we are going to potentially increase the average global temperature to a point that current vegetative and habitable patterns will change radically and the areas which are currently habitable will not be habitable, triggering massive migrations and starvation and all the associated socioeconomic problems that will then go with that. What this did, and because it was being driven in many ways by politicians, is this, and a lot of concerned society, this indicated or this grew in itself until we got to the point of 2015, where amongst others, um, Tony Blair and various other world leaders got together in Paris and signed what's known as the Paris Accords. Now, most people think the Paris Accords are only about global warming. It's not. It actually covers a whole host of discussion documents, for want of a better word, to try and regulate or change humanity's behavior in the way that we interact with the planet. What most people know, or the primary takeaways, though, is what we often refer to or is referred to as the 1.5S and the 2S targets. So the 1.5S target is an attempt by world leaders to not allow the average global temperature of the planet to increase above 1.5 degrees Celsius. The benchmark for that is going back here. So the pre-industrial time period, so before humanity started burning large amounts of coal, oil, and gas to create or develop and drive economic direct to drive the world economies, or at least national economies. Okay, so to do this, we need to change the way we do things. Now, a lot of people worry about, well, we've never done an energy transition at all. Actually, humanity has at various stages, they tend to be larger leaps and historical leaps. The big thing is, as you can see, has always been carbon-based. So we've always moved from one form of energy-dense material to another form of energy-dense material. So going back to the medieval period, people burned wood. They then moved to charcoal because charcoal is a more energy-efficient form of energy. And then once the charcoal ran out, then people started moving to coal and eventually to gas. Um, back in the 18, 1900s, the whale population was beginning to become extinct again. This wasn't necessarily used for a heating substance. It was used for a whole lot of other things. But because paraffin became, more, became cheaper and cheaper after the discovery of oil and gas in America, well, there was a transition because it was cheaper and it was more profitable. And paraffin is a lot more energy dense than whale oil. Whale oil. The same way moving from coal-powered ships to oil powered ships, again, technological advancements, but has also had an, again, an economic driver. Most people don't think about it, it's been lost in history, but Winston Churchill in the 1920s commanded or made a rule that British ships, mil British military, naval, British naval ships would be moving from coal to oil. Why? Well, Britain effectively had annexed Saudi Arabia, had access to all the oil in Saudi Arabia. Oil was a lot cheaper than coal because you could pump it out, you weren't paying a lot of salaries to people to go and mine it underground. And at the same time, it allowed the British government, which was then financially cash strapped to shut down a whole lot of naval stations across the then British Empire. So again, you had all those cost savings, as well as the ship could move a lot further, and you didn't need as many people to stoke, pardon me, the furnaces. Same way, health was a, a thing, horses, if you ever, you know, when you watch movies about America and there's brownstones in New York and you see those funny basement bits, well, those funny basement bits were where people would dump all the horse manure because it stank up and filled up the streets. But what we are seeing now is we're moving from non -car or carbon based to non carbon based. And it's because of this concept of carbon, uh, sorry, greenhouse gases, which are given or primarily focused on as being major contributors to, pardon me, temperature increase in the world. So what are they? Well, a lot of times people talk about this, but not tend not to think, well, where do they come from? What do they mean? So the biggest one at the moment is obviously burning of coal, oil, and gas, which contributed this stage 65%.
there are other sources of carbon dioxide. So looking at forestry and farming, methane, but probably the more interesting thing when we start to move to our green energy economy is, well, what about the, the substitutes that we're using? And one of the interesting ones, which is getting a lot of credence in the scientific literature, but has not necessarily popped its way onto, you know, everybody's talking about it, is what's referred to as SF6 gas. Now, as you can see, it's used in energy transmission. And when we're looking at windmills and wind turbines, well, this is what we need to, pardon me, to be an insulator and to work in our turbines, except it is even worse in terms of um, greenhouse gases and then carbon dioxide. And as you can see, it's got a residence time of over 3000 years. So good thing, bad thing, who knows? Is it going to be material? Again, these are the type of discussion points which eventually will start coming out in the wash as we start moving into our energy transition. But we just need to have a look at briefly, well, where are the culprits of this? Well, as you can see, and it, again, it should be one of these things after talking about populations and stuff, well, growing economies like China are, or do have the largest carbon dioxide emissions. What you need to though take into account is this is total is not necessarily in terms of per capita. So if you're looking in terms of how much carbon per person, well, America is still the biggest culprit. So we need to start looking at these in context. So yes, you can talk about total amount of carbon dioxide emission, or you can talk in terms of how much carbon dioxide is emitted per person. So getting into this whole concept of the individual carbon footprint. In my personal opinion, when we start looking about individual carbon footprints, it starts getting into, well, what about isms? because then you start seeing people, well, you know, guilt trips and stuff. Is it going to be relevant? Isn't going to be relevant. The fact is there is a lot of carbon dioxide being emitted. And if you think about it, if the world population is currently sitting, I think it's 6 billion people and there's forecast to go up to 10 billion people. Well, we are going to be emitting just by being people and having children and wanting to develop. We are going to emit a lot more carbon dioxide. So if you want to build things or if you want to have economies that prosper, again, we're going to be start, we just by default, we will start burning off more carbon dioxide. Now, what is quite interesting here, and those of you looking at the tail end, yes, obviously COVID has had a massive impact on how and why and where we use energy. So any data from about 2019 until 2022 is more than likely skewed. Is it worthwhile using it in any extrapolations? Potentially not. As you can see, things like the global financial crisis down here, there was a massive tail off, but then you can see we rapidly got up to the same, if not higher rates of energy usage than we did. What I do want you to have a look at though, is right down here, when we start looking at cement, okay? From 1960, relatively low uses, and as we're moving forward in time, the amount of energy we use, uh, sorry, the amount of cement we're manufacturing is increasing. Well, again, getting back to the initial slides, well, yes, as population increases, and yes, as people move to cities, you are going to have to build more buildings, whether the schools or hospitals, sewage lines, um, the, the foundations for wind turbines, you're just going to have to manufacture more and more cement. But where is this all happening? This is quite an interesting slide or scary, depending on which way, way you want to look at it is China manufactures more cement than the entire world combined. As you can see, India comes in a very, very poor second. And the rest of the world just does not have the same capacity as China does in cement manufacturing. What is probably more interesting or scary, depending on the view that you take, is very little of that cement manufactured in China is actually exported. That cement is used for internal purposes, okay? Um, there's another presentation I'll upload, but there's one of the, the, the so-called factoids I came across that America in the last 10 years used more or manufactured and used more cement than America did in the last century. Okay, so again, I'm sure some of you are thinking, okay, again, that's interesting, but what does it mean to me as a geologist and what does this mean to green energy transitions? Well, this is what goes into cement, or at least some of the components. Now you can start seeing our primary components, which means we are still going to have to go and mine all of this stuff. Probably the interesting thing is the so-called secondary things. And I want to bring your attention to this fly ash and flue gas desulfurization gypsum. 
Now, those of us that are a certain age can remember when we had acid rain. So basically coal fire plants, um, steel manufacturing plants emitting gases which contain sulfur dioxide that mixed with rain and became sulfuric acid. Okay, the way that problem was solved was by installing scrubbers into the chimneys. And one of the byproducts of that is what's referred to as FGD, which then goes into the cement manufacturing process. So as we're going green, we're going to be getting rid of coal-fired power stations. And theoretically, if we can start limiting the amount of um, coal or rather steel being manufactured using carbon and, use, and, and hydrogen produced steel can actually work, if it's economically sustainable, then again, we're no longer going to, or we're going to reduce the amount of FGD. Except, and this is where the interesting side effects start coming in. As Germany, for example, is reducing, reducing its reliance on coal-fired gas power stations, or sorry, coal-fired power stations, what they're now seeing, and this has been raised by the German building industry in a very interesting discussion paper, is they're now running into a shortage of fly ash. So there's no fly ash, so they're now having a problem in terms of cement manufacturing because they're not getting enough fly ash, the prices of cement are going up, therefore the price of building is going up, okay? Where do you get it? Well, now Germany has begun to import, or I understand Germany is beginning to import fly ash from surrounding countries like Romania and Bulgaria, where coal-fired power stations are still being used. So that's all very well and interesting. So, but how do, how do again, how does this translate into all, well, green and technology and critical metals and minerals? Well, if we're going to do this, we're going to be using different technologies. Those different technologies use a lot of different metals and minerals in those technologies and they're sourced from different areas. Uh, unfortunately, this link um, no longer works. So I can give you the slide. It was done by a French company or French bank called PND Paribas. But if you go to the original link, it just bombs out. But so this is um, a bank's analysis of what is considered as critical or materials that are under risk. And as you can see, everyone's favorite, rare earths, which I'm not going to be discussing, is still considered to be probably highly critical. Why? Well, again, as everybody knows, China controls 80% plus of Heavy, uh, sorry, rare earth resources, but even more critically is the downstream processing of those. So basically China is one of the few places in the world that you can send your concentrate to and they will kick out all the different heavy, uh, sorry, all the different rare earth metals that, that you need for your high tech stuff. In the same way, graphite, even though there's a massive amount of graphite resource around, which um, is going to be discussed later on in, in this conference, if you want to make spherical graphite, graphene, well, pretty much you're forced to take that to China. The same way when we start looking at a lot of other metals and, and, and minerals, aluminium, you may produce a concentrate, but the smelting tends to occur in China. Nickel, you may produce a concentrate, but the smelting and processing tends to occur in China. The same goes for steel manufacturing. A lot of the times, direct shipping all goes to China, gets smelted and processed, and then comes back to another country. So if we're going green, well, what does this mean in pure quantities? Now, this is one of the many sources of data where you need to go and start having a look. And this is going to be one of the ones which I will upload. It's a World Bank study where the World Bank itself states that we're going to be looking at 450% increase just to try and get, sorry, that the 208 should be 2018 levels. Okay. If you read the World Bank study a little bit further, what they actually what they state very clearly is that they don't actually include things like chassis and the infrastructure requirements for going green. So yes, they'll include the amount of metals and materials needed to build a wind turbine or solar panels, but they don't include power line transmissions. So that would include things like all the steel, steel that's needed in that, concrete that's needed in that, copper that's needed in that, aluminium that's needed in that, and anything else. So these by default then, or these metals and minerals which we need in these transitions then by default be, become what's referred to as critical. Most countries, and unfortunately South Africa is one of those countries where I couldn't find an official policy document from the government or any government department stating what South Africa's critical minerals and metals strategy is, or what the South African considers as critical raw materials for the energy transition. 
couldn't find that. Most of the BRICS company uh, countries do have them and most other countries or at least developed countries will do. This is from the, United, uh, from the European Union. The EU updates the critical raw materials list on a biannual basis. So this is what has been defined uh, the points in red as being the critical minerals for considered for the EU going forwards. Now, there's a number of parameters that are used for defining critical, critical and raw material, uh, critical materials, and it's worthwhile trying to understand the logic. Most of the time, it's based on uh, where those metals and materials are sourced from. Okay, so are they in what's referred to as fragile countries, so countries which do not have a good, good and strong rule of, of government? Um, are there a few countries that control these metals and minerals? Where do they get processed? Okay. And if that supply was cut off immediately, are there any alternatives to substitute for those? So what I've given is an example of tungsten. Tungsten, as you can see, is considered as being pretty important to the European economy. But most people sort of sit back and say, well, tungsten, you know, so what? Well, the thing is, Tungsten, like many of these other metals, currently China is the primary supplier. I think China supplies between 70 to 80% of all the tungsten metal in the market. It is the primary refiner of tungsten metal. It is one of those metals which you actually can't go onto the London Metal Exchange and see what the spot price is. It's generally traded um, through long-term contracts or negotiated between a producer and a manufacturer. And there's very few substitutions that you can have for tungsten be just because of its hardness and its high temperature nature and you know all the where you're going to be using it. There are limited alternatives to it. And you tend not to have high grade tungsten deposits. So you can see, you know, there's a photograph of Canton tungsten mine. It's now went bust. It is one of the high grade deposits in Canada. It's got an average grade of a one greater than one percent tungsten. But again, it just can't compete with the economies of scale that China has. So we can talk about all the, the fancy stuff, but let's go back to King Copper. So copper is just in general is seen as being the weather barometer of what's going to go on in the world. So if you've got a oversupply of copper, well, in general, you're probably going to see prices drop. If there's insufficient copper coming into the market, then prices are going to rise because, again, copper is critical to infrastructure requirements. So this is from uh, a present, sorry, from a company called Wood Mackenzie. Uh, the link is there. And you can see if all things go according to plan with current energy requirements, and needs, we're probably going to have more copper than we need by about 2028. However, if there's what's referred to as an accelerated energy transition, i.e. governments ramp up their commitments to going green and moving to renewables, well, then we're going to be in a major copper problem. We're just not going to have enough copper to supply the demand that we have or potential demand. So what does that then mean for geologists? Well, this is the, one of the more interesting or scary slides that you can go and look at again from Wood McKenzie. In 2008, it appeared that there was more than enough copper to supply the demands of the going green or going to renewable resources. Roll on to 2020, and for various reasons, we're just not seeing the same amount of copper coming on stream that we thought we would. Now, some of these are purely economic problems, some are technical issues, some are geopolitical, so countries nationalizing or making the conditions of working in those countries just untenable. So you just cannot produce copper or you don't have the security of supply. So again, you're not going to invest in those countries and you're going to go and pull out. So you're not going to be invested in in those, in those jurisdictions where you cannot or are not guaranteed of security of ownership of the asset. In the similar way, we can start looking at lithium. Now, lithium is interesting in that there's a lot of lithium around, but again, it tends to be associated either with brines or pegmatites in general. And they tend not to be that not all of them are 
particularly large. So with our drive towards going green, and especially towards electrical cars and the dependency at the moment of lithium batteries, there is a massive demand for lithium. What this is then triggered in terms of geopolitics is countries like Mexico have now went and nationalized all of the lithium sources in the country, even though Mexico only contains approximately 20% of all the world's known resources. So geopolitically, Mexico is just not a place to go to now if you're looking for lithium. The other thing which is interesting, we start doing a bit more research into lithium is not so much the, the commodity itself, the, but the players who are now moving into this market. So you see people like um, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, and Warren Buffet are all moving into the lithium market. So when you start seeing people of that wealth level moving into the lithium market, there's more than likely going to be some interesting and seismic changes in terms of technology and the way that at least lithium mining occurs. And because lithium is then linked in the supply chain to things like copper and nickel, again, one can anticipate that there's going to be some very interesting changes to the way that the mining and the extractive industry is run. So just to try and focus our minds back a bit, because a lot of this has been just discussed in, in, in generalities, is, well, well, what are we going to need? Now, if we start looking at offshore wind turbines, which is the current thinking about, well, where are we going to get consistent wind? Well, it's offshore. Look at the amount of copper that's needed for your anticipated growth in wind turbines. The same way that onshore wind, again, massive increase in, in copper, but also one of those metals that people don't think about too much because it's not really exciting at all is zinc. So again, we can see that not only are we going to be looking at the really fancy stuff like rare earths, but our basic commodities and stuff which was just not considered as being the place that you wanted to be as a geologist, base metals, are going to be critically important in our green metals transition. And just another way of presenting the same data is when we start looking at the type of energy that we're going to be looking at, what needs to go into. Now, you, I'm, one of the, the things that I'm going to be, I guess, on this slide, I'll, I'll focus on a bit, is hydropower. Now, most people think, well, hydropower is great, is green, not a problem. Look at the amount of cement that you need to put in to build a large hydropower dam, okay? A significant amount of cement, which means you're going to effectively have a significant carbon footprint with all the cement that you need. There's also a significant amount of steel that goes into these things. But probably what is more is of importance or of interest, if we start looking at rewilding or biodiversity, one of the things that happens as soon as you start building these massive mega dams is you start changing the local climate significantly. So there's been some very interesting studies done on uh, the Five Gorges Dam in China, where there's been quite profound changes to the local environment. What is also very interesting, as soon as you start building these mega dams, you start changing the geopolitical balance in the region. So if any of you get interested, um, start doing some research in terms of the implications of damming the Nile and the sources of the Nile in terms of Ethio, the political relationships between Ethiopia, Sudan, Uganda, and Egypt. Now, it, it, it tends to be problematic because now if you're up, upstream, you can dam off or block off the supply of water to a downstream country, which then will increase political tensions. Um, also, a lot of the times you end up decreasing silt load. So again, countries like Egypt, which used to use that during the annual flooding of the Nile, again, it becomes problematic because you're not seeing these natural cycles occurring in nature. So again, by changing our energy needs, we are potentially having larger impacts on our local and potentially even, pardon me, macro climates in the region. So we've discussed all of this. So well, where can we go looking? This is one of the few sources on the internet that you can go to, which at least at this stage plots most known metals deposits in the world. So this is United States Geological Survey. And as you can see, Sub-Saharan Africa and Africa tend to be metals and minerals rich. 
However, the countries that are potentially going to be consuming the critical raw materials tend not to, well, the Americas and Canada do. But what is quite interesting in terms of the, at least the Western developed economies, what they are doing is they've created what's referred to as the Critical Minerals Mapping Initiative. So we're effectively, Australia, Canada, America have created a, a, a pact where they start exchanging geological information. So those countries can then start planning where they're going to be focusing, at least at a national strategic level, the exploration activities. Um, so also America, Canada and Australia have got stated government policies where they are going to be, for example, releasing all geological data free into the public domain. Um, there's national programs to do remapping, uh, redo national geophysical grids and flyovers for these countries to try and increase the potential to, to be self-sustaining and not to have to go or be dependent on supplies from other countries coming in to their national economy. Uh, both the Trump administration and the Biden administration, for example, published uh, strategy documents trying to get America off Chinese dependency, specifically on rare earths. Uh, Australia has been looking at the same thing. They're massively dependent on supplying China with, for example, iron ore. They're now looking at alternative markets for that. Now, this logic, how did that translate, for example, into metal exploitation? Well, again, just by the fact that the population is growing worldwide, we are consuming more and more metals. What is probably of interest is you can see that copper is pretty much tapered off. This is, as we've seen in previous slides, the fact that there does not appear to have been significant copper discoveries recently. Um, Komoku Kula aside in the DRC. What we have also seen though, and if we refer back to copper, is, a, is in South America, so Peru and Chile, nationalist governments coming in, wanting to renationalize copper. So again, creating uncertainty in the copper market. This will obviously then start driving exploration into non-traditional areas. So in the African, so in the case of Africa, what you're now seeing is people, because the DRC tends to not be seen as a robust and stable, um, governance system is people looking at countries like Angola, Namibia, and Botswana for sources of copper, also Zambia. But again, as we all know, Zambia a couple of year, years ago started nationalization and imposing royalties and taxation on copper miners there, which led to large companies either closing down their operations immediately or just stopping all major capital projects. But as we're going forward, so remember getting back to a 2050 date, well, what's the, the forecast or how are we going to see this metals mix potentially changing or at least the supplies for a metals mix going forward? Interestingly enough, not too much. So we're still going to see, for example, dependency on rare earths. Yes, America's talking about opening up Mountain Pass, even though Mountain Pass, the last time I looked, I think had a 15 to 25% holding by a Chinese company. Uh, we are going to see, for example, potentially an increase in copper from Chile, but again, that depends on government policies coming through. We can again see we're still going to be very focused on Australia for lithium, so Greenbush's pegmatite. Um, sourcing of lithium from brines in South America become, is becoming problematic because of all the environmental concerns that have been raised because those are very fragile ecosystems and no one really understands what's going to happen if you start pumping out large amounts of lithium brine. But all this being said, what if all our predictions are wrong? So if you cast your mind back to what I've said, World Bank is saying 400% increase. There was a very interesting study done and the presentation, uh, which is on YouTube, can be found here, worthwhile watching. I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail in this. But Professor Silem Molyneux went and did some first principle work and his conclusions are even more interesting. What his numbers are indicating that is that we may actually be well off in the predictions in terms of the amount of metals we need. So instead of 400%, we may be looking at 4,000%. Why? Because effectively we're taking this, which is the metals and ores we've needed to provide energy using, uh, using energy dense carbon solutions 
And effectively, we're going to try and transit to using speciality metals and minerals, which is effectively this little black dot. And so to get the same amount of energy out, we're going to need significantly more metals in these high-tech categories than what we may have supposed or what initial figures were taking into account. So what GK and what Simon did, when you watch his presentation and read the documents, is a thousand page document that he wrote up, is he then goes through and says, okay, so if we want to go and transition to the entire world having electrical cars, what do we need in terms of battery storage units, um, infrastructure to provide that energy? What happens if we go and transit to biofuels? Well, biofuels sound great, but you're going to need fertilizer because now you need to grow additional um, vegetation to transit into a biofuel. What happens if you go into nuclear? What happens if we go purely wind power? If you go purely wind power, again, sounds great, except you need to go and store that energy somehow. So what you need is these large massive battery storage units and they consume huge amounts of metals and minerals. So let's move that on to Africa's energy future. So when we start looking at Africa as a continent, well, Africa has a huge amount of metal potential, as we all know. The problem, unfortunately, translates into a number of things, but more specifically, the fact that governments tend to then see that they have the dominant amount of, say, for example, platinum group metals. And then start putting in laws and legislation, which in their minds changes or will be beneficial to the economy of that country. What is not necessarily always thought through is, yes, for example, that Africa may contain 98% of all the PGs, PGEs in the world. There are other countries which do have PGEs. They may not necessarily be in the same volumes or grades that South Africa or Zimbabwe has. But if you were to put an embargo on platinum coming from South Africa and Zimbabwe, then it's quite feasible that the low grade platinoid, platinum deposits in uh, or palladium deposits in America, Australia, and Brazil, Canada can all be reopened and started, or byproduct mining then suddenly becomes economically viable from places like Lacta Ills or Norilsk in Russia. The same thing goes for things like phosphate. Yes, South Africa or Africa has massive phosphate deposits, mainly up in North Africa. But again, as soon as there is a choke point on that, then there are phosphate deposits elsewhere in the world, which are lower grade, may not have the same quality, but can then be mined. So it's not always logical to start putting in, to put in legislation, which is going to limit the exploitation of the metals and minerals that you have. So just running through in terms of, well, where does this leave Africa? Is this is just some examples of critical and strategic metals and minerals that Africa has. So if we start looking through, and these are in no specific order, so some of this, <clears throat> the things which are considered to be critical, well, you can see that South Africa and SADC countries, pretty much if they were to use the SADC grouping uh, in a logical manner as it's intended, can be relatively self-sufficient in these specific critical metals. The area that SADC tends to lack, though, is the manufacturing capacity, the processing capacity of this, which then gets us back into the energy requirements, which other presenters will be discussing during the course of the day. So it's all very well and good to have the critical metals and minerals, but can you process them into a concentrate? But probably even more critical, can you take those concentrates or those products and then turn them into something that other countries will want to purchase from you? So not just a steel bar, or a copper ingot, but are you adding value to those in the downstream market? We can then look at, and I've referred to them here, speciality metals and minerals. These things tend to have come under a number of names. You'll also see them as forward facing minerals and metals. But again, you can see Africa, specifically Southern Africa, can, if 
the political willpower and economic willpower is there, be relatively self-sufficient in terms of all of the metals and minerals which are needed for the green energy transition. But it does get us back to geopolitics. This is a state of Africa, well, the world, but specifically looking at Africa in 2020 in terms of trade restrictions on metals and minerals. Almost every African country or sub-Saharan African country since 2000 has imposed some sort of trade, re trade restriction on either the importation or exportation or expiration for metals in their country. Okay, so if you look at the African context, where it's mainly orange and red, and you compare that to a lot of the economies which are developing or are cash positive at the moment, such as North, and North America or Australia or Europe, they have very limited or no trade restrictions. Now, part of that can be argued that, for example, Europe is almost 100% dependent on imports, of course, they are going to try and get people to export to them. Countries like America, Canada, and Australia, not so much. They are sitting with significant supplies. They have other issues like environmental regulations, which make the cost of exploring and mining in those countries quite expensive. So yes, it behooves them to try and import from other countries or locations and jurisdictions so they don't need to incur those costs. But in general, if you look at the legislation on a broad scale in Africa, Africa tends to have eliminated itself from direct foreign investment in terms of metals and minerals. There's a flip side to this. The Belt and Road Initiative. Now, for those of you that are not aware of it, the Belt and Road Initiative is a Chinese investment strategy where they are investing directly in different economies. Now, effectively, China is Africa's greatest trade partner. And in general, and this is an oversimplification of the way that the Chinese strategy works, is China will then approach an African government, sign a trade agreement. China will then invest in building infrastructure, whether it's harbors, roads, railways, or new airports. And in general, the way that payment is made is not necessarily in terms of cash back, but it's in terms of getting natural resources in payment. So if you are to start looking at certain country policies in the last 10 years, there's a number of countries in Africa, but also in South America, who have taken out um, or entered into relationships with China and very shortly afterwards, they've started implementing nationalistic policies and discussions of nationalization of natural resources, whether it is in the metals and minerals side, but also oil and gas, um, forestry, and fishing rights. Um, for those of you not aware, China controls all, if not the vast majority of offshore fishing rights around the African continent, and it owns the majority of mineral rights in the African continental shelf. But just a few other things to start thinking about, um, and I'm getting to the end of the presentation, is a few other things as we start going green. Now, so yes, we're going green. We've identified a problem that we are changing the climate. So we want to try and become better stewards of the climate and not you know, make it worse for our children than what it currently is. So obviously we're moving to renewable resources. So there are a few slight problems which are being noticed. The problem currently with windmills or the turbine blades is that while there's a lot of research going into it, at the moment, and there's nothing that I've come across to contradict this, is that wind turbine blades can still not be economically recycled. It is still cheaper to produce a brand new wind turbine blade. Lifespan of a turbine blade is between 20 to 30, 25 to 35 years. After that, at the moment, they're getting buried in landfills. Okay, so is this green or not? Who knows? There's also obviously the concern about wind wind turbines killing birds. There has been various studies done. Um, if you start researching them, they vary from wind turbines are evil, burn them down, to wind turbines are benign, they're okay, and cats kill more birds 
than wind turbines do. The thing is they are there <clears throat> and they are obviously changing or having an impact on local biodiversity, positively or negatively. I think the jury is still out. But as with everything that people do, there will be an impact somewhere along the line. And the same thing goes with solar panels. At this stage, solar panels, again, the vast majority of them cannot be recycled either due to the technology used to them. So um, thin-filmed um, solar panels, even though they're cheap, they tend to be laminated with plastics. They tend not to be easily recyclable. The old-fashioned silicon-based ones, they can be, or at least portions of them can be recycled. But again, in most cases, the cost of recycling a solar panel is more expensive than just creating a brand new one. The same thing, a solar panel with current technology has got a lifespan of about 25 to 35 years before to be basically effective, you need to replace them. Yes, I, there are, is a lot of research to try and make them more efficient. There is research to make solar panels work at night. There is research to make transparent solar panels so you can replace glass with a solar panel so you don't have to have large solar panel farms. But again, in all of this, at this stage, we tend to bury solar panels rather than trying to recycle them because it is just not cost effective. And that concludes my presentation. So if there's any questions, please feel free to post or ask. <laughs> Great, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, that was a really good speech, a good presentation. It really sets the scene in terms of the critical materials or critical mineral needs. Um, just want to open the floor if anyone has uh, any particular questions with any aspects of that presentation. Um, you know, Mark, from my side, I think uh, yeah, there's, there's, there's real need uh, to look into our cement alternatives. Um, what are your thoughts regarding, you know, I've, I've seen it bandied around, I don't know too much about it, but green alternatives to cement, are those feasible? Are there any options that actually make a substantial difference? Uh, the... Again, there has been a lot of discussion and research. Um, I actually did a presentation on that. It's available on GeoHack, but I'll upload the presentation and the data back. So yes, it is. The, pro the problem, the issues are, and this is, again, it's one of those weird things. Cement has been around for thousands of years. It's known technology. Insurers know what they're dealing with when they've got Portland cement. New technologies, one at the moment, the, the equivalent is not as strong, so you can't build buildings as high, but it's also unproven technology, and the research that I did indicated that insurance companies will then charge you a significantly higher premium if you start building out of some of these new alternatives which are available. So, yes, they're there. Will, are they cost effective at the moment? No. Are they proven? No. Right. No, that's that's very interesting. Definitely have to bring maybe insurance companies into that uh, ESG aspect or ESG discussion. Um, thank you very much. I don't see any hands. Um, there is another question from question. Shailen. Yes. Yeah, Shailen. Uh, yes, Sherlin, South Africa does. Um, that project or those projects have been around since I was a junior geologist. Uh, so, and it, again, it boils down to permitting ESG and infrastructure. Um, as most of you have been, I'm sure, have been following the recent discussions in South Africa about coal and manganese and iron ore, the infrastructure just isn't there. So, while South Africa may have fantastic deposits, Unless you're processing them in country, you need to get them to a harbor and you need to get them to a harbor cost, um, cost efficiently and cheaply. And at the moment, unfortunately, I don't think the South African infrastructure is available, it, it can do that. Um, which is why, for example, if you start looking at places like the DRC, you know, there's massive deposit. Oh, let me try and rephrase that. In Uganda, for example, there's a massive hematite deposits in the border with Rwanda and the DRC. 
is massive. I've been there. It's billions of tons of specular act. You just can't mine the stuff because there's just no infrastructures. There's no water. There's no electricity. And there's no road, decent road or railway to get that stuff to any decent harbor. So it's sitting there and it probably will not be mined. Uh, in the same way, um, the large deposit, iron ore deposits in Republic of Congo, the only way they could be mined, and this gets us back to the geopolitical aspect, the only way that they could be mined or even looked at by Xara and Rio Tinto is when the Chinese government came in and said, we will build the railway line up to these deposits. And then was only afterwards those deposits became, became feasible. Uh, and I think the numbers that I read for the cost of the Chinese putting in that railway infrastructure was in the region of 5 billion US dollars. And that was about 10 years ago. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for the background uh, uh, in terms of the numbers. I will be looking at uh, integrated geoscience mapping of battery minerals with a particular focus on magnetotide pipes as a possible source of high-grade vanadium in the Bushwell complex. Uh, just a background, this is work that we have been doing for the past Five years we've been involved in geological mapping on a scale of one is to 50,000 in the in the eastern limb of the Bushfell uh, complex and this is where we started to see these uh, deposits of uh, magnetite that appeared to be quite small and our interest grew and then we started uh, being curious about uh, how large are these deposits uh, what is their vanadium content Although a number of studies had indicated previously that the deposits are quite small, although they have high vanadium content. So I'll just take you through uh, the presentation. We've compiled a report that is currently uh, confidential at the Council for Geoscience. So this is really a high level summary just to give you a highlight of the work that we've been doing. So these are my colleagues, uh, Janine Cole. So it's more of an integrated approach, you know, geophysics involved, mineralogy, uh, and, and, and geochemistry as well. This is just the disclaimer. All right. I think the transition from fossil fuels to a low carbon green economy is likely to, to require significant volumes of metals and minerals that are critical components of, in particular, renewable energy and energy storage systems. I think uh, the previous presenter gave us background on these and the requirements in terms of volumes of minerals that would be required to, to meet the demand in terms of renewable energy. And uh, we think vanadium plays a strategic role in energy storage, uh, in particular vanadium redox flow batteries. And it is expected that this market would be a source of new demand for vanadium in the coming years. Uh, and this will be as a result of the deployment of large scale energy storage systems. And of course, this accelerated demand will also require increased production and as well as identification and development of new magnetite greenfield projects that are capable of producing uh, high grade vanadium pentoxide that is suitable for uh, battery usage. And I think uh, the next presenter uh, I saw a presentation that will be coming up that will be dealing with, uh, in particular, vanadium. And I'm hoping that the next presenter will touch more on the numbers. So I will be looking more on the technical side of things. So this work integrates high resolution aeromagnetic data. Uh, we look at geological data, soil geochemistry data. We also characterize these deposits in terms of uh, their mineralogical characteristics. Uh, this is to better understand the prospective geological successions. Uh, we also want to understand the geometry, how deep are these bodies, their lateral continuity as well as, as their, their subsurface uh, extent, in addition to their mineral beneficiation potential. So in terms of mining and exploration, uh, the largest magnetite pipe that was ever mined in the Bushwell complex is the Kennedy's Bell pipe, which measured at 350 by 55. It was mined up to a depth of 180 uh, meters. 
and then its vanadium content uh, at the time was uh, buried between 2 to 2.2 percent which is slightly higher than what we know for, uh, from the main magnetite layer which has been the source of vanadium in the bushveld uh, complex uh, at the spd project exploration is underway uh, this is in the magnetite area and you can see on the figure on your right there uh, sort of semicircular bodies there are uh, delineated magnetite pipes. Um, I read their report and I see that uh, many of these pipes measure around 200 meters by 150 and uh, 350 by 150. And their whole rock assay results uh, show higher vanadium content for some of the samples that were collected from, from the pipes. And I think also what is interesting about this is that in the Bushfell complex, these pipes have never been considered as a possible source of vanadium, obviously because they've been considered as previously thought to be quite small in size to be mined economically. So we look at our study area. We are currently looking, working in the Eastern Bushfell complex. Uh, the area south of the steel port fault, uh, the Rosenical area, uh, Stoffberg down uh, uh, before you get to, 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 to the Bethel Inn. So in terms of geology, uh, the layer stratigraphy of the Rustenberg layer suite is uh, generally transgressed by these discordant bodies. And they've been broadly classified uh, in literature into two main types, uh, mainly the iron-rich ultramafic uh, pegmatites, which are commonly known as IRAPs. Uh, those are generally situated here in the main zone of the Bushveld complex and the upper zone as well. And then you also have danite pipes, which are generally associated with platinum group uh, minerals. And they are generally located here in the critical zone. So this is just uh, the map B is just showing the spatial distribution of all these uh, pigmatitic uh, bodies. Uh, our focus really is on uh, the FET rich bodies, which are uh, located here in the main zone uh, of the Bushfell complex. These bodies have been mapped in the Senegal area by Van Grunewald, in the Magnet Heights area by Molyneux 1970, and down here in the Stoffbeck area by Grunewald 1968. So in terms of the airborne geophysical uh, interpretation, here we are trying to, to understand two things. The first is to identify if it's possible using high resolution airborne geophysical data to identify new pipes, uh, or as well as try to look at the to map the surface extent of the new pipes or pipes that are already known. So I'll just give one example of one of the interpretations we did in the Eastern Bushveld. So here, if you look at figure B, we have two pipes here that are known, uh, coinciding with a prominent magnetic anomaly here to the south. Uh, and if you look at the two flight lines, line one and two, you will see that we've got adjacent peaks, figure D and E, that seems to suggest that there could be a subsurface extent of these two mapped uh, magnetite bodies. So it is possible that the source of this magnet, uh, magnetic anomaly sits deep uh, within uh, in the subsurface. So, we interpret this as related to, because majority of these pipes are generally weathered. Uh, this, uh, the surface boulders of uh, pipes are generally weathered. And at depth, uh, oxidation is not as prevalent as we see on the surface. Thus, uh, you, we explain that in terms of the larger amplitude magnetic anomaly. And also what is interesting is that on surface, you would realize that these pipes are quite small, but when we zoom into the geophysical interpretation, we start to see that uh, the diameter of this 
of the region where the pipes occur increases. So they are generally quite uh, big and the, and the uh, airborne geophysics has assisted us in trying to, to, to map that surface extent. We also modeled the, the geophysical data. Here we are trying to understand the geometry of these pipes at subsurface. Uh, their depth or thicknesses as well. And uh, we chose uh, two pipes, but I'll just show uh, one of the models that we did, uh, which is the, 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 the feed 104 here. We selected that pipe and uh, a simple model uh, shows uh, a body that sits, a profile one there that sits at about uh, 150 meters below surface with a thickness uh, profile two there of about uh, with a thickness of about 200 meters and in terms of their geometry these bodies are semicircular even in the subsurface profile two there or elliptical in shape sometimes uh, measuring about 600 by 150 uh, suggest, just, this suggests that these pipes are uh, larger than previously reported. So in terms of the solid geochemical mapping, again, we are trying to see if uh, there could be a coincidence between the, the interpreted airborne geophysical data and our soil geochemical data. And we are trying to, to understand which elements can we use to delineate vanadium rich magnetite pipes in the bushwell complex. So what we did, we applied multivariate statistics to the regional soil geochemical data in order to identify multi-element associations that can aid us in mapping these magnetite bodies. So from that uh, interpretation, what we find is that we've got four factors. Uh, the first factor, which is more uh, enriched with the incompatible trace elements, Niobium, yttrium, uh, this is more related to the granites in the study area. And then we've got factor two here that looks at uh, iron, uh, that is uh, characterized by iron, uh, copper, titanium, cobalt, and zinc. This we believe is associated with magnetite layers in the upper zone. But we've got an interesting factor here, which is factor three. Uh, that is loaded in vanadium, chrome, and nickel. So these three elements, we believe, better delineate the pipes in, in the study area. So what we did is we took the factor scores of factor three, which is loaded in uh, nickel, vanadium, and chrome, and we interpolated that into grids using uh, inverse distance weighting in RGS. And I think the most important feature from this image in your right, uh, you can see that the positive signatures here, suggesting that this is where most of the pipes are concentrated. Uh, and you can see if you move to the left towards the top of the upper zone, uh, this signature is quite low. And this is interesting because what we know in the Bushfell complex is that with increasing stratigraphy, the vanadium content decreases. So much of the vanadium content is higher below the lowermost magnetite layers. And we interpret that as zones where many pipes could be uh, identified. And this goes down to the Quakas Cop area. You've got uh, signatures there sitting just below uh, the magnetite layers there. And then also T4, if you look at T4, T4 coincides uh, mostly with a known contact type copper nickel PG deposits as well. And this is interesting because several magnetic bodies from our geophysical interpretation coincide with uh, this known uh, occurrences of contact type nickel. So this area could also be prospective for uh, contact type uh, copper nickel PG deposits. So what we did is we also 
uh, undertook field investigations and, and sampling. And what we see in the field is, is that uh, these bodies are roughly circular, semicircular or oval, sometimes elliptical in shape. They generally occur as clusters. In some areas, it's one pipe. In some areas, we've got two or three pipes. And figure C is just an example of uh, areas where you have one or two pipes occurring in the, in the, in the, in the study area. And uh, sometimes I think what is interesting is that the actual contacts of the pipes, uh, it's quite, it's very difficult in the field in some areas to, to see because most of these pipes occur as boulders. In some areas you don't have, it's flat, you just see float and boulders of magnetite. So the contact with the uh, counter rocks is difficult to, to, to determine and that therefore it's also difficult to determine the extent of these bodies or their shapes in the field as well. Uh, but if you look at B as well, shows a sort of secular uh, pipe body in the study area. So in terms of diameter, the, these bodies are greater than 150 in the field, but we can't necessarily determine the exact extent. Hence, it was important for us to use uh, uh, geophysics to assist with, with uh, determining how uh, how these pipes extend laterally. A total number of 10 samples were collected uh, from outcropping pipes for geochemical and mineralogical studies. I think it's important to note that majority of these samples in some areas are quite weathered. So it, it was quite difficult to get uh, fresh uh, samples. In terms of the mineralogy, these pipes are almost 100% magnetite but we also have the ilmenite that occurs within this, this rock. This ilmenite comes in the form of either a X solution lamellae in the titanium, in the TI magnetite, or as granular ilmenite grains, as you see from this figure here. And also what we see is that because these are surface samples that are highly oxidized or weathered, and then you start to see the presence of a hematite, these are XRD results, or magnetite, which is related to low temperature oxidation or hydration during the time. The bulk of the magnetites uh, from our petrographic and the SCM investigation seems to be present in recover, recoverable form as large polygonal grains. I think this is good for, for beneficiation because this suggests that they will liberate very well upon uh, grinding. We also looked at the whole rock geochemistry of these rocks. Uh, the analyzed samples retained an average assay of 1.7% vanadium pentoxide, uh, which is sort of relatively comparable to uh, the SPD project. Uh, this is the clusters from the SPD the project, these are the results. And the iron content of these pipes averages about 71.45%, uh, uh, which is slightly higher than what you see from the SPD. And then the titanium content is also high, it ranges between 10 and 19% titanium. And I think the titanium in the titanium magnetite has been quite a problem in terms of recovery. <laughs> with a lot of research being done in terms of how to extract the titanium uh, from the titanium magnetite. We also went a step further and looked at the in situ uh, chemistry of titanium magnetite, uh, TI rich magnetite. Uh, we looked at uh, several elements, uh, titanium, vanadium, manganese, iron, and these pipes look to be uh, the, the titanium magnetite is quite high, ranging from 1 to 2.44%, uh, as well as the iron content is quite high, averaging 81.32 in terms of the iron. And then other elements that may be considered as impurities, such as magnesium, aluminium, uh, sodium, calcium, these are poorly enriched in the titanium magnetite. Uh, what is interesting again is that in terms of vanadium, ion, titanium, uh, these pipes 
seems to be enriched in these elements relative to, 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 to the seams. And I think it goes back to what we have said that in terms of vanadium with stratigraphic height in the Bushveld complex, you start to see vanadium decreasing. So we expect that pipes below magnetite layers should be enriched in vanadium uh, higher than what you see in the magnetite layers. So in terms of exploration significance, uh, why are these pipes important? Uh, what we see is that these pipes have an average grade of 1.7%. Uh, uh, it's comparable to what we see from other projects like the SPD vanadium project in, in the magnetized area. It's comparable to what we see in terms of the main, main magnetite layer. And also our preliminary resource estimations based on the, 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 the model that we, 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 have, we have shown in this presentation suggests that we have around 735 thousand tons of ore that can be extracted at a, at a grade or average grade of 1% within uh, these bodies. And these are fairly easy to mine uh, bodies. So uh, this can actually be economically exploited for vanadium. I think one addition also is the logistics. Uh, in the Eastern Bushveld, you've got the rail network that can run from Senegal up to uh, with bank where we have uh, van, van cams, low cost primary vanadium processing plant. And some of these materials uh, may be taken there. So I think there is a compelling case for vanadium magnetite bodies in the Bushwell complex. And I think it's high time we start looking at these bodies as a potential source of vanadium. Thank you. I have predominantly spent my time in the Southern African region um, doing a number of different exploration projects. And um, one of my favorite ones was actually working on, on a graphite project in Mozambique. And um, essentially that is, is the basing what my whole conversation about this today's presentation is about and how graphite actually fits into this, this clean energy transition. And, um, as Mark said, there was a bit of overlap with regards to, um, or, or there is a bit of overlap with regards to what Mark presented and, and what I'm presenting, which is to be expected um, for a large, across a few of these commodities because they're all competing in a very similar space and um, fit in into the puzzle altogether within one another. So here I go about um, graphite. So I'm going to be discussing, oh, let me just put my little pointer on. So I'm going to be discussing how we took the Greenfield project in Mozambique to a um, resource in four years. Um, we were fortunate enough to, or I was fortunate enough to be part of a project that did have funding for it. And it really started off with very basic um, uh, part of, of any project where it was just a literature desktop study. Um, the, the exploration strategy in general followed a common trialed and tested early stage grassroots exploration workflow. And like I say, like every project, we started off with a desktop study looking at historical information and work that, that other companies had been doing in the area and, and trying to work out regionally how prospective the, the areas were and how we were going to strategy, uh, strat strategically go and um, explore for graphite that we were interested in. So we then followed up with a few fields so that we then did some GIS regional target selection by looking at all the information that was available to us and then followed it up with some targeted field work followed up by some RC um, and diamond drilling. And we were then able to delineate areas of prospectivity that we were able to then drill and test and essentially just um, release a resource in all according to, to JORC uh, reporting guidelines, which is really exciting for, for me, um, taking the project from Greenfield all the way 
to um, a resource. So where was the project based? It was up here in Montsapuej. We used to fly to Pemba. Um, it's all the way in the Cabo Delgado province of Northern Mozambique. And um, again, like I mentioned, um, a long strike of, of a few other world-class deposits that were mentioned. How the, the geology of the area that we were looking at, it's um, the, the location is based in the Mozambican belt uh, over here, as you can see, and running in the, the East African orogenic belt, um, lying in a very geologically complex area, comprising of boundaries between the, uh, the cratons and a mobile belt terrain. From this um, geological activity, these rocks were exposed to amphibolites, granulite, facies, metamorphism, and the graphite was hosted in um, quartzitic schists and gneisses in the Shiano complex over here, um, where the majority of lithologies were either graphitic schists or gneisses with very, very thin um, pigmatoidal zones. So uh, the projects that we were interested in were the, the black ones. Those were the, the ones that we were doing uh, or the black license um, boundaries. That's the areas we were doing um, exploration on. And as you can see, there were already, we were fortunate that there were already other companies that had mentioned that they were successful in finding graphite um, deposits. So, so it was a relatively um, nice starting point for us to then continue. So what, we, what did we do? So in 2014, we started to do outcrop mapping, which was then followed by walking um, EM 34 lines perpendicular to the, the striking deposit. We did a total of eight lines and we walked a total of 42,000 meters. So it was quite a, quite a walk with quite some heavy material. Um, we were fortunate enough that we had a great geophysicist that was able to go and um, go and analyze the data that we had and provided us with, with different targets for us to follow up on. So we went to go and follow up, did some RC drilling because it was quick, cheap and, and easy drilling for us to do. And we were fortunate enough that we did hit a, a, a graphic uh, graphite body and it was confirmed with a 17% TGC, which is a total graphitic carbon grade. From this information, all in 2014, the, the board was able to raise enough money so that they could um, do some fundraising to run SkyTen, which is a time domain um, economic magnetics. And from that work, let's see if my, there we go. Oh, yeah, this was me doing some RC drilling. And that's how beautiful you look after a full day's worth of, of working with some, some graphite. And here you can see it's relatively shallow. You start seeing graphite at about 20. 324 meters. So it is a, a relatively shallow deposit. Um, so as I said, we were then able to go and fly, raise uh, capital to fly some SkyTem airborne surveys over 11 licenses in 2015. This produced nine anomalies and we were able to rank them according to strength, size and known mineralization. Now all the different licenses um, with red being the areas of interest and blue, not, not so much. So we were then able to, this is placed on a, on a Landsat image. We were then able to, to rank the different anomalies um, according to, like I say, strength, size and, and known mineralization. We then again followed up with RC drilling to confirm the graphite mineralization and specific intercepts were then taken for analysis for the, the TGCs. Um, we took that information and although we originally thought that rank one from the geophysics was going to be our, our, our main target, as you can see, our graphitic carbon is, is far less. Our um, MORC fourth rank was far higher, 22%, and in general had an average, a higher TGC ranking. So we, we further continue to develop that, that fourth rank, which was turned out to be this, this area here, which is the, the Kaula mineral resource area as we then went to um, follow up with drilling. So the initial work was, was all completed with RC um, drilling because it was quick and inexpensive. However, it's very destructive to the flakes. And when it comes to offshore take or offshore um, 
off take, sorry, off take agreements, we are far more interested in the flake sizes and the bigger your flakes, the, the higher the price that you fetch. So we had to then originally, we just did it to, for proof of mineralization. We then switched over and took the three highest ranking RC drill holes. And we did some twin drilling with some diamond drill holes so that we could determine the flake size and metallurgical properties. And as I mentioned, we then continued to base our attention on this Kaolo deposit, despite, despite the fact that we had other areas of interest, we, we focused um, first on, on Kaolo before we continued. And here's a nice piece of cores, really a beautiful piece of, of graphitic schist here. Um, I, I get excited every time I look at the photos. So we then continued to do drilling. We did drilling perpendicular to, to the strike of the body or the, the dip and strike of the body. And um, there were a um, sort of series and, and, and parallel um, packages of, of nice and, and graphitic schist. Here's the day. Here was our drillers, um, a visitor to the core and some more graphite. Uh, so the graphite, what we believe um, pre preserved the, the graphitic schist flakes so well was the, the, the isoclinal fold structure. So that again, that, that's what we believe is, is um, as a result of the larger flake sizes. And in 2018, we were able to go and uh, declare a resource of 2.9 million tons at 3% TGC. Um, meaning 2.9 contained graphite. And we were fortunate enough that we had a byproduct of vanadium pentoxide, which was also really exciting. So um, I've just gone and, and explained to you um, how we took our project from, from Greenfield to then a resource. Um, but why were we doing graphite exploration and, and why did we go through this whole process? Um, so as much as I had a great time, the, the funders did not pay for me just to have a great time in Mozambique. They were looking for graphite because of the demand in, and, and the necessity of graphite in the clean energy transition and, and going green. So the world is rapidly transitioning to a low carbon technology because of, of climate change. We've gone and accepted this and, and, and um, realized this. And as a result, we are, are moving a large amount of technologies um, to try and conquer this, this climate change. However, in order for us to do this, there is a large demand on, on minerals and we need to meet this as, as a geological community, which is great for, for us working in the industry. Um, so there's two main reasons why we need more mining. And the first is that there is in general an increase in global co uh, consumption. As Mark mentioned, there is an increase in, in um, our global population, number one, and you can see it with a number of different um, commodities here. But number two, there's also an increase in complexity in the technology. So in the 1700s, there was just carbon, sort of some cement and iron that would have a very basic structure that, that in the 1700s worked for, for the, the population at that stage. However, moving towards now our needs and technology, it's far more complex and requires um, an abundance of, of um, different elements. So why are we or why am I interested in that with regards to a graphite context? There, with the, the growth in mineral needs, so is the, the low carbon energy. So there's a growing demand in the critical raw uh, materials and of which graphite is one of them. This um, schematic was published in 2019, and um, it's interesting how it's now changed. Um, I, I, I did some more research, and in 2022, it has changed slightly, so, so just remember this. Um, it's predicted by 2050, that they, in, when they started doing research in 2019, that the low carbon technologies will demand a higher percentage of the, the mineral production in general. And to meet this, um, our critical materials need to keep up. Hence, I was out there in, in Mozambique looking for some graphite. It's expected that the demand is to increase by 383% by 2050, um, meaning that in 2017, it was 1,200 kilotons of graphite. However, it is predicted that we're going to need 4,500 at least 
kilotons in 2050. And, and you can see here, there's a number of other elements that, that are a necessity for this new um, clean energy that we're going and working towards. So this is a bit of a repeat from Mark's um, presentation as well. But as I mentioned, a low carbon future is incredibly mineral intensive. And as a result, there, there are a few sectors that are, are quite reliant on these different um, elements. So we've got the renewables and, and um, EVs, electrical uh, vehicles. And I think one of the, the sectors that we often forget about is space and defense. Um, and, and it's quite a flashy, exciting new um, sector, but it's also quite a demanding one and, and does require a number of different uh, commodities that, that need to be supplied to. Um, so as I said, technologies are mineral extensive and they do require a number of niche minerals. There is, however, a bit of a supply risk when it comes to these raw materials. And again, I'm focusing on, on the graphite. Um, in order for, for us to deliver to the climate's ambition of, of the Green New Deal or European Green Deal, um, there's, there's quite a few of them. The objective of no net emissions of greenhouse gases in 2050 will require a lot of electrification efforts and diversification of our sources. Um, and as a result, the company or the, the countries and the world globally, we are dependent on a specific uh, supply chain, which, which the, the countries have now identified and are starting to address. So if we look at the supply risk, um, you can see quite clearly that China dominates the, the, supply, risk, uh, the supply chain of um, critical minerals and metals. And globally, we are incredibly reliant on international markets um, to provide the import of raw materials and for them to export it. So especially uh, not only the EU, but a, a lot of the first world countries, while they have a few of the raw materials in their country, they are largely dependent on um, other countries for these, these critical materials. And this dominance in the, the Chinese market really does render value chains extremely vulnerable. So in 2019, I wasn't able to find any information from this year. So I think at the end of the year, it'll be interesting to see what they publish. As Mark mentioned, um, China gained a, a monopolistic position in processed graphite as well as REEs. In 2019, there was, there was a concern with the supply risk when it came to the Chinese slowdown as well as trade tension. This is 50% of it. Um, it will be interesting to see with the, the war that's now happened between Russia and Ukraine, because if I go back two slides, Russia is also largely involved in, in a large part of the critical minerals and metals. So it'll be interesting to see how the, the world has um, accepted this and, and what they're planning on, on, on how to achieve this. So with, with China and regards to the graphite markets, um, while there is graphite mines across the whole world, the 100% of all of this material in offtake agreements is shipped to China and is then processed for battery anode materials. So China is an incredibly dominant position in the, the, the battery markets and countries such as US, Australia, Europe, and Japan, especially the, the vehicle um, producing countries are incredibly dependent on China and they are starting to be a bit concerned about the stable supply of, of graphite as well as their increasing dependence on this, this country. So we will have to see this, this does leave a, a large space for um, other countries to, to get involved and to, to look at as, as an alternative supply of graphite to the market. So a large part of, of these drivers for the clean energy mega trend in the graphite market is, is the EVs, as I mentioned, and being dependent on, on, um, on EVs for a large part of, of their cars. So globally, um, the governments have this, or global in, in governments have phased out new internal combustion vehicles. And in, in June 2022, Bloomberg stated that um, 
electric vehicle sales are expected to reach 21 million units by 2025. So that is a large amount of graphite that we're going to need. So energy storage is a huge driving um, force in our graphite market that's that dependent on graphite in its energy storage. So graphite is truly a fundamental to every battery chemistry. While the cathodes and the percentage of cathodes needed um, in a battery changes, the, the graphite stays very consistent. There is, um, there is research that's going into having silica anodes and there are benefits to it, but the price just, the graphite price and, and, and the affordability way out, um, outrule, out, outrule the, the silica. So at the moment, the graphite is, or graphite market is, is really dominating the anode market. And um, each, so, so some of the, the research that I did say that each um, electric vehicle needs roughly 50 kilograms of, of flake graphite. So with the, the change and with the um, demand in, in EVs, there's definitely this increase in, in graphite demand too. So as I mentioned, the graphite demand is, is definitely expected to outpace other battery min, um, metals. And you can see that as of 2026, 20, we are expected that the graphite demand is definitely going to exceed the global supply um, by what they predict is 40, 000, uh, 400,000 tons. Um, this is all being benchmarked as of 2022. And um, as I mentioned previously, if, if we looked at the first, the research that was done in 2019, lithium outweighed the need, or the, the amount of lithium that was required was outweighing graphite. Whereas in new research, they, they're showing that graphite is really one of the, the critical metals that, that we, we need in order to meet this uh, battery demand. Um, and here they now state over 500% growth in demand for 20, uh, 2031 for graphite and making it the strongest key battery material that, that is a necessity. So graphite, um, just to conclude, there is an exceptional market opportunity with regards to this, this green transition and a change in um, energy. And, and this is due to the unprecedented growth in electrical vehicles and the, the demand on graphite in lithium ion batteries, that the lithium ion batteries demand is also going to serve parts in portable devices by 2024. Graphite is an essential input for lithium batteries, making up all over 90% of the anode material. Uh, it is a speciality and traditional grown markets are expected to grow in line with GDP because everybody wants nice new things. So while our our population continues to grow, so does this demand in graphite. Both natural and synthetic graphite are expected to grow to, in order to supply this, this growing demand. Natural graphite provides a superior environmental profile and is expected um, to experience the highest growth in battery um, metals. And again, due to the dominant supply in, in China, um, market OEMs are, are really seeking a diverse supply of, of graphite. And um, that is me up and, and complete with my graphite um, presentation with regards to energy and, and how it, it supplies the market. Um, yes, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name's Nils Backerberg. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and to talk to you a bit about Project Blue and sort of our, our views on energy transition and critical materials. Um, I apologize that I, I missed Mark's presentation earlier this morning as I was still in the car. So, uh, you know, just looking at the titles, I'm, I may be overlapping somewhat. Um, but, you know, I think it's an important point to drive home in terms of, you know, the, the raw material requirements and what energy transition means from a, you know, as Sarah said nicely, you know, it's, it's, it's metal intensive, right? And so that's really something that we're doing. So I'm going to talk to you a little, about, a little bit about what some of these, these trends mean and maybe dig a bit deeper into the supply chain risks and, and 
you know, how, how one can navigate opportunities and, and risks in this in this whole setup. So let me just click on through here. So, you know, as with forward-looking statements, just a quick disclaimer, you know, that, you know, we, we use our integrity to, to look at these markets and di directions of travel, and we make assumptions on, on where we think things are going. But, you know, any investment decisions you decide to make on this is, is on your own account, so please bear that in mind. Um, a quick introduction to Project Blue, um, a, a name that's new, a name that's new on the market, yet maybe the research behind it, not so new. Um, so the founders, we founded this company earlier this year in May, um, and the directors were all from originally a company called Roskill that some of you may know. And sort of we work in market intelligence, so understanding mind to market supply chains, you know, and, and really supply demand balances, what are the, what drives prices, what's, you know, are the outlets, what are the risks, et cetera. This is really the space that we work in. And so Project Blue, um, we position ourselves as, you know, within energy transition supply chains and the critical materials that are happening. Um, we've already been able to grow a nice global presence, um, as well as having a, an office based here in, in South Africa with uh, some, some strong analysts joining the team, team which has been excellent. In terms of the coverage, so, you know, when we talk about critical materials, you can pretty much highlight every element on the periodic table. If someone's trying to get involved, you know, in, in terms of that research, everyone wants to get a piece of the pie. From an exploration perspective, you know, getting, getting involved in part of energy transition technologies. Um, so highlighted here is sort of the coverage that we do, and this is really part of our P, RIP is the breadth of coverage that we have, so that we, we're really looking at quite a broad range of some of the weird and wonderful elements out there, understanding those supply and demand dynamics and what their role is in the energy transition. How we structured our company, we have subscription services, we subscribe to either monthly reports or, or information deep dives into certain commodities, we do consulting where we get help with feasibility studies, etc. on, um, you know, de defining price forecasts and market op opportunities, and then we are also launching some, some web online webinars and face-to-face -face networks um, later this year. Um, and these are, are free to attend. So yeah, we look forward to seeing some of you and listen to talk about some of the work that we're doing and, and network on these industries. You know, and what, what we really provide is sort of understanding, you know, you know Sarah was going straight into to the depth of, of graphite and the dynamics and then understanding what are the trends, what drives the trends, large flakes versus small flakes. You know, how does the battery supply chain, you know, impact that, the requirements of the type of raw material. You know, when we're talking batteries, and I might mention this a few times in this talk, it's really more of a, of a chemicals industry. So, you know, the mineralogy obviously is important, um, but it's, it's, it's going into chemicals industry. So things are changing based to where previously demand was for certain types of uh, raw materials. That demand is changing based on the supply chain and technologies evolved online. And then obviously from that, we produce outlooks, understanding your risks and, and where things are going, you know, what has to happen to supply to meet that demand. You know, when we're talking about, you know, there's a big supply gap, you know, it's, it's not just by, by drawing a hockey stick price forecast saying this is, you know, prices are going to go up. You know, demand, supply will meet demand and that either is through increasing prices and incentive pricing to get more projects on the ground or cheaper supply being found somewhere else or demand destruction if there's not enough supply to be there. So, you know, one has to, to bear all of this in mind in sort of realistic trends and understand, you know, what are the risks? And that's really where we find ourselves. And the last thing we do is we provide sort of market analysis tools along that. We've built an excellent online platform called Proxima where we track all the projects, all the direction of travel, all the data, et cetera. So it's been a lot of fun um, putting this together. And if you've got questions on, on Project Bloom, um, you know, I can spend hours talking about that, but I won't do that today. Um, so just a bit about methodology. Right, so going straight into that, we've, we've had a few presentations now you know, with keywords, energy transition, critical materials, supply risk, etc. cetera. Um, and I'd like to really drill home the meaning of it. What, what are we really talking about, right? So energy transition, right? It's a transformation of the global energy sector from fossil fuels to renewable energy. Right? And, and so we... We're seeing a whole drive from a political conversation you know, towards carbon zero emissions and net zero conversations, targets being set, right? So automotive OEMs, you know, they're, they're going directly to battery, battery EVs, 
So not hybrids, because in order to reach these targets, you know, from a fleet perspective, on an average, that this is what needs to happen to meet those targets. You know, we can have a completely different discussion if hybrid electric vehicles might actually be more sustainable in terms of raw material requirements, quicker in terms of reducing reductions by retrofitting, et cetera, et cetera. These, these are broad conversations in terms of technology that need to take place, but political agendas are, are driving this forward, right? So electric vehicles aren't cheap. So how have we seen these come to market? It's been through, through, through um, incentives, so subsidies by governments. This was really a big thing in China and slowly over the last five years, they've been reducing the subsidies you know, to support that transition. So that really is, is a political conversation that's driving a lot of this, and this is why there's also a lot of funding. Um, you know, an energy transition, it's, it's not just about converting to renewable energies. You know, the, the demand for energy is increasing, right? Year on year, we're getting more demand. Okay, in, in the EU, obviously, you can see a bit of a reduction in demand, and that may be related to a bit of an energy crisis. Um, and that's, you know, something that's, that's going to get worse over the rest of the year. So there are, there are key, key risks and, and, and issues globally that, that are at play here. Um, but yeah, so renewable energy is, is increasing specifically year on year. And again, the EU has been exceptional potentially because of what's happening at the moment. But long-term travel, you know, renewable energy is going to continue to grab a larger share of, of energy supply. Um, it's a slow process. It requires a lot of investment. You know, we're talking about solar panels and, and, and wind turbines and market or uh, materials that require to produce that. But again, it's important to understand that within that energy demand is really increasing. You know, you know what's driving demand? Well, there's population growth, there's urbanization, et cetera, et cetera. All, all of this is energy intensive. Right, and raw material intensive as a result of this from various factors. So fundamentally, the, the, the shift to renewable energies is one that's supported and driven by technologies. Right? You've got lithium-ion batteries, you know, the center of conversation at the moment to, with you know, lithium, obviously, the, the main elements across all of these and then varying amounts of different elements in there. You've got graphite in the anode, you know, but there's lots of substitution conversations in there in terms of, you know, adding, adding silicon with all its pros and cons, um, various other formulations going to solid state, which is one that actually eradicates graphite demand. But then on the other side, on the cathode, you've got nickel, uh, nickel manganese, and cobalt, um, you know, engineering out the cobalt for its ESG risks, adding more nickel, manganese, you know, there's, there's and then other formulations again, other technologies. There's a technological landscape that's driving demand and it's changing very rapidly. But lithium ion batteries, in, in a sense, has really captured this market because of its energy density. Other one is hydrogen fuel cells. It's really a conversation that's been kept for, for the future, but it has seen a lot of sort of accelerations more recently and, and, and many sort of consensus views on forecasts for this are being moved forward and upgraded. Still not taking up a massive market share, but it is something that is picking up. Right. And together with all of this is the whole energy storage situation. It's not just about mobility. It's about storing energy for grid and how it's done the different technologies, vanadium redox, molten salts is getting more and more attention. Um, you know, each of them with their pros and cons in terms, in terms of, of using. But, you know, our views at the moment are still that lithium ion battery as a, as a more sure and technology is also capturing most of that. But there's a lot of there's, there's a lot of pie to go around. So people are jumping on board. Um, and when I talk about this, there's, there's no time you won't get me talking about rare earths, you know, because fundamentally, you know, these rare earth magnets are the conversion of stored energy to torque and vice versa. So any sort of any sort of operation, you know, can be improved in terms of its efficiency by using rare earths. Um, and, you know, they're looking at alternatives, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, it, it really is a key part of this energy supply chain. So I'll talk a bit about that. Right, that's sort of thinking energy transition, material intensive, but really driven by technology. Right? So it's, it's, a, it's a new tech environment. There's a lot of innovation, a lot of money spent on developing new things. Right, so the next concept is critical materials. Um, and yeah, we've, we've spoken about that today already, but I would just like to refocus the conversation. You know, what is a critical material, right? So there's no 
defined definition you know, in the book anyways, but generally when we're talking about this, it's a material that's of economic importance, that lacks substitution, and it has a level of risk associated to its supply. And that last part, well, the first and the last part are really a subjective view for an economy, right? So when we're talking about critical materials, um, um, lithium is, is, is critical in this, in this energy transition. It's a subjective view for an economy that requires lithium to meet its demand, right? And so the main consuming nations here or, or jurisdictions, are we talking USA, Europe, China, Japan, Russia, South Korea, you know, and, and India to some extent is lagging behind in terms of its, where it should be in terms of uh, population. But, you know, those are really the, the main sinks of, of demand. And so all these nations are coming up with, with strategies um, to meet that demand. So, so criticality, like I said, it's, it's a subjective view. And the map shown here, this is a PhD from one of my co-founders, you know, showing where the material is mined, you know, showing non-critical. So for China, it has a long list of elements that are relatively not critical um, because it doesn't have a supply risk associated. That's no longer necessarily true because China's invested so heavily in downstream markets that it requires raw materials beyond its domestic ability. And this again opens up that whole exploration conversation to outside of China. But you can see that in terms of those materials, everyone else has a critical reliance on that. And South Africa is important in the sense as well. You know, you've got the PGM sitting here, you've got chromite, which is um, a lacking comments on this map. Um, you know, South Africa supplies 80% of chromium to China, right? And that China does not have significant chromium domestically, which means it is critical metal from a Chinese perspective and one that South Africa can benefit from a value opportunity. Right, so that's raw material side of perspective. And the next step is, you know, supply chain criticality changes, right, along the supply chain. Um, and, and that's really important specifically when we're talking about, you know, technology developments, where are things being processed? You know, just using an example here that I started with of chromium at the top, um, you know, ores and concentrates, South Africa is, is, the, is the main producer of chromite and manganese, it's sort of interchangeable here to some extent. Um, and then ferro alloys, South Africa used to be the largest producer. So, you know, but, for, for, for South Africans, ferrochrome industry, it, it doesn't have a supply risk on chromite because it's all domestically sourced, so that's fine. There's other supply risks around here that are more energy related. You know? So you can talk about raw material feed going in, so supply risk becomes quite diverse, if you will. For the Chinese industry, the ferrochrome is the one that's at the highest risk. It is fully reliant on imported raw materials to meet that demand. Stainless steel, you know, used to be the highest risk part of the supply chain for China, but because it's invested in ferrochrome capacity, it has mitigated that risk. It still requires some, so it's not a zero risk, um, but it also sort of filters through ultimately to the risk of, of, of chromite. Um, but as a, on a company level, that risk is mitigated. Um, and then globally, demand for stainless steel, you know, the risk is 50% China, but the risk is, is less or is, is diversified because stainless steel is produced in most major regions. So, you know, from that perspective, there's more options. South Africans buying stainless steel can source it from different um, um, producers. Um, then it's a cost related thing, you know, who's the cheapest, right? So for the battery materials, just lithium, nickel, cobalt, manganese, and let's add graphite into that as part of the conversation, as Sarah Nasi showed us, is this is still evolving, right? And the reason it's still evolving, it's a fast growing market, demand is ramping up, supply needs to meet, you know, needs to meet that, which means the whole landscape is evolving as, as it evolves. Um, but for the rest of the supply chain, it's currently all sitting in China. So when we're talking about chemical compounds, precursor materials, lithium ion batteries, that supply chain is really dominated by China. There are variations to that. You know, Japan, South Korea have established industries, but really Chinese industry has, has um, invested heavily in this space. Right? So I'm going to come back to that supply chain criticality shortly. But you know, what we've what we've done at Project Blue is we've taken a list of sort of 40 materials that we've you know, labeled as critical and part of. Um, uh, the energy transition, 
when I say 40, you know, rare earths is just split into two rather than 15, and PGMs is also on here just as one. So a bit more than that. And understanding where these are, are used, and this is all, of, all on our website. So if you want to use some of this data, please feel free to go have a look and, and use the data that we've got there. And so what we've done here is we've taken the critical materials and said, okay, what is a objective view or a, or a planet Earth view, if you will? Like I said, criticality is a subjective view from, from a consumer perspective. And so what we've done, we've looked at supply risk in terms of corporate consolidation, supply consolidation, regional, you know, um, and then ESG risk. This is then based on your environmental social governance all based on published data, so rankings of countries, and then economics importance. So we've used published data to define all of these, these variables in here and you come up with the risk. And so cobalt, just as an example, you know, it's got a high supply risk, 70% from the DRC, high corporate consolidation with sort of three major producers, ESG risks, you've got artisanal mining, child labor conversations, really high sitting on the list there. Economic importance, super alloys and aerospace, as well as the, the battery EVs. So, you know, it actually ranks very highly in terms of risk, right? So it's, it's the, the critical material high with a high risk associated to it. Gold is very low as an example. It's economic importance one can argue about. Um, but from a functional perspective, um, if you exclude the financial importance from an economy, gold has a low economic importance. Niobium is the one with the highest supply risk, right? 90% from Brazil, 60% from one company. Um, you know, ESG risk is average economic importance. Again, mainly related to steel. Right? So we did this for all of those materials, and this is the ranking. Again, you can find this on our website. And I've just quickly highlighted the battery raw materials on here. And you can see cobalt really sitting at the top, heavy rare earths, not a battery raw material, but again, what I was saying. You know, they're part of the supply, uh, the, the transition, sort of enabling battery materials effectively. Um, niobium sitting up top here. So, so a lot of these materials that we're talking about have a high risk association with it. And um, you know, so graphite as well, we're talking about this is in our top 10 in terms of in terms of materials, but even things like chromium, which we don't really talk about in energy transition, but it has a high economic importance because of stainless steel. Um, yeah, so each of these these elements have, have their own narrative behind it. All right, so coming back to that supply chain criticality and what we sort of outlined here, is that different jurisdictions, different governments are coming up with strategies. Like, how do we deal um, with that supply risk? So I already showed this, you know, this is that list that the European Commission published, you know, they've identified rare earths as, as a high risk environment. You know, light rare earths, this is your, your serum lanthanum, um, uh, neodymium, praseodymium mainly, so your, your magnets. Um, and, but, you know, if you actually look into it, the supply risk is really only for serum and lanthanum in, in Europe. That is the main consumption that's being used. NDPR, there's neodymium for magnets. There's no magnet production in Europe, so it's actually no supply risk related. They don't have that market. Their risk is much further down the line to magnets, right? So, so one needs to be a bit careful when one looks at this and trying to understand this. But, you know, the supply risk for them on, on light rares is actually related to, to the oil, oil and gas industry as well as um, the uh, internal combustion engine vehicles. Right? So they come up with these strategies. The US has one, China has one, Japan has one. And then we also got Canada and, the, and Australia coming up with strategies and they're calling it critical mineral strategies. And it's, it's a bit of a misnomer in terms of the use of critical materials. If you take the subjective view, because Australia does not have the markets for which, which defines many materials as critical. Um, so really what it's, what's being done here is, is, a, is a value opportunity, right? So, so they're coming up with strategies to meet other people's criticality to offer diversity. Right. So that's really the two strategies. And then you can have a think about what you will, what House of Africa could potentially fit into that. Right. So what's what's happening here? How are things shaping up? Right. So the key drivers are, you know, the automotive industry is a massive change to so with electrification. And this is our, our views on, on where we're seeing. And you can really see automotive starting to, to, to overshadow the rest of the mind. Energy storage systems, so grid storage also ramping up, but really dwarf for this time in terms of available data, what we're seeing um, coming out of there. And, but within 
energy storage systems, I mentioned this, there, there are various different technologies. You've got your even lead acid batteries are being repurposed for that. Vanadium redox batteries is a, you know, a great conversation for South Africa in here. Other flow batteries are looking at there. And then, you know, we've, you know, other electrochemical, we've also got those, those molten salt batteries in there. This is the market share that they're looking to address when they're coming to market. But really it is lithium ion batteries that is capturing the majority of this because of its established technology. Right, so we've got this landscape evolving. And, and as this changes with new technologies, you know, the raw material requirements can change quite quickly. You know, with the forecast three years ago showing, you know, what happened to cobalt and now, you know, engineering out of cobalt, out of lithium batteries, it's still the growth and increase for cobalt, but it's a lot, lot less than what we did three years ago. So that is continuously changing and we're adjusting our views and, and to understand those risks, we need to understand the technology landscape and where things are going. Right. And here is the battery technology landscape from the cathode perspective. Right? And so it's basically just running through this, you know, LCO, this is your portable electronics. So it's still a growing market. It's not that it's declining. It's just that the automotive industry is so much larger. Right? LFP, these are your, your lithium iron phosphates, batteries, sort of low value, low range. Um, but picking up that sort of low uh, or sort of uh, entry level EVs effectively. So we expect that to be a big market moving forward. And then your, your nickel, manganese, um, and cobalt uh, um, formulations up here, picking up the sort of higher end EVs. And the drive has sort of been announced the nickel, manganese rich cathode formulations. And that's, that's really related to, to a cobalt conversation, but also has increased energy density. So you know, various things are coming in there, and this, this will change over the forecast period. All right. And on top of that, that's just batteries. Then you've got solar and wind technology being, you know, that, that about energy storage for grid and supply, you know, it's a great topic for us here in South Africa. Um, but all of these have different raw material requirements. You know, solar panels use a variety of, of metals, but, you know, the key one here to talk about is really silicon metal. You know, it's one where its market share is changing based on growth in this market. So it's having a huge impact. Wind energy, um, offshore, you know, they're moving offshore, low, um, low maintenance costs incentives, which is incentivized by using rare earth magnets. There are other technologies out there, but if you switch those out and put rare earth magnets back in, you're getting more energy out of it. And this is an energy conversation. So, you know, it's, it's a very difficult one to substitute certain metals out. And... Um, Within this, you know, each metal has its own conversation, you know, its own risks, its own issues that are being addressed. So just to quickly touch on a few, you know, lithium, you know, mine versus brine. There's an, there's an economic footprint, uh, um, environmental footprint conversation in there as well. You know, will feedstock ramp up in time? There's no shortage of lithium as such, but, you know, it's really the battery grade materials that is last point to capacity outside China, or even inside China to meet that. You know, and what about the, the lithium triangle? So this is looking at the, um, your, your, your South, South American sources. You know, how is that ramping up? You've got, you know, China investing heavily into securing supply from there. Again, supply risk, right? They're securing supply by investments. Um, you know, USA, Europe, Russia also looking to do that. You know, where is that happening? China's already moved on and is investing in Africa. Nickel, class one with class two, this is sort of the stainless steel versus battery conversation. Indonesia, laterite deposits, again, the environmental footprint, lots of conversations in here. DRC for cobalt, artisanal and ESG conversations, all refined in China. You know, manganese, it's a niche market to steel. You know, is, is it really, the, a lot of the South African miners aren't even looking at batteries because this is, isn't the market to make money. But, you know, we have, um, manganese metal company MMC in South Africa producing you know high grade manganese that, that could be a, a potential source but has a cost issue etc so there are lots of conversations around that um, graphite again very much China centric conversation it's all about the synthetic graphite versus natural graphite you know what does that look like in terms of feedstock in, into the battery supply chain um, and then vanadium adding that in here you know important for South Africa. It's totally, completely a byproduct from, from steel slag, secondary supply. These new um, um, titanium um, iron deposits that we're looking at also against, we've got these co-product uh, markets looking at them, but they're very receptive to, to volatile prices for Canadian. And so the ERBs go in and out of economic, you know, being competitive on a cost basis. 
And so with an evolving landscape, fast growth and different technologies, you know, can it be a, a stable source of, of energy storage? So that is its biggest challenge. And then just finishing off a little bit with rare earths, you know, rare earths again is, is very much China centric. You know, but you know, you've got all this political agenda at the moment taking place to diversify supply. And you know, Australia's got a or well, Japan has an independent supply chain by Australia that goes to Malaysia, Vietnam, you know, in terms of processing. You know, it's not it's again environmental conversations behind you in terms of thorium content, in terms of what's used to produce the metal, um, etc. And this is all related to diversifying supply and dashed lines here. These, these are not recent announcements of. of identifying potential supply chains. But in the meantime, the opportunity is still get a rare earth mine on the market and send it to China, right? The best example here is Mountain Pass in, in the USA, right in the middle of, of the, the trade war happening between US and China, they started exporting because it is China owned. So, so can that be diversified? Just to reiterate, it's, it's not just getting the mine supply, you have to do the whole supply chain in order to diversify. So it's a complicated situation. So just to finish off, and I'll keep this part short and open up to questions and comments is, you know, thinking, you know, being, being sitting in South Africa, talking about raw materials here, what is the opportunities down here? Um, the CSIR published this report earlier this year, looking at potential values and, and what are the resources in here. And it is a big export market, it's showing you on the lower graph, and, you know, identifying what resources are available. And we've seen the forecast, you know, where are these materials going and how can that be done? But there still are lots of challenges in the country to, to meet that. A lot of these battery raw materials aren't necessarily sort of the best resources in the, in the country. So, you know, can South Africa sort of be a steward and a hub for Southern Africa or broader, you know, in terms of developing supply chains? That's a conversation we were having last week with a few, with a few delegates at a, at a conference. You know, how, what does that look like? Um, you know, and so there's there's various aspects to look at that. So I'll I'll leave this for you to look at in your own time, um, and we can address some comments on this as as goes. But that's that's it for me. I hope I've kept into time. Um, but yeah, thank you for having me. Excellent. Thank you very much, Niels. Um, again, very good to take a step back and look at the broader economic drivers around uh, the various materials and minerals. So. Yeah, that was great. Let me just open the floor. Does anyone have any questions, insights, anything to add on that? I see Mark is back online. I'm sure he might have uh, some comments, but yeah, um, the floor is open. So Niels, from my side, I know you have to leave very soon, but from my side, I, I find it quite amazing the advantageous position that China sits in, in, in most commodities. Is it is it a result of their mineral endowment or has China stolen a march strategically in terms of seeing critical minerals before everyone else? Um, I mean, a, a bit of both, right? In terms of mineral endowment, you know, there's obviously lots of geologists on the call here. Um, you know, we, we, we know what defines a mineral endowment and it's, it's geological heritage as well, right? So I think there's many regions with the right geology in place, and I, I would include South Africa or Southern Africa as part of that. So yes, they, had, they I mean, we're talking rare earths, for example, Southern China, ionic clays, you know, they, they, they're not unique there, but they've been developed there and, and in, in, in good or bad ways. Again, it's a different argument of you know, really encouraged illegal mining and environmental hazards, etc. cetera. Um, so the, historically there's been, um, lack of regulation that has supported some of the, the growth in mining um, but there's been a lot of cleanup in the country at the moment for the last last six seven years um, in terms of addressing a lot of that which has been interesting to follow but yeah china has invested for the last two decades in this right the steel industry you know when we go back to 2000 china wasn't on the map um, and now it's more than 50 percent of supply globally for all, all steel production right so it's invested heavily. When you're looking at battery raw materials, it's miles ahead. It's it's no longer just cheap supply chain. It's it's leading technology advances. You know LFP. You know technology using that in in EVs. You know everyone was just using that in trucks and and buses. And China went in and built cheap electric vehicles. 
not you know to to serve the market, not in terms of to undercut, right? It's 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 what the market required. So China is leading the way in terms of technological developments, um, and have invested heavily in terms of developing and being innovative in the space. And so you know what one thing you know we have all these conversations about um, about where was this. Uh, in you know, governments looking at st strategies to diversify from, from China. And I think for Africa, the conversation should look completely different. Um, we, there are good Sino-African relations. There are good Europe-African relations. There are good Europe-US-African uh, relations. And for better or worse, there are good Russia-African relations, right? So, you know, in terms of saying, you know, China centralized all of this and, you know, what's Africa, that's not part of the conversation. I think, you know, Africa needs to, has an opportunity here to be a resource rich supplier and partner up with, you know, where, where the investment goes. Um, you know, it's not, China is again, leading the innovation in this and there's an opportunity here for Africa to partner in that sense. And as well as offer, Diversify and supply outside of China. So I think Africa has a great opportunity. You know, when I talk focused on rare earths, this map, you know, there's basically lines going left, right, and center around Africa. And um, you know, I think there are huge opportunities for the continent. Um, but it's a political one that needs to be sorted out first. Great. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, as uh, was mentioned, I'm CEO of Vanadium Resources, ASX, as well as Frankfurt Listed, DAX Listed. Um, basically, our biggest project at the moment is the Steelport Drift Project. Um, Going to talk a little bit around Vanadium, its uses, the market itself, and then give you a slight uh, peek into what we're actually up to out in Steelport. Um, as per usual, uh, because we listed just the disclaimer, so don't take our word on this. Uh, do your own research is basically what it says. So in terms of Vanadium's battery credentials, um, everyone is punting around the renewables and everyone is punting around electrification of vehicles and the uses of electricity downstream, but nobody has really realize that there's a big difference between when the power is generated by the wind and the sun and tidal waves and all sorts of other funny uh, renewable energy sources. And that's very cyclical in nature, while the consumption on the other end is, is purely 24 seven, people want to switch on their televisions at night. They wanna charge their, bat uh, their cell phone batteries all the time. So lithium has always been the, the poster boy of the battery wall. And behind the scenes, there's actually a big grunt work being, going, uh, being done uh, for utility sized um, storage. So we're talking megawatt sizes. So vanadium itself is used in vanadium redox flow batteries. Um, you probably heard the term. A vanadium redox flow battery basically consists of two tanks um, where vanadium is in solution. The vanadium itself can exist in different oxidative states. So it's passed through a membrane. Um, if it moves from the one state to the other, it either uh, releases electrons, which gives you energy, or if you put energy back in, you change the oxidative state one, one level higher. So the main use of it is in grid and mini grid utility level storage. Up to now from about five megawatts upwards, the largest installation is currently being put into Dalian in China. And that is a 800 megawatt um, installation. Uh, so that's the largest one. There's about 120 of these installations commercially running worldwide at the moment. Work is also being done to go slightly smaller than the five megawatts. And I know South Korea is starting to develop this technology to uh, electrify their commercial shipping fleet um, because it's quite large and heavy. Uh, commercial shipping fleets can actually use these batteries and, and you'll soon have electrical shipping fleets. And this then provides a link between your renewable energy and end consumer use. 
The biggest ben benefit of an IDM is it's fully scalable. So it's modular. You can go up as much as you want. Unlike lithium, it doesn't go bang. It's not flammable. Got a very long lifetime, uh, in excess of 25,000 cycles that you can charge and discharge it. And you can fully discharge it. Uh, it doesn't get damaged like lithium. So in excess of 20 years life, it does not degrade or very limited degradation, unlike lithium that starts with a very high power input and goes down. And it's fully recyclable at the end of its life. So a lot of the producers are currently looking at leasing your electrolyte to the users. And then at the end of the term, uh, they just recover their vanadium and use it again. Vanadium itself, uh, global production is mainly in China. So this is total production. Vanadium gets produced uh, three main sources, the one being primary. Then you've got a secondary source um, that's basically from the steel slags. And then also as byproducts from uh, burning of fossil fuels mainly. So fly ash um, or uh, stone coal that's being burnt or even the uh, leftovers from heavy fuel oil. In terms of primary producers, there's only three main ones, China, South Africa, and Brazil. Um, I know in Mark's presentation, he mentioned that 28% of the world's vanadium is in South Africa. But in terms of primary uh, sources being titano, titano magnetites, we uh, contain about 60 to 70% of the world's vanadium. So the balance is contained elsewhere in the world, but in lower purity, other carbon uh, sources. <coughs> now, if you look at the new capacity potential for vanadium um, between now and or 2020 and 2025, from existing capacity expansions uh, is the main source of this. And then there's a smaller source from uh, the darker red one is primary producers and the pink one is uh, new capacity uh, on secondary sources. What is interesting to note between the left hand and right hand table, which I'll get to just shortly. Uh, expansion on existing capacity. If you look at the dark blue, that is slag based and the light blue that is from stone coal. So that is if they would uh, increase the, the capacity uh, of those sources. However, what you saw in China in 2020, uh, towards the, the second half of 2020, for the first time in history, China became a net importer of vanadium. And that is slightly linked to the table on the left because China had stringent uh, controls put in on their smelters, smelters and furnaces at the steel making site and they cut down on emissions. So the burning of um, stone coal and sm steel smelting on low grade magnetite ores to produce the vanadium was partly shut down. So he had a knock on effect that they weren't producing sufficient vanadium out of these secondary sources. And they are heavily reliant on these secondary sources for their vanadium production. And we foresee that continuing in the future as well, um, because China is starting to be become a lot more stringent on their emissions. And they're cutting down on all these low grade, uh, cheaper furnaces that they, they are currently operating. <clears throat> in terms of the battery boom, uh, I think we've seen this graph basically in different formats on all the previous uh, presentations. Everyone knows the battery boom is gonna happen. Um, and it sort of follows the same trend. In terms of vanadium, even if it only take, uh, captures 10% of the battery capacity, uh, the, the production, current production will nearly have to double. In terms of the demand, um, current vanadium, uh, about 90% is used in steel making, about three to 5% in the vanadium redox flow batteries, depending on which reports you read. And then uh, also about three to five percent in aerospace, where in specialized alloys um, it, uh, with titanium, it gives you a high strength, uh, low uh, mass for for the um, aircraft uh, undercarriages and, and and steel work. It also plays a strong, uh, high importance in steel making. Um, so even though 
total steel production hasn't greatly increased in the last few years. The use of vanadium in the steel has uh, increased significantly. Uh, compound growth of about 5% per year. That is because when, if you, only a small portion of vanadium uh, added to steel can increase its strength about four to five fold. So you need a lot less steel in your construction and your manufacturing uh, to achieve the same outcomes. Now, depending on uh, which projections you believe, uh, the demand for vanadium in vanadium redox flow batteries is forecast to go up to between 15 to 25% of battery capacity, which will put the vanadium uh, demand uh, in terms of a total up from the 5% it's currently to probably around the 10%. If you look at the existing sources, exist, uh, currently the production is about 100,000 uh, metric tons of vanadium itself, which equates, equates to about 300,000 tons of vanadium pentoxide. And it is predicted that within the next four to five years, uh, demand will grow by anywhere between 30 to 50,000 tons for vanadium metal itself, uh, or about 100,000 tons of vanadium pentoxide per year. So nearly a doubling. And if you look at the components of it, it's not only, the growth is not only sitting in vanadium redox flow batteries, it's also sitting in steel making and aeronautical uses. Uh, so it's the one benefit of vanadium, it's got a bit of a, a, a split demand. Um, so you, you've always got the banker of steel and the vanadium redox flows becomes your upside potential. In terms of metal prices, uh, this table is a little bit outdated. It has come down off this historical, or not historical high, but of a recent high of $12 per pound. And it's currently sitting at about $7.50 to $8 a pound. And all projections are that the vanadium price is going to remain a little bit volatile in the near term future until China stabilizes. But it will remain in this between seven to twelve dollar per pound uh, uh, band. In that band, a lot of the stone coal producers in China are non economical and they will slowly drop off. Uh, so that's why you will see this great fluctuation in the prices as they come in and out of the market. In terms of our project itself, uh, as the name suggests, it's situated close to Steelquart, uh, not too far from the old Mapox mine and the old Vantec uh, operations of Glencore. Um, the other producers or the other main primary producers locally is Bushveld uh, Minerals with the Vermetco and Brits Vanadium operations. And then you've got Glencore uh, with Rovan. Uh, and these two current operations are basically two out of the three biggest primary producers worldwide, with the third one being Largo, situated in Brazil. <clears throat> Our project itself has got a JORP resource of about 660 million tons of uh, uh, magnetite, sitting at 0.77% vanadium. And we've also converted about 80, uh, 70 to 80 million tons of this into a reserve, which constitutes our first 25 years of production. So you can see it's quite a big deposit that we're sitting with. Um, and we predict that we can potentially operate for about 180 years if required. In comparison to a lot of the peers in the, out there, You've got the operating guys here with Bushveld and Largo. Um, Largo has got a very nice high grade deposit, but small volumes at the moment. Um, they've got about 20 years life left. Bushveld is starting to uh, develop their Mokopane project, which is further north, closer to uh, Petersburg. And then you sit with Vanadium Resources that's got quite a big, massive deposit. And on the other end of the scale is a lot of the aspirin producers in Australia. They sit with a problem that they've got very low grade material, very small uh, deposits, difficult to mine. So they, they're struggling a little bit to make the uh, economics work so well. Our project itself is based on the conventional processing technology. 
Um, it's about a $200 million CapEx project uh, with 18 month build time uh, in phases. We, at the beginning, we'll do about 12,500 tons per year of vanadium flake at 98% purity. We then expand and take it up to the 18,500 ton per year of pentoxide flake for the next 13 years uh, or 19 years, producing on average about 40 million pounds of pentoxide flake which only constitutes 12% of our total resource. So depending on what the market does, we can go bigger if we, if we require. Just some of the metrics that we uh, to compare and two of the more important ones. If you look at capital costs uh, for South African projects, it's a lot cheaper than building in Australia, for example. Um, both us and Mokopani from Bushveld are a lot lower on capex compared to the Australian operations. Um, and they actually have to include technologies to remove the titanium as well, uh, just to make the economic metrics a little bit better. In addition, our OPEX cost locally is a lot cheaper. We produce here at about $3 to $3.50 per pound. Um, compared to the Australian guys at five to $6 per pound. We're very comparable to Lago in Brazil, um, which is currently sitting at about $3.30 per pound. So if the vanadium price was to take a bit of a dip, um, you would probably find that the South African and uh, Brazilian operations would continue going. Uh, timeline of our project, we're currently completing the DFS. That's going to come out in about two to three weeks from now, um, at which point we will then finalize the investment decision and funding for the project with kickoff uh, for construction starting mid next year and first production um, of an ADM flake predicted to be uh, early to mid 2025. And that is my presentation. I was hoping not to go over the time, so maybe I rushed it a bit. Awesome. Thank you very much, Eugene. That was, that was great. Um, yeah, I know you didn't rush it. That, that, that went down very well. Um, any questions, insights? I'll just give it a moment. And in the meantime, yeah, Eugene, I just wanted to know, um, in terms of the future chemistry of batteries, um, do you feel there's more risk or more opportunity for vanadium in terms of the variations in, 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 in chemi chemical constituents in batteries? I think there's a lot more opportunity for vanadium itself. Look, there are different uh, redox flow batteries. You do get the iron ones. Uh, there, there's a lot of technologies that's competing with it. Vanadium has got a bit of an inside line because uh, it is starting to get commercial rollout uh, at this point. The main thing I think that the world needs to realize, there's not enough, enough lithium going around to cover both electrical vehicles and small batteries, as well as grid storage. It's, it's just not possible. And as Noel said earlier, you know, we we need to take a look at the pie. There's a big enough part of the pie. Um, leave lithium to focus on the small stuff and look at the other ones for, for, the, for the rest of it. But in terms of chemistry, vanadium redox flow batteries are operating. We're actually putting one in at our operation itself, uh, linked to a, a, a PV plant. Um, it's proven there's probably about 30 companies manufacturing these as well worldwide already. So in that sense, it is primed to really take off. Um, we, we expect within the next year or two that you will see the application and implementation of redox flow batteries greatly uh, increasing. And with initiatives that both Bushveld and Lago have brought in where the clients can actually lease the, the vanadium, it brings your capital upfront capital cost down quite significantly. Very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, I would love to hear more about, about that. Uh, would it be leasing, obviously, of the vanadium power, power cell, power units? Well, it's actually how this system works is you've got the infrastructure. So that is the, the steel casing and everything else around it. That's the capital that you purchase. Uh, 
but the electrolyte itself that goes in. So that constitutes about 30% of the price of the battery. So you just rent the electrolyte itself. Um, and then when the battery reaches it, uh, the rest of the infrastructure of the battery reaches the end of the life, the guy that gave you the electrolyte comes and he fetches the electrolyte and he can reuse it and sell it to somebody else. That's, that's definitely something worth looking into, particularly in terms of just looking at recycling and smart ways of thinking about uh, recycling things and the circular economy. That's very interesting. And that's, that's the, the biggest benefit around the vanadium is, you know, to recycle it out of a battery, 95 to 98% of what's left there, you can use as is for the next battery. Awesome. Mark, I see uh, you have your hand up. Uh, go ahead. Uh, sure. Um, I, I guess this is to any of the presenters or anyone on, on the call. Um, this I, the, That was a really interesting comment and uh, a sage way into something I actually did want to mention but didn't get around to. Uh, currently, um, the United Nations, amongst others, is talking a lot about resources as a service. So the concept would be very simplistically is you actually don't owe, own anything. So effectively what you're doing is effect, like that, you rent or lease the electrode and you hand it back at, at the end of the day. What would be sort of of interest, say, say example, you, Eugene, I guess I'm passing this back to you. In terms of your shareholders, do they, don't they think of anything weird in that? Because now you actually you're not actually owning anything or rather the company owns, but you as an investor don't necessarily own that product. So it's all, so it's like share time. So you, you're physically not going to, to earn anything. Is that something that investors like? Is it something investors get a bit skittish of um, or not? Well, the thing is, Mark, you, that remains your asset. So on your, on your books, um, you have, let's say a thousand tons of vanadium that you leased out. So that, that thousand tons of vanadium sits on your books as an asset with a value. And um, you can recoup it afterwards. But while you lease it out, you still have a constant income stream uh, coming in. So you, you actually end up with the best of both worlds where you get a constant income stream for that 20 year life. After the 20 year life, you get that asset back. Uh, it, it, it's still got a capital value at the market price of an idiom at that point. And secondly, if you look at it, because batteries only constitute about 10 to 15% of your product sales, the balance still being steel, you, you sort of hedging your bets with the steel price that you get a, a big, big income upfront and you get this constant uh, flow of, of income on the other side at a very low risk. You don't, you get an income stream without even having to mine. Okay. No, it's, it's just, I find it quite interesting because it's one of, for my sins, I'm also on the, some UNEC working expert working groups. And one of the discussion documents, which is going to be tabled next month is resources as a service. So basically the implication is that you're going to be in perpetual rental which, sorry, I, again, just getting back to the point you made, the, that the, the re, renting something out and then recycling, again, is also posited, I guess, as you, you know, you're in a closed circular economy and you're not going to have any leakage coming from that. So I guess, while it sounds great, there's going to be some interesting uh, accounting principles that are going to have to be readjusted in valuation of companies if you're going to be you know, doing that because it's no longer just the standard. You have an asset, you sell it, and then it's you know, depreciating and you, you know, amortize things over time. So uh, I, I imagine the accountants and stuff are going to have some uh, interesting things to say about that coming through, especially you know, company valuations and stuff. Yeah, Mark, what, uh, what Lago is starting to do, uh, and these are all fairly new uh, concepts that's being put out there and, and being driven, is to actually have a vanadium trading house. Uh, so you as an investor can actually buy a ton of vanadium, same as you would gold. 
um, you never get it, you never use it, but you can invest and in one ton of gold, uh, one ton of vanadium, which they will then rent out on your behalf and you get your return on that. So they, they're establishing that as well. I don't know exactly the accounting side of it, the financials. I'm just a metallurgist, but um, it, it'll be interesting to see how that, that pans out. Yeah, I think that that does a very valid point. Um, besides the interesting uh, financial and accounting methods that may have to uh, adjust, there, there's also some interesting market opportunities, like you mentioned, Eugene, in terms of creating a commod commodifying it a bit more or financializing the commodity a bit more. So that's quite interesting. I'm sure we'll see ETFs and all, all sorts of things coming around, uh, things like that. That's a really interesting topic. I'll definitely look further into that. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for taking time out from your schedules to listen to my talk. As Joshua introduced me, I'm Musarat, and I'll be talking about the energy under your feet. I have a few colleagues that have uh, assisted me uh, in, this, in this project. And as you can see on the picture on your right, it shows the feet, um, and it shows that the warmest part of your feet is in the middle. But today I'm not talking about feet. I'm talking about the energy that is uh, the heat from the earth. Okay, um, the disclaimer, all work here belongs to the Council for Geoscience. This information is confidential and it's only for you. Any reproduction of this information is prohibited unless the Council for Geoscience or better known as CGS gives written permission beforehand. Council for Geoscience and its representatives are not held liable for the use and reliance on the information presented. Now that we have the technicalities out of the way, I uh, just want to give you a um, breakdown of my talk. I would like to thank a lot of people in this project. Also, we're going to look at new data for geothermal waters in South Africa. I will give you an overview of the energy load in South Africa. How and where are the geothermal waters in South Africa? And then we'll look at the materials and method of what I've collected and how I've collected them. Some of the results. I'll discuss some of the results and conclude. Acknowledgements, I'd like to thank all the privately owned, municipality owned, community owned, spas, hotels, and green reserves for all the geothermal water sampling that we got to do in the areas. Also, I'd like to thank CGS management because without them, I wouldn't be here today. Also, I would like to thank a whole lot of staff members um, listed on the right-hand side. Everyone contributed in a different way, and most of them helped me swim into this hot water. So what are the results? This, is this data is new. Okay. So we were able to calculate the enthalpy ranges with the depth of the reservoirs. Enthalpy is the measure of energy in water or steam. So we've identified 17 sites at the bottom here, from BPS to SHU. And then on the y-axis, we give you the temperature of the geothermal waters. In the black, uh, black squares, we show that the, the temperatures of the geothermal waters measured on surface, and these are only 17 sites. Um, we also looked at the geothermal gradient, which is in green. I plotted it to, to show the temperature per kilometer. Um, then afterwards, we I plotted, the next thing that we plotted was the temperature that we computed using the silica ions that we have analyzed. And that's where we got the temperature of the waters of, of BPS to Shushu. And you can see it's uh, at above 100 degrees for most of them, except for two. And we also looked at there after that, we used the temperature plus the geothermal gradient and we computed the depth of the water on the right-hand side. This, you can see that we have some of the waters, the reservoirs that are computed to be at 1.2 kilometers, shown in the orange line, and the rest of them are below two kilometers, shown in the purple line. Also, we found out that some of the waters, when we computed the depth, we are below one kilometer, and these occur in the Cape Fold Belt. Now to show you how I got here. 
And why do we actually looking at, why are we looking at geothermal waters or geothermal energy? Why investigate them? Because in, in the integrated, res integrated resource plan in, of 2019, uh, it was stated that we need to decrease the greenhouse gases. So in 2018, I'm going to show you a, a graph showing you that, that the coal was 89% and we need to reduce this to 52% by 2030. So we, we, need, we either need to add more alternate energy sources and or, or cleaner power, like, uh, and at the same time, they said that we, they want to at least 24,100 megawatts of coal power plants will be decommissioned. So that means we need to replace this with either cleaner coal technologies or look at, um, and in, in 2020, 2021, in the annual performance plan, the Department of Mineral Resource and Energy also said that they will look into new investments must be made into efficient coal technologies, including supercritical and ultra supercritical power plants with carbon capture utilization and storage to comply with the climate and environmental requirements. So you can see that with us as well, the nuclear had decreased to 2%. Hydro would be increasing to 5%. But in this, there is no, there is no geothermal energy added to the energy load. Why is this? Um, I asked myself this on numerous times. Why we have all of these hot springs, but we don't have geothermal energy added to the system, to the IRP. And this is because geothermal waters originate in certain geological environments that promote high heat flow, such as volcanic activity, volcanically active areas or high tectonic um, activity areas, which we don't have this in South Africa at the moment. But we do have hot springs and we do use them for leisure. What else do we have in South Africa that is important is that we do have the Archean basement surrounded by orogenic belts and it's covered by thick sedimentary basins. And this, with this diagram, I'm showing you that, yes, water does penetrate further down. It does get hotter as you go deeper. And there are faults and fractures that allow for water to surface. So there should be hot springs in South Africa and it could be utilized for power generation. So let's see where they are in, the, in South Africa. And this uh, map shows you that major geological structures together with the geo geothermal waters of South Africa and they occur in anomalous heat flow, the anomalous heat flow areas in red. And that correlates with all the geothermal waters that we had sampled. And this forms ideal markers to delineate potential geothermal reservoirs. What is geothermal energy? Um, I'm going to, I hope I can play the video for you. Let's start again. And its challenges. There we One go. Of Got a it. Little I'm Matt Farrell. Welcome to Undecided. Solar and wind energy is growing worldwide. However, the intermittent power generation characteristics has kept many researchers and companies on the search for other solutions without needing batteries for storage. A lot of people are championing things like small modular reactors and thorium reactors, which I've done videos on already. But what about the great energy potential that's available inside the planet? We're talking about geothermal energy, which is thermal energy generated and stored in the rocks and fluids beneath the Earth's crust. It's been used for thousands of years by humanity for heating and cooling. Its first usage was mainly for bathing and cooking, but since the 20th century, it's been harnessed to generate electricity. How? Well, the Earth's internal heat is thermal energy generated from radioactive decay and nonstop heat loss from the planet's formation. And it can be found from shallow ground to several miles under the surface. The heat from the Earth's crust warms water that has flowed into the underground reservoirs, sometimes up to 360 degrees Celsius. And when water gets hot enough, it can break through the surface as steam or hot water. Okay, thank you. I'm going to just stop sharing the sound. So that is what geothermal energy is. How did we get to, um, to, get to determine the depth of the waters and the enthalpy? We visited 49 sites over 64, so over three months. And in the end, we ended up sampling 42 sites and 42 samples were taken. Two geothermal waters were dried up and five geothermal uh, thermal waters we did not get access to. We got to feel the water temperature, 
but the owners or the management of the property said, no, we cannot sample the waters. Um, they had different reasons and we respected those reasons. Day afterwards, we took physical properties. Uh, we took physical measurements where we looked at the physical properties of the waters. As you can see, my colleagues here, one who has taken off his shoes and that, and this is in Baleni in the Limpopo province. We, uh, we measured the temperature, the electrical conductivity, the pH, the total dissolved solids. The other one is uh, in Lobad, which is in the, um, also in Limpopo province. Uh, yeah, my colleague is uh, looking at the bubbles and also uh, trying to um, take the temperature of the of this um, pool. I would say. The next thing we did is we sampled the geothermal waters, where we sampled the, them. We filtered some of the samples for cation analysis and we preserved it with nitric acid. The next thing we did is we took another sample for anion analysis and we took a blank sample. Blank sample was for quality control, and we measured um, the, the waters using ICPMS and spectrophotometer. We also added standards and duplicates in the analysis process so that we can ensure that our data was correct or the integrity of our data was uh, intact. Uh, the chemical analysis of our geothermal water gives a glimpse of the chemical process and the conditions of geothermal waters are subjected to at the source. If geothermal energy is to be assessed for power generation, predicting the reservoir temperature is vital. So we use geothermometry, which is a solid based on concentration of silica, sodium, potassium, and magnesium, computed using various equations to predict the temperature of the water with the specific uh, equations from the various researchers. Ellis in 1979, he looked at the quotes and uh, he specified that the temperatures needed to be between 70 and 250 degrees. Also Fournier looked at the calcedony and we have Anderson who also looked at the calcedony because there's different forms of silica that could have influenced the waters. We also looked at sodium and potassium and Gigabyte also looked at sodium and potassium, and he also looked at sodium and magnesium. So we took these various equations and we, we substituted the analysis that was done, for, like, for example, for the silica or for the sodium and the potassium and the potassium and magnesium and seen what type of temperatures uh, we computed. But before I get into that, I just want to show you the um, physical parameters that we did. Uh, the temperatures range from 21, 25 degrees to 61 degrees on air, right? And then on average, if you look, so this is the temperature, my apologies, the temperature on the left-hand side and the electrical conductivity on the right-hand side. And what I plotted at the bottom is the various geothermal waters in South Africa. The, the bars show the temperature and the line shows the electrical conductivity. And as we look here, from the Cape Hope Belt, we have them in lilac. And the ones from the Lipopo province are in the bright blue color. And when we uh, looked at the average of the temperatures from the nine sites from Cape the Pope Belt and from the six sites from the Limpopo Belt, we, the average of the temperatures was 44 degrees on both sides, even though they are at the the sources could be at different geological formations, which have formed at different times. Also, I want to pay, uh, put your attention to the Riff and Scruff. You can see that the temperature increases, so does the electrical conductivity. You could say that the same thing with the geothermal waters in the Karusuba group. It's a florist bud, bud and bud and LOO. Also, the other thing that was uh, interesting to see was that even though the at 32 degrees Celsius and increase in electrical conductivity of more than a thousand, uh, you can see that warm and Zimtabi have a, a correlation between temperature and electrical conductivity. The next diagram I'm going to show you is the scholar diagram showing the concentration of ions in log form, which is shown on the left-hand side and the different anions and cations are shown on the x-axis. 
I want to pay, I want you to pay attention to the line that I'm drawing now. This is from Lobad. And this is very different to the other geothermal waters because it has low electrical conductivity, low silica, low sulfate, low and low chlorine. Uh, sulfur springs, which is in light blue, I'm going to highlight to you just now, shows chlorine that is quite low as well. And potassium uh, being quite low as well. And then um, potassium here, as you can see in the red circle, we have also cladoc, and which is in the purple dash line, and polyethylene chisa in the green dash line to have the lowest potassium values. Another thing that was quite interesting is the sulfur content from the geothermal waters of uh, Shushu, which is in KwaZulu Natal, which is in the Namakwa Natal bulb, and the other two dash lines, that one in red and the one in black, is a uh, riff and scruff from the Namakwa sector from the Namakwa Natal bulb. Another interesting uh, anomaly is. The highest carbonate content comes from the Karoos, uh, from geothermal waters that occur in the Karoos supergroup uh, with high carbonate. And then the last but not least, the highest content of where we, we find, yeah, well, before I get there, sorry, um, Bachendorf has the lowest calcium uh, content. Uh, Bricks, which is in brown color, you can see it has the highest. Uh, and ions and, and some of the highest uh, cations as well. So that was the physical properties. Now I can take you into the temperature that we computed. So the highest measured temperature is for plant clay in the Cape Hole belt, which is over here in the black square. I'm not sure if we can see it. And that is at 61 degrees. So we use those equations that I showed you earlier on to compute the temperatures for the uh, reservoirs of the geothermal waters. What we came up with is for the quartz, we said that Morrison uh, has the lowest quartz computed con uh, temperature of 45 degrees. Just put a dash line to see where it is. And then Siloam has the highest computed temperature of 133 degrees. The other thing we looked at the calcedony line, looked at Morrison again, which had the lowest um, temperature and as well as Bricks at 13 degrees. And then we looked at the Siloam also having again the highest um, temperature. Then we looked at the sodium and potassium geothermometry. We used this uh, to, uh, using the equation that I showed you earlier on, with the lowest being bricks, uh, 29 degrees, and then Kalitzdorf, which is at 426 degrees. And then we, I computed the potassium magnesium uh, temperatures. We have Clerok at the lowest and Aleni at the highest of 113 degrees. So these are all the temperatures that we have of the various geothermal uh, ge uh, geothermometry used. And to find out the enthalpy ranges, we were able of, to use for, utilize, uh, for power generation, we needed to match the, the temperatures to the enthalpy. So the first one we looked at was the low enthalpy ranges, which is, I don't know why it's going so fast. Um, Enthalpy range that we, we have temperatures that are less than 100 degrees, we would have the enthalpy to be less than 419 kilojoules per kilogram. And that, this is mostly heat used. This type of energy is mostly used for heating, for industrial uses, for aquaculture, for agriculture, and even space heating. The high enthalpy ranges are between 852 and 2,107, and the temperature of those waters need to be greater than 200 degrees. This technology to convert the energy into power generation, they has been, the technology has advanced, and they use two different types, it's called flash steam turbine and then kind of thermodynamic cycle. The medium enthalpy range is one that has, is very complicated. 
because it's lo located in various settings and it's sometimes difficult to ensure one to to develop it to, put, to use it for one type of um, usage so that's why the the that technology has been lagging behind but now as technology has improved they have hybrid systems where you can change the working fluid uh, you can get a working fluid that has a lower boiling temperature and able to convert the energy into power so this is another reason why we're looking at the low to medium enthalpy sources with that in mind we i took the enthalpy the temperature for the quartz because that was the most representative at the time and we added the enthalpy ranges what we found out was that the highlighted square shows you that the waters above in the square are the ones that are between uh, have low to medium enthalpy ranges and can be used utilized for power generation these are the ones those are from the archean we have uh, a few here then we have some from the natal namafa natal province and then some from the cape Cod, which i've highlighted in purple and this is how i got to what i said earlier on these, these sites, those sites that I showed you that were highlighted were plotted for the measured temperature, which is in black, and then afterwards the geothermal gradient in green. And then we plotted uh, the, temp the quartz geothermometry temperatures in red, and then the depth of it using the geothermal gradient to find out the depth of the reservoirs. Again, I show you that it's 1.2 kilometers. Some of them are 1.2 kilometers, and the others are between 1.2 and 2 kilometer range where the reservoir could be. And some of them are below one kilometer, shown in the yellow block. Kalistop, uh, Caledon, and Grand Play. And so in, I would like to conclude that 17 sites across the country exhibit low to medium enthalpy ranges. The sources occur between one and three kilometers below surface using the geothermal gradient and the geothermometry. And our future work includes geophysics, uh, various forms of investigations like geophysics and geochemistry to constrain our geothermal energy model and to see which sites are actually viable in the end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Arat. That's, uh, again, it's very encouraging to see the Council for Geosciences putting in um, so much work into uh, these topics. Um, thanks again for that presentation, very insightful. Um, any questions, comments, insights? Um, while we wait for that, uh, Musarat, uh, tell me, what kind of capacity does South Africa have in terms of geothermal? What, what percentage of the load do you think the potential is at? Uh, what, what percentage could it take of the load? And also, what kind of infrastructure would be needed around that and the cost of that? And then, and then maybe a final uh, question is, what does... The, is there any effect of the radioactivity radio activity of the um, the fluids to the geothermal potential? Thank you, Joshua. Yes, there is potential. Um, there has work that has been done in Lelani, which is in KZN, where they showed that uh, they can at least power 400 houses. And that's better than zero compared to what we have with all the load shedding happening. So there is potential depending on how we decide to develop it and to, to what extent. Also, we need to make, ensure that it's sustainable. So that also takes a lot more of research that needs being done. Um, the cost and infrastructure, the main issue with geothermal not being as fast as solar or wind is because it's a lot more research that needs to be done in the staff. So you can come up between five to $10 million to get the research uh, the core research being done, like especially if we have to drill um, deeper to see where the source is to locate the source, uh, look at the geothermal gradients, that takes a lot more of effort and a lot more of money. And that's um, where uh, the investors don't want, like they, they go, they hold back. 
because of we don't have high en enthalpy, we have medium to low enthalpy. And that's, um, I think, the main cost. The other cost, once we've um, established a resource, is much lower compared to the exploration cost. Not saying that the, the cost is not high, but it's much lower than the initial phases. Do we have the infrastructure? I'm hoping ESCOM would come to, uh, to do more of the work. I'm not sure about how to do transmission and that. That is um, a whole new research of its own. Um, that one uh, I cannot answer fully at this moment. And then the radioactivity from the waters, the radioactive minerals are deeper below surface. And uh, we haven't found any radioactive waters from things that we have uh, from the waters that we have sampled. So I believe that maybe the waters, um, the radioactivity is um, maybe less, or maybe it's uh, because of the long, maybe there's a longer residence time at the reservoir and the elements don't get to surface, but we haven't tested it to the extent of seeing what is the radioactivity in the water. So that one also is still to be done. We haven't looked at it as yet. Great. Okay, I'll be talking about our CCUS R&D project that's currently happening in Bumalanga. CCUS, short for Carbon Capture Storage and Utilization, and the implication for South Africa in the just transition. I'm glad Musarat came before me and she read the disclaimer, which in short, it says that I take no accountability of what I'm about to say. And just to get some politics out of the way, we are talking about this net zero. And this is a slide from the IEA reports talking about net zero. And you can see there, uh, let me just try and get a pointer quickly. Yes, if you can see my pointer. Now we are in 2022. It says in 2021, there's no new unabated coal plants approved for development. I'm not sure how much of that target we have missed uh, talking globally and as South Africa. Uh, I'll talk quickly on this slide so that I can get out of politics so that you can talk science because the current developments with the Ukraine war and Russia and all of a sudden everyone, South Africa's coal is the flavor of the world. It's sort of like puzzling. But again, moving quickly ahead, we are saying we're targeting 2050 to be net zero. I'm not sure in terms of the targets, how much of these are we likely to miss? Where we're saying 60% of car sales globally by 2030 needs to be electric vehicles when we're still struggling just to provide the basics of electricity in South Africa. And again, there's a whole lot of other uh, targets that we need to achieve at certain timelines, which I'm sure speakers who spoke earlier spoke a lot about them because the concerns that we have as a developing country, in fact, not just South Africa, most of, most of Africa compared to what other countries are targeting. So I'm not sure whether we've got our, 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 our uh, things in the right place. Okay, that's enough about politics. I always refer to the statement by our CEO, Mr. Musama Buza, who says geoscience is a full crumb of human development. So that every time I start diversing to start thinking about politics, I bring myself back to the science to say, this is what I'm about and what is my contribution to using geoscience for, for human development. Now, coming to CCUS, or what we previously termed CCS, this is just a simple schematic representation of what CCS is about, capturing of carbon dioxide emissions at a power plant, transportation, in this case, using pipelines, injection into deep-seated silent aquifers, 800 meters and deep, and permanent storage in there. And I would highlight or underline that with permanent storage. Now for South Africa, we are the largest emitters of CO2 on the African continent and one of the biggest globally. I mean, with Sasol uh, Secunda operations in Pumalanga here, which captures almost about 40 million tons per annum of CO2 that is released back to the atmosphere 
some of it sold for beverage uh, industries and other smaller industries, but majority emitted back to the atmosphere. Then we have this big elephant in the room, ESCOM, which with aging power stations, no chance of them setting up capture technologies. Yes, I, had, I think I had someone talking about direct air capture at some stage, whether can we capture CO2 from the air that is already emitted because chances of ESCOM, the way it's struggling at the moment for them to install the capture technology uh, in one of their power stations. Although part of the studies that we started doing when we started CCUS was to look at one of the new power stations, in this case, Kusile in Pumalanga, to make it capture ready. And there are currently talks and even studies to make sure that they are able to, to start looking at capture at that power station. Now, the issue of Paris Agreement, which was covered earlier, and what the minister always like to talk about, the just transition for South Africa. Because yes, it's all well and good to say, as one of the biggest global emitters, we need to also do our part in, in reducing the CO2 emissions. But there's things which are critical for South Africa. The issue of jobs and the economy. I think the stats from uh, Mineral Council is the coal industry has about 180,000 people who are employed in there. We still have vast uh, coal resources, some of which have not even been touched, like the Springbok Flats, that we can still utilize. Now, our target for the, from the minister was to say, we need to extend the coal usage as much as possible. And obviously consider storage adjacent to emission point sources. Because previously, for those who would know, we started looking at CO2 and we looked at other areas uh, far from the emission point sources. Now, in terms of uh, South African, uh, the, the background, CCS was adopted as one of long-term mitigation scenarios by the Department of Environmental Affairs. And it's also one of their eight near-term priority flagship programs uh, in, the, in, the, in the white paper that was released in, in October 2011. And then the cabinet of South Africa endorsed the CCS roadmap, which was produced at the time that was in May 2012. And it's also included as part of the National Development Plan 2030. Now, I spoke earlier about the work that was done previously. A storage atlas, which was published in 2010, and a technical report, which indicates that 98% of our storage is actually offshore, with only about 2%, which is onshore, including the Zululand Basin and the Algoa Basin, which are just extensions of the Algoa offshore in the Devon Basin. Now, the majority of the areas that we are looking at here, which is in bright yellow color, within the Karoo Basin, this gray. We are looking at mostly the coal fields, and you can see there most of the major coal fields from the Waterberg, from the Thule coal fields, the Sulpansberg, and there's the Springbok Flats, and the Wheatbank, Pumalanga, Highfield, and even Orange, Orange uh, Free State coal fields. And then we have the Maltino and Inwe coal fields on the Eastern Cape side. So these are the areas where we said we need to start looking at. But now looking at in terms of, sorry, in terms of most of the emitters, the major power stations are actually sitting in the province of Mpumalanga around this number three here, which is the area that we need to look at. And if you recall, uh, one of the mandates from the minister was to say, we need to look at areas adjacent to the major emitters. Now the major emitters sitting in Highfield, and I mentioned Sasol, we started then looking at the geology, re-looking at the geology because a lot of work had already been done in looking at the Zululand and Alcoa Basin for, for storage. But we had to now start re-looking and looking at the geology. Initially, we had identified the Vets Basin as a, a place that we can target for the storage of CO2. Reason being globally, we know that CO2 is stored mostly in saline aquifers, deep seated and it's nice with sed when they are sedimentary because you get nice your nice uh, porosity and permeability through those. But then when we started looking at the information, looking at the whole data and all that adjacent to the Ivanda gold, uh, gold Basin, we found that there's still some gold 
and obviously the minister being a former miner, he was saying, but I don't want you guys coming to sterilize my coal, because what happens if the coal price all of a sudden, it shoots up to whatever the value it might be in future. And it will affect this permanent storage, which I said out underlined earlier, because we need to, where we store CO2, it must stay there permanently so that it doesn't escape anymore. So we had to now have a change of thought to start looking at the basalt, uh, basaltic rocks. And as you would know, there's a few projects that are happening currently globally. We, we, we have the Cap Fix project in Iceland, and then there's a Walula project in the USA. I also mentioned the Tomakomai project, uh, which is in Japan. Again, they are storing offshore, but then there is a basaltic unit above the, the Ceylon aquifer where they are storing. So they started experimenting on that project about two years ago. And obviously the CCUS project, which I've tried to put it in a lighter color to say that we are in the pipeline, but coming very strongly. Now, this is just briefly a map of the parcels which make up about 10% of, 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 of the globe in terms of geology. And this map can be accessed from the CAPFIX uh, website. And we are sitting in this area here. Now, to, to try and zoom in, for the project that we are currently busy with in Pumalang, we have to look at now the detail of subsurface and do some structural mapping. Now, given what is a challenge in Iceland where they use a lot of water for mixing with the CO2 for pumping underground. South Africa, we have a challenge with underground water, but now we're seeing opportunities with all the acid mine drainage in all the gold mines and the coal mines in Pumalanga, where we can say, can we look at the acid mine water so that we can also look at treating that water using CO2 and using some of it for pumping underground. There's the Majuba project, which has now been completed, where they did underground coal gasification and recovered some of the gas. Now, as a council, we started looking at that space, that cavity, to look at what possibilities are there that we can then inject CO2 in the, into that cavity that has been created. But a lot of work still needs to go into that, that project because to understand the, the whole environmental liability about it, it is just going to take a lot. And obviously there's issues of underground water that might be stored there. And then again, there's other mining operations and future operations like the underground gasifications of uh, sterilized coal fields, because for those who know, in, in, in Haifel, for instance, Sasol is mining just the four lower coal seam. Now below it, you have a two seam, which won't be mineable at the current, uh, uh, the way the qualities look like. So there is a possibility that there can be underground coal gasification of such coal seams and use CO2 to offset the methane gas that can be utilized in future. Now, zooming in closer, the CCUS project that we are looking at is this block here within the map of South Africa, just to the west of the province of Mpumalang. Secunda is a petrochemical plant sitting here, which is about 30 kilometers to the site. And we also have Matla and grill power stations nearby. In terms of the area, this is what it looks like. And for those who've been around Sekunda Mpumalang. This is how it looks like on a spring morning. You can see very hazy. So this project is actually a big, big uh, opportunity for both the province and for other, other, other players in the, in, the, in the area because there's constant complaints about the air that comes from Sasol uh, plants and, 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 and So this is a big opportunity. Now what the municipality did they gave us a portion of land, which is a state land, just to the west of the town of Leandra, as we leave Leandra towards, the, towards uh, Kinross on the R29, where you can see that parking. So they just gave us this farm to say, here's the area that you guys can start looking at in terms of your work. And then in terms of background geology, we are in, we are looking at Mpumalanga coal fields here, and that's where the project is sitting. 
And specifically, we said we need to target this clip refers back fenter store lovers, uh, which you can see there in green. Although it extends beyond that with other groups, uh, which go as far as past the free state coal fields. So we are targeting this basaltic unit of the clip refers back group of the fenter store uh, lovers. And the insert here, it shows some of the boreholes, which is a section you will see at a later stage that we, we constructed there. We can see in terms of power stations and their size of how much uh, emissions are there. Now we had to come back and start looking in terms of legacy data to see what can we find. In total, we found about 1,500 boreholes that were drilled. The first one as early as 1931 in, in the Secunda Ivanda uh, Basin where it was exploration for gold. Some of them hit methane gas and a whole lot of others that hit other issues. And then there's a whole, also another layer of boreholes which are shallower, which were drilled now in the Karoo. You can see this map here, it looks boring geologically because it's just Karoo, the dolerite seals and the Karoo sediments, nothing much. And then having looked at the database from the CGS portal, we had to now go to the National Core Library in Dongaruke in Silverton, Pretoria, to go and look for these boreholes. Walking through these shelves, looking through 750,000 meters of borehole core, we managed to find about 22 boreholes, legacy borehole data that were donated to the council by various mining companies. One of which you can see here, which was drilled by Jenko in 1998 in 1988 up to around 1990. And you can see the old timers were just interested in their gold, so they had no business looking at everything else above it. You can see a open hold up to about 290 meters. Then you're in the Transvaal, Pevet's conglomerates, the Dolomites of the Transvaal. Then you start getting to the Fenterstorp and eventually they hit the gold, which was their target. Now, this is one of, this is that same borehole, borehole 2068, which is the one closest to the site where we are looking. As you can see here for the new, for the young guys, no escaping core logging. We have to go back to basics to look at the core. Obviously, these boreholes having certain springs at the courtyard co of Engdo for, for, for a while, and then coming to Donkerook, we had to take time just washing off the dust. Fortunately, with hard rock, Nothing much happens. You just wash off the dust and then you can start looking at the rocks clearly. So this is us looking at some of the pohole cores. Some of them not so exciting because sampling done and then and, and core mix up. So part of the geological logging, we have to look at all this work because this is the important part of geology to make sure that everything fits in space. Because what I've seen is the young guys will just chase to, to, to look at the new technology and the methods of how to log. Because once we're done with this part, and I had a question mark here previous to say, permanent storage. Clearly you can see if you still have some gold bearing material, can we really have permanent storage in such areas? Even there, which is the equivalent of the VCR, just in contact with the fender store. We are not likely to have permanent storage here because assuming the minister wants to come back and remind this, this gold here. So hence the question mark to say, can we have permanent storage in the vets? The answer is clearly no. Now talking about technology, we had to sit and log this borehole and some of our colleagues were busy just last week doing magnetic susceptibility measurements on the borehole cores. And you can clearly see how nicely it comes out with all the marker horizons where you have your black reef in contact. Uh, unfortunately, on this borehole, we didn't have much of the shale, which is sitting above the Dolomites here. But you can see, clearly see where we have the VCR and going into, into the feds with very low susceptibilities compared to the, mag to the magnetic lavas. Although in this case, it looks nice and uniform. After logging, we also have this uh, uh, hyperspectral scanner at the courtyard which I think it's one of few in the country. Here you can see the long wave infrared, which shows you clearly all these units 
and, and, and different units within the, the, the core. And when you start getting into the vets, back into the fenter stop and into the vets again, there you can clearly see your dolomites there. So these are all the interpretations that some of the young guys would rather like to go and play with. But for me, the key thing is to make sure that all your rocks are sitting in the right place. Because once you do this scanning, it's a permanent thing that will sit there. And if, if your geology is incorrect or the cores have been dropped, having been drilled over 30 years ago, then you basically just capturing garbage so that you try and interpret from garbage. Now, in terms of our modeling, once all that work is done, here's our pothole again, where we also took some samples. This was just a schematic diagram, which we constructed a section, which I showed from the, from the map earlier, where we sort of like interpret the different units. And our unit of interest is this ultramafic unit at the bottom of the clip refill stack. And it's sitting nicely at about 1.8 uh, kilometers below surface because our minimum target area, we're targeting 800 meters be and below so that we know that the CO2 will be in a supercritical uh, format where it, it sort of like behaves like liquid and we'll be able to compress it and store more for, 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 for a smaller space. We also took some samples here initially and there's been sampling that has happened subsequently to that where we're measuring porosities and permeabilities the results are quite exciting unfortunately i don't have them to share at this present stage we also did some uh, some uh, x-ray tomography at, uh, at at nexa just to try and see the micropores because unlike the sedimentary rocks the basalt you'll, you'll find that will have a problem with the interconnectivity between between, between the different pores the, the permeability. Now, I spoke about uh, the area that we are looking at. This area indicates all the mining. Basically, that would be your Ivanda Gold and Sasol mining, which is, is sort of like interlinked and other mining areas around it. Now, as part of the council, we are busy with the integrated geoscientific mapping. And these four blocks, after realizing that, okay, we have a viable project just outside the Andra, which is Lebuhang in this area here. Let's try and see whether can we also do some geological mapping. And we chose these four map sheets. Now, geology is a funny thing because you'll choose an area only to find that it's just a boring area. As I mentioned earlier, we're just sitting in a Karoo cover where you've got these uh, Karoo dolorites in pink and Karoo sediments. And it just so happens that the mapping blocks, I don't know who chose these from the old timers. It sits just south of where we are expecting the outcrops of the Karoo, I mean, of, 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 of the Transvaal. So it means that going forward, maybe in the next financial year, we'll have to extend our mapping so that it covers areas just outside. We were just lucky that in the south, around Craving Start, uh, towards Standardin and Balfour, we we're actually able to map some outcrops of, uh, I mean, sub outcrops of the, of, of, of the Karoo and the clip of spec and, and other, other formations. This is an old basement map that was produced, uh, published in, 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 in Pretorius, which shows in terms of the geology of what is happening. And you can see this Devon Dome and this Delmas Dome, which had a big influence in terms of the deposition, both of the Ivanda Basin and subsequently the coal above it. Previously, we used to have something we call the Leandra Channel, which we thought it's an erosional channel during my time at Sasol. And you can clearly see it on this section where, because of this rise in the basement dome, we actually get the non-deposition of coal, even the coal is not well developed over the, over, over the, the, the dome. So this is all across the, the Devon dome. And what you're seeing here in this Delmas area, this is where you have this Delmas dome developed. Again, you have this basement high that made sure that everything deposited on top is sort of like not properly, properly developed. So mapping like this, it's quite helpful because you saw how boring the area is looking at it on surface. So we have to go deeper. Uh, I spoke about us doing mapping. Sometimes you are grateful to the farmers. This pothole was drilled in 1937 still standing. I, we found it when we were mapping about a, a month back 
And you can see here on the clip with respect lavas around cradling start. This is the area that you're targeting, although this is highly weathered, because if you look at it on fresh core, it's this unit. You can see with all these uh, uh, quartzitic and calcitic vesicles that you can see, although weathered in this case, and there's also some big uh, vesicles that we can target, which is the area that we are targeting. So this for me was good news because looking at it on boreholes, it's nice solid material. So this will potentially be our aquifer and this solid unit is an aquita, aquita or, or cap rock. And we expect to pump CO2 in areas like these or these ultra mafic units where we expect the CO2 to react with some mafic rocks to, to, to form some carbonates that will help uh, preserve the CO2 permanently there. Now I spoke about some work that has been done and as part of integrated geological mapping, some of our colleagues have done this uh, deep seated magnetic and they've been able to map. You can clearly see the, the Devon dome of the Bushfell complex. And this is the area that we are busy mapping and there's the town of Leandra. So we are sitting in this area here in terms of the project. So work like this, really helps, especially for interpretation and looking at deep seated rocks. We just completed an aeromagnetic survey about a month back. And you can clearly see here, zero to five meters, there's really nothing much. Everything sitting under Karu cover. All of a sudden, you look at 150 to 200 meters, you can see on top of the Devon Dome, where you start getting those shales from the transfer. And they clearly show on the EM survey. This is 150 to 200 meters. So this is fresh information of the press, which we are still busy looking at. We actually even finding some potentially underground mining that happened, which you don't see at surface. And we actually saw that there's a Telmas colliery just in this area here, which information which is currently not available even from the TMRE. But this is work that we're just finding now. So interpretation will be exciting the next few months. I think we'll be very excited to work on this on this type of data. And then as part of CCUS, we also are planning to do some uh, exploration work uh, this year. These are 2D and 3D seismic surveys that we plan to take in the area with the site that we have just here, just to the east of the of the town of Leandra. And we are also planning some, some, some deep uh, borehole drilling up to two, two, point, two, two kilometers to three kilometers that we plan to drill in the area so that we have fresh samples to look at and do some, some, some further work. So basically that is it in terms of our presentation. And if you, for those who don't know, I mean, CGS is spread across six regional offices with the head office being here in Pretoria. And we have offices in Pulukwane, Uppington, Belleville, and that's that's it. I think I would like to acknowledge our sponsor, especially the World Bank, who is currently sponsoring this project to the tune of 27.4 million US dollars in South Africa. So they are partners in this project and obviously our mother company, the, the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Chidani. And, and that was a really informative and exciting stuff that's going on with you guys. I don't know if there's any questions or comments or, or anything that anybody would like to, to discuss on the call. Hi, Chidani, thanks a lot. That's uh, very, very informative. I did see that uh, project that you guys were doing earlier this year and was, was very excited about that. So good to hear more about that. And again, good to see the Council for Geoscience has been so active on uh, areas relating to uh, energy and carbon reductions, carbon dioxide reductions. I just want to know your thoughts, Tulani, if you have any of uh, the academic traction that uh, passive carbon capture and sequestration uh, methods is, are getting. Uh, do you think passive uh, sequestration through things like mafic mine waste. Do you think that's feasible? What's your opinion of that? Yes, thanks. Thanks for the question, Josh. Uh, obviously, I would have let our colleague who's dealing with the utilization uh, speak more on that side, because from us, it's on more on the geological storage. That's why I always put the U in, in brackets. But yes, uh, 
uh, companies like DPS had started a while back experimenting with uh, using CO2 in the in the Kimberley pipes in the in, in, in also the same same process to try and basically use CO2 for creation of of, of the carbonates. But when you talk about capture specifically, because uh, yes, they still talk of direct air capture. I'm aware of projects internationally, but locally nothing except for what uh, Professor Titinji at UWC is doing in the in, in the capture site, and is one of the partners that we worked with previously when we we're still at Sanedi to look at just the capture. But on our side for the pilot, because our target was to say, can we capture at least and capture and store about sorry not capture but store up to 50,000 tons underground just to prove the technology. Hence, I, I also emphasize the term, the pilot, because we are piloting the study so that once the study is, is, is proven or the technology is proven in South Africa, then industry is able to take over. Because as I mentioned, I mean, we're looking at 2% of storage on inland, majority of which is sitting offshore. And had we continued with Zulu land, it would have meant we need to now build pipelines and all that, which is all costly exercise. I mean, we looked at the, the, the depleted gas fields that Petro SA completed uh, in, in the Alcoa Basin. And that's just low hanging fruit, but the issue is always on the issue of storage and the funding for it. So these are kinds of things that have been happening. I'm aware Sasol might be doing something also on the parcels, but it's still uh, information that is, is, is sort of like hidden until we can prove as the department so that we can start building regulation because ours is to assist department to build regulation so that they are able to regulate the, the type of technology. Well, uh, first off, thank you for the opportunity to come and talk to you uh, on this conference today. Um, I'm always willing and happy to come and share my knowledge on thorium and what it is. Now, let's get started on what exactly is thorium. So thorium is one of only two naturally occurring radioactive metals found in nature with a half-life of about 14 billion. And you can find it about two spaces shy of uranium. It's a high temperature material, which is why it was previously used in gas metals. In fact, if you go in Go to a camping store and you buy a gas mantle and you'll see the pink thing, that is thorium oxide, which is used today. But the most common thing that thorium you want to use it for is for the use of nuclear power production. Now, where is thorium found? Well, you've got some basic thorium oxide, which you can find in, in areas, but more often than not, you find it with other rare earth minerals like your monazite, apatite, your basmacite, and a variety of other different things. And as you can see on the map, on the world map on the left, you can find it pretty much everywhere. The only place we haven't found it on is Antarctica, and as I'm sure a lot of people will tell me, you can't mine there, and that's the only reason we haven't found it there. On the more local side, you've got a variety of different locations, including Stencom Scroll, the Makwa Sand, Richards Bay. So it's a very common rare earth mineral to come out. But the problem with working with this mineral is because of its radioactivity, people have a problem with, um, from a legislation type side, because of its radioactivity and because of the difficulty of working with it means that it's difficult to extract and get out. A little bit on the history of thorium, discovered in 1828, and it was named after the god of, uh, of Thor, god of thunder and lightning. But what was really getting into it was they really started looking into it pre the Manhattan Project. But real discovery of it really started post Manhattan Project. And they specifically wanted to test it for use in nuclear weapons. The problem with nuclear weapons is that thorium doesn't work. The yield is too low. It's too difficult to make a bomb from it because of the um, one of the daughters that get
gets produced is a very strong gamma emitter, which completely destroys any form of electronics. And also the fish, highly fissionable material needs to be extremely pure in order to make a weapon. And even when they did that, like I said, the yield was tiny. So from a weapon side, using thorium is just not a very viable option. But they did go off and they did test it in various different reactors. And as my line says, you can end up producing more fuel than you consume. And then they canceled the program. The reason they canceled is because one for uranium was very abundant. Nobody, the, the uranium process has been well established. And because when you actually need to use thorium, you need to recycle it. And because of that, daughter product, which stops you from making nuclear weapons. It also slows you down or makes the process of recovering fuel extremely costly and difficult. Fortunately, the special reactor was designed around the 1970s called the molten salt reactor. And it's now more commonly seen as a gen four reactor, which is like, I like to view it as an upgrade to a conventional nuclear reactors like what we have in Kuburg, which is a light water reactor. Now the processing of thorium from monazite or basmazite or anything of that is difficult. It's harsh. Now you can see it between 140 to 500 degrees Celsius using highly concentrated uh, alkalines or acids. Even when you do treat these things, especially with sulfuric acid, you form this product called thorium pyrophosphate which actually makes it uneconomical to actually extract it further. Because of all these difficulties, because thorium isn't used anywhere in the world, there really is no market value for it anywhere. And if we want to get it into a nuclear reactor, it takes a very long time, something in the region of between four to eight years just to test the fuel. And if it doesn't work, you have to start from scratch. Now, the way the thorium works inside a nuclear reactor is kind of like this nuclear reaction I posted on the left. You've got your thorium with a neutron and it transforms itself into this thorium-233. Then by what we call beta decay, for want of an easier word, let's call it magic for today, it forms into uranium-233, which with a neutron you can produce fission. But more importantly, you produce more than two neutrons for every fission. This means that one neutron can go back and breathe more thorium, and one neutron can go back and fission the next U233 atom. It makes this a great material to use for nuclear reactor going deep into the future. In fact, thorium, like you can see, is three to four times more abundant than uranium, and we've seen our neutron yield. But everybody talks, when talking about nuclear, talks about what about the waste? Well, 300 years. And like we've discussed, you, there's no weapons. And to get to plutonium takes a long time. In fact, you need to, in, you need to add five neutrons to the original thorium 232, no, uh, forgive me, seven to get to plutonium 239. So there's a lot of, a long time to get to plutonium, which makes it unviable for weapons program. The beautiful thing about thorium is I don't have to enrich it, but what I do have to do is I have to add a neutron to it. Considering that most nuclear reactors currently operate on 5% enriched fuel, if you can increase that to the maximum limit of about 20% and add thorium in, then you can actually start breeding fuel. They did that in the UK around the 19... I think around the 1970s. And what's beautiful is you can use it in any reactor type, but based on the method in which you use it and recycling and stuff, there can become a little bit more tricky. And like we said, disadvantages, biggest disadvantage is that it's what we call fertile, not fissionable. It means that no matter how many neutrons are thrown at it, it will not spontaneously fission. It has to go through this process you see on the left in order to be able to fission. And at present, everybody views thorium as a radioactive waste. 
And now back to my company, the Florian Network. Our grand plan is world domination. If that doesn't work, we'll go with plan B. Uh, my company, the Florian Network, is going off looking at developing a global supply chain of thorium using blockchain technology. And we have a variety of things going on. But the most important thing for this discussion today is rather the bottom in that, that we are developing technologies for thorium and rare earth element recovery. What do we use? We use a plasma. And what's beautiful about the plasma is that it takes a complex component like monazite or any other, like this one called ABC, and it separates it into each individual component, A, individual from B, individual from C, and allows us to extract these materials much quicker. And these things have been proven with a variety of different minerals, including zircon, monazite, and a variety of other minerals which I haven't even. We also have a system of called Protract, which is just an advanced solvent extraction system. But using this this combined plasma and protraction system, we are able to get in, we are able to get thorium out much cleaner while producing a nice byproduct in the form of rare earth elements. Just to give a very interesting view, is what happens in the plasma is that what you see on the left is a microscopic image of monazite, and that's on the right after it's gone through the plasma. You can see it becomes a lot more broken apart. In actual fact, that material became completely amorphous, and I can able to extract the rare earth element in under five minutes using our special technology. Just to finish up, from a thorium network point of view, more or less gives you an idea of what it can be. And to finish up my discussion, I want to thank you for listening to my presentation. And I hope I presented something that will give you food for thought, food for thought and will be of great interest to you in the future. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you again, uh, Sarah, for this opportunity to come and present. As you have said, I'm Batoli Lezwane from Emangweni Business Solutions, and I conduct capacity building in the oil and gas sector and also consultancy services. And my topic today is the overview of the oil and gas industry value chain. So you're just going to be hearing something slightly different from what you've been hearing for the whole day. And this is actually the name of the course that we run at Timangweni for new entrants, people that are new in the oil industry. Here is a picture of the oil and gas value chain. And at the bottom, as you can see, is the at the top is crude oil, and then at the bottom is natural gas. They are fairly similar. So the value chain is divided into three. There's an upstream section, mid, midstream, and then downstream. On the upstream side, we find exploration, and production and exploration is about using technology to find new oil resources. And production is, if it's oil, it's bringing oil to the surface using natural and um, artificial methods. And then on the midstream side, we find transportation where then after the oil has been produced, it is moved mainly to the refineries that need to refine it because as it is, it has no value until it is refined. And then of course, as it says here, refining, which is converting that crude oil into finished products. And then downstream, then uh, you go and you go and sell the products, the value added products that, that you have. Similarly on the natural gas exploration and production, but immediately after production, you may process the gas and take it to the market. And the transportation for the gas could be uh, using pipelines or tankers. And then again, the last section on the natural gas side is the distribution into the market. Here is uh, information about crude oil production, mainly on by the African countries. And we see that as a, as a uh, Angola is the biggest producer. Uh, it's, and then Nigeria follows, Algeria, Libya, Egypt, the Republic of Congo, Gabon, Ghana, Equatorial Guinea, Chad is the, is, the, is the last one on the chart. You can see that South Africa is not featuring at this, at this stage. 
what does it take uh, to produce crude oil? This is a, a, an upstream cycle from a Petroleum Agency of South Africa. I took the slide from there. And it tells us it could, if you look at all this timing, it can take about 10 years or more before you get to production. So we're gonna talk about the discoveries in South Africa, and then you'll understand all the steps that go into the upstream cycle where people come to South Africa who want to explore in the South African waters, for example, or even onshore, it's not only offshore, it's onshore and offshore. And they may take a year to read uh, the information that is already available sitting at PASA, and they go through the ste steps of seismics and then the drilling to confirm what they've seen, and then all the steps until production, and production could be from 10 years and upwards. There, there has been some gas condensate discoveries, and the parties that are involved are Total, CNR International, Qatar, Petroleum, and African Energy. This discovery, which is called the Bralpada discovery, was announced in 2019. It was not the first time that Total was uh, exploring in South Africa. They had been in South Africa in 2014, but due to some challenges with the weather and the conditions at sea, they went away and came back. And this time they made a discovery which was announced in 2019. And then a year later, they also made another discovery, the LAPED discovery. And if we look at what is it that is estimated and on the LAPED, they estimate that there could be 2.1 trillion cubic feet or 2.1 TCF gas. And when you when I, I, I think about TCF to explain it, Petro SA has operated, let's say for 20 years uh, uh, from using, using gas to liquid the GTL refinery and they've used one TCF. So for, for people just to understand how big 2.1 TCF is, I always use that estimate of the PetroSA having processed only one TCF for 20 years. And then on the condensate side, it's estimated to, to be having about 112 million barrels. The Bralpada is estimated at 1.3 TCF and uh, 80 million barrels of condensate. Again, if we talk about crude oil, there's an organization called OPEC. Most of you would be aware of it perhaps because it influences the crude oil price that we, you and I get affected when we pour our petrol or diesel service stations. So this organization was founded in Baghdad in 1960 by those five, five countries. Those were the founders of Iran, Iraq, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, and Venezuela. And then after that, all these other countries uh, joined OPEC. Any country is free to join OPEC as long as you are a producing company and also exporting your, your, your crude oil. And what are the, um, the, the, the aims of, um, okay, before maybe we get to the aims of, one moment, yes. What are the aims of OPEC? Sorry. What are the aims of OPEC? They aim to harmonize uh, the policies of the members. They also want to stabilize prices for themselves. And they also want stable revenue and they want stable or steady supply. And of course they've invested. So they want to make sure that they are always receiving a return on their investment. Now, what is OPEC saying about green energy? Uh, from their website, they say they recognize and they support the development of renewables. And their members have got great resources of solar and wind and significant investments are being made in these fields. And then they also talk about biomass, nuclear and hydropower being expected to maintain their share in the global energy mix in the years that are coming. And overall, these renewable energies and nuclear are expected to increase their share in the energy mix from 18% in 2015 to 22% by 2040. They mentioned three primary sources of energy being oil, gas, and coal. And they, and they, and they say these will still supply more than three quarters of the energy mix by 2040. Oil will be at 
just over 25%, and coal slightly less, and gas slightly more. So this just shows that everyone is concerned um, about uh, climate change. So OPEP says all efforts should be made to produce ever clean, cleaner and ever safer energy products. And then the oil industry continues to make huge steps to utilize the latest technology to refine and also to adapt uh, their processes uh, when they are producing. We move on from crude oil, we move to natural gas. And again, I'm listing um, the countries that are produced in Africa that are, uh, have got natural gas reserves. And the biggest reserves are held in Nigeria, followed by Algeria, Senegal, Mozambique, Egypt, Tanzania, Libya, Angola, Congo, and then uh, Equatorial Guinea. Let's look at home in South Africa. There was a news article which says that South Africa could host 291 TCF of gas and 27 billion barrels of oil. So that is huge. And where, where are we in terms of our energy supply? We see on this graph that coal is about 69%, crude oil being 14%, and uh, uh, nuclear and um, natural gas being 3%, and then renewable being the other at 11%. So what is the role of gas? Because uh, in the discussions that are happening uh, around climate change, uh, there is, we obviously know that South Africa uses coal, for example, in Sasol to produce, and coal to, at ESCOM to produce, um, electricity. So what is the role? So the move may be saying transitioning from coal to gas. And what is that role of gas in South Africa to net zero? So upstream oil and gas companies are responsible for a significant part of the greenhouse gas emissions. And they are also the largest carbon emitting companies globally. As a result, the upstream operators are under growing pressure from governments, shareholders, uh, financial institutes to curb emissions and to reduce carbon footprints. So South Africa's potential future gas demand is going to be driven by four key sectors. One is electricity, two is sin fuels, three transport and four a broader industry. Let's look at electricity and we talk about gas to power. So this is about transitioning from coal to gas in generating electricity. This will also enable a high penetration of renewable energy in the power system by providing flexible capacity to manage long duration intermittency with the battery storage, which the battery storage cannot currently address. So if we move and use gas, then we'll also allow the growth of uh, the renewable energy uh, to take place. The second uh, sector is synthetic fuels. This is introducing additional gas to enable the phase out of significantly more carbon intense coal feed stock, for example, as I said, ESCOM and SASO in the production of um, liquid fuels. So this talks about encouraging gas to liquid refineries. Uh, and we have one refinery like that in the, in the Western Cape, uh, which is Petro SA. We're going to talk about it shortly. On the transport side as well, using gas as an alternative to diesel, albeit at a small scale uh, for commercial road transporters in the short term to mid term while the alternative greener technologies mature and become economic, economically viable. So the other green, greener technologies are still at development stage. Hence, they're saying maybe in the meantime, uh, the transport sector could be looking at gas as an alternative because gas is a much cleaner uh, alternative to diesel. And then other industries, it says phase out 
higher emitting coal uh, and to a lesser extent diesel with additional gas as an energy source for industrial heat um, generation and other processes. So we know that there is coal that is used to generate electricity, but there is also the picking uh, plants uh, that are using diesel to, to, oper to generate electricity. So this is what he's also referring to. So we move on to just touch on the refineries in South Africa. There are six refineries in South Africa. This first one is in Devon and it's called SAPREF. And not long ago, we, we read in the, in the papers or heard on the news that they were shutting down temporarily. It's owned by BP and Shell. Another refinery in Deben called Engen, uh, which is owned by the Malaysians, also shut down. We're gonna talk about it just now. Petro SA is a 100% uh, refin I mean, 100% owned by the South African government and is also in Mossel Bay in the Western Cape. In Cape Town, we also find Astron Energy. Astron Energy used to be Caltex. Actually, the service stations are still, are still branded Caltex and they're in the process of rebranding them. And they are owned by Glencore, a Switzerland uh, trader. This refinery called Natref is in the Free State and it's a joint venture between Total Energies and Sasol. Then we also have Sasol on their own uh, in Secunda. These are the name plates. As I said, uh, this was at the, at the creation of the refineries. This is not what we're getting today because uh, most of them are shut. The subject is down, engine is down, Petrosa is down. So currently South Africa's uh, production is from, oh, it, even Astron Energy is down. They're expecting to come back uh, in late this year, maybe November, October, November. So currently only Natref is producing, but they are all importing products in order to keep um, the country wet. So someone was asking me how, how much is a, a barrel? One barrel is, is equivalent to about 159 liters. So if we talk about the refineries um, around clean energy or greener energy, Firstly, they have to produce to a, a one specification. And currently, South Africa is on what is known as Clean Fuels One. This was introduced in 2006, and it's according to the uh, compliance with the Petroleum Products Act and the revised SUN specification for petrol and diesel. Uh, what was happening there? Remember, in the olden days, we had we used to have lead. Um, in, in our petrol. So it was prohibiting the addition of lead. So that should have been lead in petrol. Then when it comes to diesel, diesel has got sulfur and the levels differ. So in 2006, the sulfur levels were being dropped. At that time, they were about 3,000 parts per million to 500 ppm. And we also the niche grade of 50 ppm was being introduced. What is interesting though, is that uh, Petro SA, for example, being a, a, a gas to liquid refinery from inception was producing 50 ppm. So currently we are on clean fuels one, but there has been talk of clean fuels two, which is a more stringent uh, uh, specification. So it's, it was not only spoken about in 2021, as, as this slide is saying, even before then, but then it was uh, put on hold. The biggest debate was the refineries needed to invest. So the debate was saying who's going to uh, reinvest them for their investment in order to be able to meet clean fuels too. So last year, this was the news article. South Africa sets rule to lower sulfur in diesel fuel by 2023. 2023, that was the news headline. And what was it saying? It was saying diesel grades allowed for sale may not exceed 10 parts per million, which is 10 ppm, according to a government notice on the petroleum products regulation, which was dated 31 August, 2021. 
And that, at that time, the last year, they said this rule will come into effect in 2023. What we've seen now is an update on that. Uh, the introduction of 10 ppm sulfur content cap and 1% benzene limit in gasoline has been delayed to July 2027 uh, from, from that date of September 2023, according again to the official National Gazette. So the current gasoline specification at 150 ppm and 5% benzene, whereas for the two grades of gas, or, gas, of gas oil, gas oil is, is diesel, they are 500 ppm and 50 ppm. So this last statement is just telling us where we are. What we also know in South Africa, especially here in the, in the reef, is that Sasol is already producing their diesel at 10 ppm. So they're already meeting the specification that is, is, is dated July, 2027. I suppose a, a, a refinery like Sapref, being BP and, and Shell are ev evaluating their options. Uh, to say what what will what, what will it take to meet this specification? Uh, we talk about engine, so I'm not going to talk about all the oil companies. Um, we're going to talk about engine, uh, Astron Energy, and Sasol. And I see on the program that there's someone from Sasol. Maybe they're going to cover what I, I had uh, extracted from the website. So I was just looking on the website and also on the news. So. As I said, Engine, we had a, a news article uh, that in 2021 that said Engine to shut refinery and repurpose KZN site as an import terminal. So Engine initially had a, an incident in their refinery where there was a fire, but then they made a decision to say they will fix whatever had happened, but they're not going to come back to be a refinery. And instead, they're going to be importing and repurpose at the site. And Engine implemented a fuel switch project at the engine refinery from fuel oil to fuel gas, which resulted in a significant reduction of their uh, carbon footprint. They were also phasing out uh, old tank trucks and replacing them with more uh, fuel efficient vehicles to, to, in order to lower their carbon footprint. So they also have called this project an RTT project, refinery to terminal, to terminal, which is a, a conversion initiative. So they looked at their options uh, and they, the outcome was saying the refinery is not financially uh, viable. And then they saw the upside benefit uh, of shutting down in order to have a positive environmental in, uh, impact. They also mentioned, um, the unaffordability of the capital costs to meet the clean fuel too that we talk about. You know, so they felt that converting it like this will also benefit in the reduction of emissions and in, in their carbon footprint. So they also say that uh, it will strengthen South Africa's long-term security of fuel supply and contribute to lower road transmission transport emissions with the resulted health, be health benefits. Uh, the dates for commissioning this is in the uh, third quarter of 2023. If we move to Astron and just see what they are saying, they are also acknowledging the challenges of greenhouse gas emissions. And they feel that there's constant pressure to produce low emission diesel engines. And the industrial sector can expect continued improvement in energy efficiency and near to zero emissions. And later, the use of biodiesel fuels. So they say it's safe to assume that diesel will continue to dominate and compete at the highest level by continuous improvement of its core technology for many decades to come. So they are looking at the a diesel and the type of diesel engine, but also the diesel itself, as we saw it moving from 3000 ppm to 500 ppm to 50 ppm. Now it, it, it's set to go to 10 ppm. In fact, if, as I said, that the refineries are down and therefore they are importing most of the product. So because they are importing most of the product and the other countries are ahead of us, there's a huge chance that they are importing something that is 10 ppm or even lower because Europe is far ahead 
in terms of the sulfur content uh, in, 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 their, in their products. So they look at also the energy shortage, energy shortages in many countries, including South Africa, when it comes to electricity and using electronic vehicles. Uh, so they say energy shortages in many countries, including South Africa, mean that electricity used to charge electric vehicles may yet be produced by using fossil fuels. So we may be saying we want to change from using diesel in cars, but if we're using it, I mean, if we change to electronic electric vehicles, where is that electricity coming from? They're saying it doesn't help because it's still coming from the burning of fossil fuels. So as a result, commercial fleet operations remain skeptical about the performance of alternative compared to diesel, and there's still a long way to go before the large scale adoption. So this is just interesting to, to hear what how other people are viewing um, the move to cleaner energy. And then again, still at Astron, uh, there's a comment about, despite the economic slowdown caused by the coronavirus in 2020, 2020 has remained the hottest year on record globally, tied with 2016. And therefore it means it is clearer than ever that now is the time to act, to act against climate change. This is about uh, lowering sulfur. Again, this was a news article saying after a major investment of around 400 million, Astron Energy in Milnatsin refinery is producing the very low sulfur fuel oil, which has a sulfur content of 0.5% compared to the previous levels of 3.5. So this was a regulation that was uh, posed by the International Marine Organization, the IMO, in effective January 2020, where all the refineries, or rather, where all the fuel that were that is used by vessels had to be at 0.5% sulfur. So this is about if you are in the field of bunkering, if you are in the in the oil industry, bunkering is refueling vessels to move from point A to point B. And the fuel or the diesel that they use, IMO regulates that. So when you see a vessel on the sea and they check the sulfur uh, of the fuel that is there, it needed to be from 1st of January, 2020, 2020, 2020 it had to be at a level of 0.5%. So Astron and it was confirming that they've met that specification. Again, as I said, the refinery is down. Uh, the refinery will also be able, when it comes back, it, it will also be able to produce fuel to the specifications required of South Africa's incoming fuel legislation. And they say they are bringing it back on and they believe that it, they have a commercial case to do that. So that is all on Astron Energy in Cape Town. Uh, on the total side, uh, there was also a news article uh, that they are active in South Africa through their retail, renewable electricity generation and exploration activities. We saw the exploration activities on the other slides uh, uh, on the brand butter uh, discoveries. They are also leading environmental and community outreach initiatives in the country to promote forest preservation, women entrepreneurship, education, employability, culture, health, and community support. So the forest pres preservation is what I can highlight. And again, news article about Total in 2013, where they were awarded a solar power generation plant in South Africa. And this will deliver clean, reliable energy. And this solar plant is expected to generate 210 gigawatt hours of power each year which represents the electricity consumption of approximately 45,000 uh, South Africans. So that was all on, on total. And as I said, um, I looked at Sasol as well, and I looked at their climate change report and just extracted what may, may, may be short and relevant for this session. 
So out of the uh, sustainable development goals, I'm highlighting one, which is uh, they have these four, and I'm highlighting one where they say, take urgent action to combat climate change and its impact. So it shows that everyone is concerned and everyone is working hard uh, to, to reduce uh, carbon emissions. And they talk about uh, their three pillar emission reduction framework. And the first pillar is about reducing their emissions. So they say short to medium term reductions, including switching to low carbon intensive energy sources, which is renewable energy and additional energy and process efficiency improvement. The second one is transforming their operations. So the integrating integration of cleaner alternative feedstock, that is gas. We know that Sasol uh, receives gas from Mozambique through the Romco pipeline that comes from Mozambique to Secunda. So they, they're saying that they want to integrate this cleaner uh, alternative feedstock of gas and green, and green hydrogen. And also employing new processes and sustainable carbon feedstock to modify their emission profile. And then they say collaboratively finding opportunities to benefit beneficiate their concentrated carbon dioxide sources for unlocking broader societal value. We will see this co collaboration on the on, on the news article that was published. The third pillar they talk about shift shifting their portfolio. So this is about creating sustainable products for new value pools using their Fisher Trop technology. And I saw somewhere that one of those products is on the aviation fuel, which is called the sustainable aviation fuel. And we know that people that own airlines or aircrafts are wanting to move to this type of uh, fuel. And also creating a notable green hydrogen production and market footprint. This next slide is talking about news headlines from the engineering news, where it was saying Sasol aims to begin producing green hydrogen in Sasolberg from 2013. And this was information from their vice president for climate change, Ushamini Haritsin. The green energy hydrogen would be produced using a combination of 60 megawatts of renewable electricity and existing assets, which includes a electrolyzer. A asset. And then this, this just explains that green hydrogen is produced using renewable electricity to split water through an electrolyzer into hydrogen and oxygen. And again, another news headlines, Europe's energy rush spares Sasol to cooking green hydrogen plan, talking about uh, the invasion of Ukraine and Russia uh, being uh, the European countries rel relying on Russia and being threatened that they may not get a, a product from or gas from Russia. So the invasion of Ukraine has Europe searching for new sources to starve Russia of funds to fuel the war. So they feel we must buy from somebody else so that Russia doesn't have the money to fund the war. And green hydrogen will be an important part of this mix. So the EU doubled its goal for green hydrogen capacity to 80 giga, gigawatts by 2030, compared with the less than one gigawatt currently. And the UK just set a target to produce at least five gigawatts of capacity by 2030. And this bottom one says it takes a long time. So still it will take us all at least five years to begin exporting the clean fuel. So I just thought, okay, what is this green hydrogen? What, what can we use it for? Um, it can be used as a fuel, it can be used in transport, providing a sustainable mobility alternative. Cars that run on this clean energy have a hydrogen tank that can connect to the fuel cell, where the electricity then powers the engine is generated. Also where the electricity that powers the engine is generated. The second use could be chemical for chemical industry for manufacturing ammonia and fertilizers or petrochemical industry to produce petroleum products. 
it's also started in the steel industry, which is a sector which is under consider considerable pressure in Europe because of its polluting effect. Changing some of the industry's processes to make them less aggressive to the environment. Domest domestic use. Several sustainable projects are underway that aim to replace the natural gas network with green hydrogen network that provides electricity and heat to households without producing pollutant emissions. So green hydrogen is taking a leading role in the decarbonization of the economy. However, there are still challenges ahead with regard to its rollout, the, in terms of the production cost and the optimization of its storage and deploying minimal infrastructure. So there's still some work that, that needs to be done uh, to get there. Okay, I didn't touch on, for example, Shell or BP, but since these companies are owned in the UK, they're owned in the, in the Netherlands, something is definitely happening in, in, in those companies uh, to, to move to cleaner fuels. And that is me. Um, right, so yes, the dinosaur in the room for for some very obvious reasons, it's an old fossil. But not only that, it's on its way to extinction as far as we know at the moment. So I'm just going to sort of take you through a bit of a, a timeline of coal and then touch on some other subjects. And what was quite pleasing for me to note is some of the earlier talks also refer to some of the topics that I touch on but uh, I will stress I'm touching on them. So please refer to the other talks for queries about that. Just what am I gonna tell you about? The history of coal for, for us humans, the impact on the industrial revolution, some advantages and disadvantages, climate change and net zero carbon. What impact will phasing out coal have? What is clean coal? What is the impact going to be on our economy? What is the just transition, specifically with reference to South Africa? And what could the future of coal in South Africa be? So coal has actually been playing a role in human history for thousands of years ago. The first recorded instant we have of coal is mining in Fushan, almost 6,000 years ago. Then there's a reference to using it in Italy for, for metalworking. Then we go back to China where it was used for heating and carved ornaments. You might think carved ornaments are a bit strange, but you know, in the UK, you can still buy ornaments made out of coal. It's also used for smelting in China. Then if we work, uh, move to the common era, um, we see reference to, to the Romans when they were in Britain using it for heating, particularly for their bars, for forging iron and for religious ceremonies where they had to have an eternal flame. They also used it in the Rhineland in what is now Germany for iron smelting. Coal was used to pay rent back in England. It's actually documented. It was again, back to China, smelting, making coke for the first time. Scotland and Northern England became sort of the focus of, of the English mining industry, where they used it for burning lime, for smelting, for metal working. Um, and coal was first shipped to London from Northeastern England, so from the Newcastle area in 1228. In the late 1200s, most of the English coal fields were worked, but on a small scale at that stage. But the Hopi Indians in North America used it in the 1300s for cooking, heating, firing pottery. Um, blacksmiths and artisans in Europe were also using it. And in 1306, there was the first ban on the use of coal by King Edward I. The citizens were complaining about the pollution and the smell, um, but everybody ignored that and carried on using coal. Then the, the Aztecs in Mexico used it for fuel and again for ornaments. England was the first Western country to mine and use coal at scale. And coal replaced wood for domestic heating, mainly because they'd chopped down most of their forests. The forests that 
is in the UK today, which we often think about as a, a very forested country, is actually a new forest. Um, Scotland really only started to, to mine coal in the 1500s, late 1500s. And in the early 1700s, England first used coke in blast furnaces. 1712, the new common steam engine was invented and it was used to pump water from deep coal mines. Then between 1763 and 1775, they converted that steam engine to run on coal and that led to the Industrial Revolution. Coal was the primary energy source for industry, transport, domestic heating and cooking for over 250 years. And in 1895, um, a Swedish professor published a paper that established the link between atmospheric CO2 and the temperature. Then in 1912, both in the States, Australia and New Zealand, either um, scientific papers such as that was published in Popular Mechanics or newspaper articles warned that the coal combustion creates a global CO2 blanket and this impacts negatively on the climate. So this is what, call it 700, 600 years after the first ban on coal. And again, we ignored it. So more recently, in 1995, we had the, the first COP conference in Berlin in Germany. That was followed sometime later by COP3 in 97 in Kyoto in Japan, which is when we adopted the Kyoto Protocol. In 2001, the Bush administration rejected that protocol. 2010 in Mexico, COP16 recognized the um, IPPC goal of a maximum of two degrees global warming. And in 2015, the last deep coal mine in the UK closed. In 2016, 19 years after we first adopted the Kyoto Protocol, it was finally ratified. It required more than 55 countries that together represented, represented at least 55% of greenhouse gas emissions to officially sign that protocol for it to be adopted. In 2016, Belgium became coal-free in terms of its electricity generation. Um, and in 2020, the Whitehaven coal mine, which is up in Cumbria in the northwest of England, was approved by the UK government. In 2020 as well, both Austria and Sweden became coal-free with respect to power generation. In, nine, in 2021, in November, the Glasgow Conference awarded South Africa, it's approximately 136 billion rand, so eight and a half million, uh, billion dollars for supporting the just transition in South Africa. And that funding came from France, Germany, the UK, the USA, as well as the EU. And in 2022, this year, the opening of the Whitehaven coal mine is still delayed. There's a bit of a fight going on between the environmentalists and the unemployed. Um, that particular part of the England is, is quite depressed and it would give people about 500 jobs. But the environmentalists say that the UK is going against their commitments to um, clean coal. In 2022, we saw the, the start of the Ukraine war and the impact that has had by cutting off the gas supplies to Europe um, has sent the price of coal skyrocketing as one of our previous speakers mentioned. Um, thermal coal is trading at over $400 a ton, which is higher than metallurgical coal prices at the moment. And of course, there's a fair amount of discussion about these European and countries as well as Britain saying, well, you know, they're going to stop generating power from coal and now they're importing all this coal and reopening coal mines. So let me just tell you about the Industrial Revolution. It had three main areas of impact. So that's industry, transportation and communication. In terms of industry, the steam and power that we could generate from coal 
allowed us to mass produce items and factories were born. Before that, it was all cottage industry. The electricity that we could generate from the coal was a far cheaper and more reliable source of energy. Um, and it enabled the development of many other technologies. The heating and the lighting, which was initially powered by coal gas, for example, in street light, um, then became electricity. And it allowed us to operate these big machines and to work at night. So you've got shift work developing. And of course, we've got all the, the chemicals, the byproducts of coal gasification, which is where Sassel specializes. In terms of transportation, steam engines were developed as well as steam ships. And these transported the raw materials. And this is specifically um, into the UK and Western Europe. So it brought in all these raw materials from all over the world, and it was able to take these trade items from that center out into the rest of the world far more quickly and safely than carts, so horse-drawn, or sailing ships. Unfortunately, up until now, I found no record of coal-powered telephones, so I don't think it had too much of an implication on communication besides the electricity aspect. So coal, steam, the transport, and the iron industries all fed off each other and allowed developments to take place, which continued to power the industrial revolution. Coal was cheaper and more easily available than wood, as I've said, and it produces far more energy. Um, I think it was Mark referred to the term an, an energy dense fuel. In the period between 1700 and 1850, the production of coal in the UK alone increased by about 180 times. So what are the advantages and disadvantages? We probably all know this. It's the advantages, it's greater and more consistent heat than, than wood or charcoal. It's a base load electricity fuel, so it's not weather dependent, um, unless it rains too much and Eskom stockpiles get wet. And it is relatively cheap to mine. The disadvantages, obviously it's non-renewable, it's dangerous to mine, it, the combustion of coal produces a number of health hazards, so the socks and the knocks, um, which in Johannesburg you smell when we have an east or a southeast wind blowing, particularly in winter. It produces a lot of airborne particulate matter. So that affects the communities around coal mines. And then minus tysis obviously is a hazard that, that coal miners face. I suppose the, the most important thing that we're thinking about at the moment with regard to coal is the impact on the climate because the combustion of coal accounts at the moment for around 20 27% of global CO2 emissions. There are also other aspects of it, the, the pollution. If you look at the bottom photograph and you look at the two stacks, one very black lot of smoke coming out and one sort of gray smoke, the, the, power, the cooling towers are not producing pollution, that's, that's steam, um, and of course, acid mine drainage. So let's look at climate change and, and net zero carbon. So in 2021, we saw the largest ever annual increase in energy related CO2 emissions. And car, coal is the most carbon intensive fuel. So to get to a net zero emission by 2050, which is what has been agreed at the COP conferences and um, put forward by the IPPC, we need to limit atmospheric CO2 to 450 parts per million and a global temperature rise of 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. That was agreed at COP21 in, in 2015. So that's the Paris Agreement. To do that, we need to phase out unabated coal power. So that's um, power generation that has no CCS. So in other words, all of South Africa's power stations. So the developed nations need to do this by 2030 and the developing nations by 2040. But we're not meeting those targets at the moment. Our current policies, if you look at the, the chart on the bottom, show that the policies will result in 2.7 to 3.1 degrees Celsius of warming. So what are the impacts of phasing out coal? Well, obviously it's going to impact on the local economy. Um, it 
depending on which country you're in, it's going to have a greater or a lesser impact. If you're a coal mining company, like Australia, Poland, South Africa, it's going to have a far larger impact than on a country that doesn't mine coal, but might still burn it to produce the electricity. It's going to have an impact on the price of electricity because coal is relatively cheap compared with um, many other technologies that electricity will, uh, price will go up. And the price will not only be determined by um, the, let's call it the extractive price, but also the transmission price and the security price. Security is another important thing. I've already touched on the, the impact of the Ukraine war, um, but it can apply locally as well. If South Africa can't produce enough electricity for its very energy intensive industry, and it can't import it from surrounding countries, what are we going to do? So the International Energy Association has some recommendations regarding phasing out coal. The first thing is they acknowledge that it will take time to consult and to implement any policies. It's not something that can be done overnight. That we need to support the affected workers and the communities, and this is where the just transition comes in. We need to look at compensation and reskilling. During the transition period, we need to ensure security of energy supply because that imp impacts on your economy. We need to implement a carbon tax, which South Africa started doing a number of years ago. We also need to improve the investment climate for clean electricity and specifically its infrastructure. So the ESCOM in infrastructure is geared very much towards a consistent supply of electricity from a particular generating unit. And as we know, um, renewable energy is not consistent. So that needs to be dealt with at a technological level. And we also need to convert our coal-fired units to low carbon uses. It's not really converting it, to be quite honest. Um, it means closing it down and using the land and infrastructure for something else. So ESCOM has recently auctioned off in inverted commas, um, the land and infrastructure at Kamati Power Station in Mukumalanga, which is a very small power station, by the way, to be used for private enterprise to develop solar PV, but on ESCOM land. So clean coal technologies also been touched on in earlier presentation, and basically it's any technology that reduces the carbon emissions from coal. So the one that has been spoken about the most today was carbon capture and storage or also utilization and storage. And there are a number of sites around the world that are already doing this, as you can see in the top diagram. In 2050, it is predicted that CCS needs to account for at least 20% of CO2 emissions globally in order for us to try and meet our targets. In 2021, the annual operational capture capacity, that's in the, in the power sector and the industry sector, was 40 million tons of CO2 per year. Norway, who doesn't emit carbon from power generation, stored 20 million tons of CO2 in a saline formation a kilometer deep below the North Sea. In 2020, there were 26 commercially operating facilities, which are the ones that you can see down at the bottom. The, the red ones are operational. Um, and we have a number that are in construction and the blue ones are all in development at various stages. Storage is suitable in deep geological formations. Um, what is not covered in that is that it needs to have um, the aquaclude on the top, which, um, oh, sorry, I've forgotten your name, the gentleman from, from CGS a couple of talks ago. So one of the things that is suggested is deep coal seams. Now in South Africa, our coal seams are not deep. They are also very porous and reasonably permeable. Um, so the chances of them being a good site for storing CO2, I believe, are fairly low. If they were a good site, 
we would still have methane in our coal because it wouldn't have been able to escape. And we have very little methane in our coal, which is good news because methane is a, is a greenhouse gas. It's, it's a far stronger greenhouse gas than CO2. Um, but for those reasons, I don't believe that in South Africa, we will successfully store CO2 in coal seams. Um, depleted oil and gas wells are another option, and that is in the States, mainly that is what they use. Um, yes, we do have some depleted wells off the southern Cape Coast. I don't know how far the research on, on using those has gone. And then the igneous rocks with high reactive minerals, which again has been touched on before. Just the CCS, so we heard the talk on, on what the Council of Geoscience has done. Um, Sinedi before them also did some work that was focusing mainly on the, on the legislation side of things, looking at um, technology roadmaps for the power, the liquid fuels and the transport industries. And then there's things like the novel CCS, which again has been touched on. So, that, so that's using tailings that are rich in calcium and magnesium, the, the mafic, ultra mafic tailings to bind with the carbonate, to form a carbonate material. And that's basically what direct air capture does. Um, but maybe there's a, a possibility that we can change our metal processing facilities so that we can enrich the carbon and magnesium content in the tailings, therefore absorbing more CO2. And the, the passive carbon capture, well, the idea is you rake and you till your tailings so that you increase the surface area that is exposed to rainwater and that then reacts with the CO2 in the rainwater and, and holds it in your tailings. Um, storing it within processed kimberlite has, has also been referred to today. Um, and then we could, this is one's quite novel, is you could reclaim the flue gas from CO2 by you dissolve it in a sol solvent and you separate usable solvent and, and the CO2 and you store the CO2. Um, just in terms of flue gas, it's not so easy to capture flue gas from our power stations, and none of them have the ability to be, none of them currently have the ability to be fitted with that sort of technology. Um, Kusili could be, um, and possibly um, Madupi, but none of the others. Have it. They basically don't have the space at the plant to put in um, the infrastructure that you need. So direct air capture, I'm sure we've all seen in the media over, over the years about the, the, the project in Iceland where they pump CO2 into the basaltic rocks there um, and it reacts and forms new minerals. There are actually 19 plants worldwide a lot of them are very small, and the Iceland one is the largest one, at four kilotons of CO2 a year. The plan is by 2030 that worldwide we will capture 85 million tons of CO2 a year, and by 2050, 20 years later, about 980 million tons. So there's another photograph there of Switzerland. That's one of the smaller direct air capture plants. And they actually use the CO2 that they've sucked in from the air and separated out in the adjacent farm, which you don't see in this photograph, in, in the greenhouses, to improve the growth of the plants. So another clean coal technology is what's called the Healy technology. So it's high efficiency, low emission is what the acronym stands for. And you get a number of different plants, the, the latest and most technologically developed are the ultra super critical Healy plants. They burn less fuel, which means they emit less carbon. They also release fewer air pollutants and they consume less water. Their thermal efficiency, so um, the amount of the coal that is converted to energy that we can use is about 45%. On average, the current South African power stations have a thermal efficiency of around 35%. If you combine a Healy technology with CCS, you can reduce your CO2 emissions by about 90% in theory. Um, the higher efficiency means that you have to capture less CO2. 
and then you need a smaller and therefore less costly capture plant, your operating costs are lower, and there's less CO2 that you need to capture, transport, and store. Another clean coal technology is circulating fluidized bed combustion. This is not a new technology, um, but it has not been used at large scale to generate power. When I say large scale, I think in terms of the ESCOM six pack, so that's six units generating between six and 900 um, megawatts per unit. CFBs have only been used for far, far smaller um, generating capacity in the hundreds, not thousands of megawatts. However, one of the things that's really good about CFBs, particularly the supercritical CFBs, is that you can not only do you combust the coal to produce a hot gas and then you use the gas further on, is that you've got this flexibility with the fuel. Basically, you can burn anything in a CFB. You just have to design your boiler for the fuel that you're going to feed it with. So you can't halfway through the life of this plant suddenly change from coal to burning rubber tires, for example. But you can burn rubber tires from the word go or coal from the word go, but you can also co-fire. So you can fire it with other things like gas, which is in fact what Majuba did with the gas from the UCG. They've co-fired one of their six pack units with that gas and coal. You can also use really low grade coal in a CFP. So our current technology needs ideally coal with um, a heat energy of about 20, 21 megajoules per kilogram. Um, it can be a bit lower in, in specific power stations in South Africa, but on average, that's what we're looking at. Um, so if you, and, and mostly South Africa's coal is a much lower grade than many of the other coal producing companies. And we've mined and exported the majority of our higher grade coals. And we are now moving to the lower grade coals, which tend to come from something like the four seam. So the CFB gives you the opportunity to either burn those lower grade coals or um, burn some really poor reject material from our export coal industry and turn it into a low grade middlings product. And because of all this, you get less CO2 because of your efficiencies, or if you fire with biomass, you get a 30% less CO2 than you would otherwise. So what are some substitutions for coal? Well, in power, we've probably all know this, wind, solar, wave, gas, hydro, nuclear, and so on. Um, but we also need to look at the impact that these various other technologies have in terms of the environment, whether that's the natural environment or the human environment. And on that picture of the Hoda wind farm, I'm not so sure that you want to live that close to a wind farm. Um, it can be noisy and they do have an impact. Um, somebody referred to, to the birds. Um, very easy to, to deal with that actually. You just paint a stripe on one of the blades. Unfortunately, that's taking a while to, to be passed into law in South Africa because of the Civil Aviation Authority. They have a role to play there as well. It also affects your bats. Your bats affect the insect populations or the insect population control. So we need to look at a life cycle analysis that deals with these environmental impacts, that looks at the sustainability. So that also means, as was spoken about earlier, what do you do with all this material when it needs to be replaced? And look at the energy security side of things. So there is some pilot scale research going on to retrofit coal boilers with green hydrogen and ox oxygen plus secret catalyst, which nobody knows what it is except the company that's dealing with this, to generate superheated steam. We also touched on green cement earlier, which uses waste materials, so the slag and the fly ash. It requires less energy to produce, and that will then reduce your CO2 emissions. Quite how significant that will be, given, as Mark um, showed us, the 
the amount of, of cement that we use in the world today because of the size of our population. Then there's also green steel. Um, you've got to use green electricity and, uh, and electrolysis and you separate your iron from your gang material. It's, it's a bit like an iron battery, but the anode doesn't contain carbon. And then um, Baxil, you also referred to your sustainable aviation fuels. And what I have read is that the initial aim is to supply Oliver Tambo. Once that's done, then to move on to the export market. So the just, just transition, this is something that we hear about in the media frequently, but different people have a different interpretation about what a just transition is. So the International Trade Union Confederation defines it as something that secures the future and livelihood of workers and their communities in the transition to a low carbon economy. But if you look in Wikipedia, it says it's a framework developed by the trade union movement to encompass a range of social interventions needed to secure workers' rights and livelihoods when economies are shifting to sustainable production, primarily combating climate change and protecting biodiversity. In Europe, Advocates for a just transition want to unite social and climate justice. For example, and I put what to me are the important words in orange, for coal workers in coal dependent developing regions who lack employment opportunities beyond coal. And that applies particularly to Mpumalanga at the moment. So in July this year, our presidential climate committee released the just energy transition framework. That seeks to address skills development, economic diversification, social support, governance and finance mechanisms required to make that low carbon economy a reality in South Africa. One of its aims is the creation of long-term decent work. And I've underlined that because to me, that is very important to mitigate losses from the decline in fossil fuel usage. Now this is planned to cover the following topics, the reskilling and or the upskilling of our workforce to provide a comprehensive social security safety for displaced workers and communities. And it's not only the workers and the communities around them, what about the businesses around them? You think of say Whitbank, Mapumalanga and Lepalali. If you took the coal mines away from those areas, what would they have to survive on? And the JET framework recognizes that it's going to require significant resources to be sourced from both government and the private sector. So let me give you some stats about coal. So if we look on the left, that graph shows you the number of employees, their earnings, and the value of the sales product that they sell for the coal industry alone since 2004. So we employ about 93,000 people. This is 2021 figures from the Minerals Council. And they bring in all the sales from, from that product was about 150 billion Rand last year. And their earnings are about 36 billion Rand just for the coal industry employees. If for the same year, to, or if for 2021, we look at the five top mining commodity products in South Africa, that being PGEs, coal, iron, gold, and manganese, PGEs employ the most number of people, just over 170,000. Their sales bring in the most amount of money, so call it 350 billion rand, and their employees earn about 67 billion rand. And second to that is coal. There's those 93,000 um, employees bringing in about 150 million billion rand to the country and earning just over 30 billion rand. Iron is significantly less. Um, iron employees or iron mining employees are, are not paid at the same scale as previous to. And third spot is gold, um, employing slightly more people than coal, but earning slightly less and bringing in a fair amount of money less. And 
right at the tail end is the manganese industry. So what these slides show is the impact directly on South Africa's economy in terms of employees and what they earn, but also what that brings into the country in terms of sales. If we have a closer look, in 2018, coal accounted for almost 20% of mining industry employees. So the total number of, of mining employees back then was just over 450,000, and 20% of that roughly was in coal. In 2021, our coal employee earnings were the second highest after PGEs, as I've said, and here's, here's a, a, an important point. The Minerals Council um, estimates that each direct coal job supports between two and three other upstream downstream jobs. So um, consultants, for example, uh, selling services and supplies into the coal mines and so on. And each coal related job was found by research done by Coltech a number of years ago, would support on average about five people. So that means in 2021, there would have been between 185 and 278,000 direct and indirect coal jobs. And that supported between 926 and 1.4 million people supported purely by coal. Now in our economy today, where we have such a high rate of unemployment, we have to be very careful that we don't lose any of these jobs and make these people unemployed. The income from coal last year, as I said, was about 150 billion rand. Compare that with the funding for this just transition that the press has been trumpeting about so much, which is about 136 billion. So it's less than what we earned from coal last year. And remember last year, our coal prices had not skyrocketed as they have done this year. The royalties, that was generated by coal last year was just under 2 billion rand that went to the government. Another point to bear in mind is that coal mining is far more mechanized than gold or platinum mining. So that means that your employees is a higher proportion of skilled employees, which could actually be a benefit when you need to redeploy these people if you close down a coal mine. Most of our coal employment, as we know, is in Mapumalanga and Limpopo, and Currently, these are not the focus of our renewable energy technology, but with the, the recent Windlab Sariti deal, which intends to focus on the Pumalanga area, this could change. And then we have spoken quite a bit about energy security and comparing the situation in Europe and Britain today. And what about our load shedding? So coal in this case is not giving us the security that we need. What is the future of coal in South Africa? Well, what we would need to do is to increase our efficiencies, um, so clean coal technologies, right from the mining of coal all the way through to the utilization side to reduce the pollution. So that's your metallurgical industries, your power industries, cement, CTL, your chemical feedstocks, the whole lot. We need to deploy CCS or CUS as much as we can, although as we were shown, it's, it's really in its infancy here in, in South Africa, we need to continue with that. We need to look at co-firing with alternative fuels to try and reduce our pollution. And we could produce gray hydrogen. Now it's not green hydrogen, green hydrogen or blue hydrogen comes from things like, like water in the air. Um, Gray is coal, so it's not ideal, but it's a stepping stone to better things. We could also use coal to produce graphene, and I think it was Mark who spoke about this, which is an incredibly useful material, very, very thin, very strong, very conductive, transparent, absorbs light, and it's used very much in the electronic semiconductor battery industries, composite materials, our phones, LEDs, that sort of thing. Um, and you can actually produce it from coal. So you grind your coal up, you subject that powder to electrolysis, that produces a char, which is a carbon source for your graphene growth via a chemical vapor deposition. And for me, most importantly, is we have to have 
responsible end of life mine closure. So coal is not a renewable resource. All mines will get to the stage where they are no longer economic to keep open. We cannot just abandon these mines. Uh, we need to address the environmental plus the social issues that come with closing the mines. And not only do we need to have good legislation for that, and, and we do have reasonably good um, legislation, but it's the ensuring that that legislation is implemented satisfactory that is very important. So what is coal's lesson to humanity? I showed you that way back in 1306, people were already noticing the, the bad impacts of coal and there was a ban which we ignored. What I'm saying here is without reflection, we go blindly on our way, creating more unintended consequences and failing to achieve anything useful. So for our next energy revolution, let's look at it carefully. Let's do research on all aspects of it so that we at least can identify any of the deleterious effects and try and find solutions before we get into a situation like we are at the moment where our primary most secure form of baseload electricity is killing the rest of us. Thank you very much and I hope you enjoyed my talk. All right, good afternoon to everyone on the line and thank you for the opportunity to um, come and share today on the oil and gas industry in the um, energy transition. And what I'll be touching on this afternoon are the various key role players in um, reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the oil and gas industry, as well as the options available to those role players um, in that um, transition. Now, the oil and gas industry and its operations accounts for 9% of all human-made greenhouse gas emissions and produces the fuels that create a further 33% of global emissions. Directly and indirectly, the oil and gas industry accounts for over 40% of global emissions. That makes it clear then if the world is to come anywhere near to meeting its climate change goals, the oil and gas industry will have to play quite a critical role. There is a mounting pressure to reduce these um, greenhouse gas emissions and companies such as ExxonMobil, BP, Shell and others have committed um, to have committed themselves um, to prepare for a low carbon future. However, there's no consensus on what this actual future looks like as far as, as, as oil is concerned, um, as many uh, issues are still materializing. And with there being no consensus, there are different approaches taken by different companies and different regions. Um, European companies such as French multinational Total and British-based BP, for example, are staking big bets on a pivot away from oil into renewable power. Meanwhile, American giants um, are staking sums of money on more emerging technologies such as um, carbon capture without actually announcing concrete plans to completely shift away from oil. Regardless of the strategy adopted in, in the different regions um, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, it is clear that the industry has its work cut out to contribute to the climate change ambitions. I've identified three key stakeholders who play a pivotal role um, in um, who play a pivotal role in um, reducing uh, the greenhouse gas emissions or actively um, creating an environment which stimulates investment in renewable energy projects. And these are the oil companies themselves, the government, as well as investors and project sponsors. Now, starting off with the levers available to oil companies um, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So, Oil companies have numerous options available um, to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, and we can classify these options under the various types of greenhouse gas emissions, which are scope one, two, and three. Scope one emissions are those direct emissions that occur from sources that are either controlled or owned by the organization itself. 
An example of these are emissions associated with fuel combustion in boilers, in furnaces, or cars, et cetera. Um, and for oil and gas companies, reducing scope one emissions is probably the most straightforward way of reducing emissions. Um, companies can cut emissions of, of methane, methane, for example, which is quite a powerful greenhouse gas emission, um, which is quite a powerful greenhouse gas, apologies, by reducing leak detection and, and, and by improving their leak detection um, and repair systems, by installing vapor recovery units, or applying the best available technology, such as double mechanical pumps, um, seals on their pumps, dry gas seals on compressors, and carbon packing ring sets on valve stems. Um, an example of a company that did this, actually, they went on a drive to replace the seals in their pressure safety valves, which had been found to be a frequent source of liquid of, of leaks. And they were then able to not only reduce those emissions, but they were able to further monetize these streams of saved or captured gas. So that was quite a, a, a double um, benefit. Another option for reducing methane leaks is through improving maintenance routines to reduce intermittent flaring. Now, poor maintenance and reliability of equipment can result in lots of non-routine flaring. And just by carrying out predictive maintenance and replacing equipment that needs to be replaced and doing so timelessly, oil and gas producers can not only reduce their emissions, but also raise their production rates. Then the final factor that uh, assists a lot in the reduction of scope one um, emissions is that of energy efficiency. And I think that's a common thread throughout the options that I've mentioned as well. Um, so various technologies like waste heat recovery technology and medium temperature heat pumps and refineries, all of those reduce the amount of primary energy used in distillation as an example. Moving on to scope two emissions. Now these are indirect greenhouse gas emissions which are associated with the purchase of electricity, steam, heating or cooling. And in general, reducing scope two emission, emissions can be a little bit more challenging and requires companies to source energy from lower carbon sources. And one way to do this um, is through the in-house generation of clean power. Um, for companies that don't have the internal resources or expertise to install and maintain power generating equipment in-house, which is typical of most oil and gas companies because their, spe their specialty would be in oil and gas and not in, in, in clean renewable power, these companies have the option to use on-site power purchase agreements. Now, with an on-site power purchase agreement, a third party will be responsible for developing, building, and operating the equipment that is installed on the company's property, and the energy will then be fed to the company's electrical system. The company that owns and operates the equipment will then sell the energy um, that is at a price that is agreed upon in the PPA. Um, and the benefits of an on-site PPA eliminates the upfront, upfront cost of acquiring and installing the equipment, and it places the maintenance um, responsibilities on the operator. Um, then an example of this form of greenhouse gas reduction is, is a company, for example, using on-site renewable power generation to provide a cost-effective alternative to diesel fuel. And by just replacing generators with a solar PV and battery setup, a company is able to then reduce its emissions. Furthermore, or, um, oil and gas companies can also consider connecting onshore or nearshore rigs and platforms to the central grid as opposed to a decentralized diesel generation. Um, and as an example of a, a company that did this and it, it is called Equinor. So they recently connected one of their fields which lies 140 kilometers offshore to the grid. Um, then finally, um, another option for reducing scope to um, greenhouse gas emissions is that of looking at greener feedstocks. Um, so replacing some conventional oil feedstocks in refineries with bio-based feed feedstocks or recycled plastic materials would also um, contribute to reducing emissions. Moving on to scope three emissions. These include those that are generated by producing the raw materials that are purchased by the business 
as well as the emissions from using the company's products. So scope three, unlike one and two, covers a much broader life cycle type emission and um, that holistically captures a company's footprint. And by virtue of that, they are the most challenging to reduce. However, they have the largest um, impact. And by means of demonstration, um, end user fuel consumption represents probably 80 to 90% of some oil and gas companies' total greenhouse gas emissions. So those have quite a significant impact. Reducing scope three um, emissions therefore requires a twofold approach. Firstly, the companies need to reduce the carbon intensity of their total energy sales by increasing the proportion of renewables and biofuels in their portfolios. Secondly, companies then need to invest in net negative technologies such as carbon capture, utilization, and storage to offset their emissions from their natural gas and fossil fuel sales. Now, there are many um, companies in the United States that are placing a huge emphasis on carbon capture in their future plans. And the benefit of this pathway is that it allows the continuation of oil production while the carbon capture balances out the new emissions. In fact, the added benefits of carbon capture is that the captured carbon can also be injected underground to help extract even more crude in a process that is called enhanced oil recovery. And examples of, of, of companies who are going with this route are Exxon, which recently announced um, $3 billion in carbon capture investments over the next coming years, as well as Occidental Petroleum, who have made this technology the core component of its plan to hit net zero emissions by 2050. Um, ultimately, whether the focus of oil and gas um, companies is on scope one, two, three, or all three of them, um, oil and gas companies need to, 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 to make this focus um, as part of their ESG programs as they contribute to the environmental footprint. And this really requires the companies to invest in a range of both short and long-term technologies. Now, moving away from the, 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 the contribution that can be made by the oil and gas companies into the contribution that um, governments can make to creating an enabling environment that will stimulate investment in renewable energy projects. Um, so government could consider initiatives which stimulate investment in the decarbonization of existing operations and in new energy projects while pioneering sustainable energy opportunities in their countries. I'll start off with the United States again. So the, the, the US government has incentivized carbon capture utilization and storage through its 45Q tax credit, which targets carbon capture and injection for both carbon dioxide enhanced oil recovery and long-term sequestration, as well as carbon emissions reduction through use in industries such as chemical manufacturing. And beyond these tax incentives, the US government has also invested in research and development with um, the energy department, which is providing millions of dollars of domestic um, carbon capture utilization and storage research and pilot projects um, in recent years. Um, and these projects can go a long way in promoting technologies that could reduce emissions from plants across the energy and industrial sectors. Um, it's very important to just note with, with carbon capture, the business case works only under specific economic conditions, such as the tax relief that I've mentioned or the imposition of a carbon price. Without some kind of regulatory framework, um, carbon capture becomes a challenge to create value in and of itself. So governments really have an important role to play here. Then if we bring things closer to home in the African continent, there are some companies, uh, sorry, some countries such as Kenya, Malawi, and Rwanda who have already introduced incentives such as tax holidays, value added tax exemptions, and import duty exemptions for renewable energy businesses to encourage the sector to scale up. Kenya has also announced plans to launch an emissions trading system that allows companies to buy emissions allowances through a carbon credit and green asset registry. So those two examples demonstrate just how um, integral government intervention is in creating and fostering um, 
uh, an environment that stimulates uh, renewable energy project investment. Then moving on to the role that investors and project sponsors can play in, in, in the decarbonization of the oil and gas um, industry. Um, with the increased pressure to reduce these emissions globally, we are all aware of how funding and investing for, for high carbon source projects is becoming increasingly unavailable. So to improve the, bank, the bankability of, of oil and gas projects, project sponsors could prioritize decarbonization in the very early design phases of oil and gas projects and consider incorporating carbon offset opportunities right at the beginning um, or the front end of, of design projects. Um, and an example of this is a, is a $10 billion deal between Total Energies, the China National Offshore Company um, Oil Corporation, the Ugandan National Oil Company, and the Tanzanian Petroleum Development Corporation. So with this project, which aims to develop crude oil production in East Africa, um, this project intends to take steps to limit greenhouse gas emissions to below 20 grams, kilograms of CO2 emitted per barrel of oil, including solarizing the East Africa crude oil pipeline and extracting LPG for use in local markets to offset more carbon intensive cooking fuels. Um, the project also includes a commitment to develop one gigawatt of renewable energy, which is quite impressive. So as I um, draw towards a conclusion, um, with global calls to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions and the various pathways that are available to do so for oil and gas producers, it is clear that big oil really is standing on the precipice of something big. But no one can quite agree as yet what that is. Um, we are not sure whether the impact on, on oil will be a long, slow decline, whether it will be an abrupt collapse, or whether it will be a remarkable reinvention. I don't think any of us is, is certain as yet um, which one of those options um, will materialize. But what we can be certain of is that the pressure is mounting to urgently address climate change globally and to transition the energy sector into a greener one. And as important as the energy transition is, I'll conclude by saying that the current energy crisis we are seeing in Europe offers a glimpse of a future where transition to a low carbon economy that is not properly managed or stress tested against scarcity and volatility might produce recurrent market crash, um, crunches and actually hinder the decarbonization trajectory. So it is very important then that whichever pathway or solution that is taken in terms of decarbonizing, decarbonizing the oil and gas industry, policy and decision makers in the space should avoid solutions that focus exclusively on emissions reduction, but rather the focus should be on solutions that find the optimum balance between energy security, affordability, and sustainability. Thank you. Right. When, when we discussed with the society, and this must have gone back to about March or April, uh, just something topical to talk about, at that point in time, my opinion was that in terms of this whole push for renewable energy and it's intertwined with climate change and then kind of all gets packaged into ESG, um, and I sensed that the, that the investment world had really run ahead of, of where the technocrats and the, and, the, and the sort of space where you guys all operate. And, um, and I think certainly as the Russian invasion has had a big impact on, on energy and food, we, we, we're seeing this play out. And now there's this big tussle regarding renewable energy and trying to, how do we sort out the energy crisis and move on from there? So this was the topic, and I'd just take you through thoughts from the investor side and then crossing over into, into the space that you guys probably all operate. Okay, so typically every picture tells a story, and you can see when we all look at pictures like this uh, and we see degradation of the environment, 
it's very easy to understand why um, there is this increasing voice uh, against miners, mining operations, uh, because typically it's just seen to be um, offsides and, and not really uh, looking after the environment. As we go through the chat, as I said, renewables are just inextricably linked to climate change and, and ESG. Um, Right, I thought a couple of years ago, Statista put out this um, infogram, which uh, sort of summarized the, the transition to the new green energy uh, economy. And uh, they then showed research that suggested that this would be heading towards being a 30 trillion, and they called it a mega trend. And then they stacked that up against other industries. And so, that I think back 2014, 15, 16 already got the attention of the investor community and they moved very, very swiftly. Um, okay, I'd just like to have a look at um, PricewaterhouseCoopers last year did a big global investor ESG survey. And if you look at the second line below the main heading is that basically they're saying ES, uh, investors are catching up very quickly and they are ready to act. And again, I'm going to keep reiterating that they are ahead of the mining related world in many respects. So in terms of responses to a couple of questions, you can see the questions there that were asked of ESG an important fact in decision making. Yes, 79% yes. Should ESG address ESG issues, um, even if it reduces short term profitability, 75% agreed. Um, should ESG performance measures be included when considering executive pay? And as much as 68% said yes. And then the interesting question was, am I willing to divest from companies that aren't taking sufficient action on the ESG front? And 49% said no, they wouldn't. But I guess the important thing is that 51% would have said yes, they are prepared to take action. So the message is that the pressure on the mining related world is getting bigger and bigger. So some more of their findings uh, was that this pressure is gathering and basically there's no free lunch here anymore. So back in 2016, when PwC did their survey, only 39% responded in saying that they saw climate change as a threat to their investments. Five years later, Last year, 70% of asset wealth managers expressed a concern about climate change. So you can see the swing uh, was very, very substantial. Um, and then 75%, uh, sorry, 75% uh, 70, thought it was worth noting that you could sacrifice short-term profitability, but 67% were unwilling to accept a reduction in the return on their investments. So what you can see is if you didn't have a share in your portfolio or mining company, it didn't really matter. Yes, you want them to, to be subjected to all the climate change and the ESG measures and guidelines. But if you were invested it, in it, you didn't want to be negatively impacted in terms of a return. And so you see the investors are still a little bit torn between making that tough decision. And a lot of it is certainty around the data and the information that, you, that, that the investor is looking at it. Um, and then I'm not 100% certain in my mind how critical this is. And there's probably people in the audience that know far more than I do, but a company called Carbon Trust, they found that scope three emissions accounted for about 65 to 95% of the broad carbon impact of most companies. Now, when investors were quizzed by PwC, they found that 65% of the investors only focused on scope one and two emissions, uh, whereas the 35% balance focused also on scope three. Um, so that's a moot point is, should we be forcing investors and everyone indeed 
to go right down the channel into the supply chain as deep as you can to work out what the true exposure to carbon is for each individual company and the products and services they provide. Um, all right, and then 29% uh, uh, of investors voted are prepared to vote against appointments of directors and they took the stand and would divest if ESG matters weren't adequately addressed. Um, so again, just pointing that um, there is this fairly strong arm from the investor community in, in looking at what's happening in the mining world. Um, and I think the bottom line again is that all investment firms, pension funds, insurance companies are going to face ESG regulations and reporting issues. And in turn, they are going to channel that back onto the underlying investments. So yeah, in a positive sense, there have been trade-offs and there has been progress. Um, in California, the big utility PG&E, um, they suffered tremendously with their big overhead power lines uh, during those times of wildfires. Um, and they had decided to spend $20 billion to bury about 16,000 kilometers of power lines. It's now got to the stage because of what's happening in the environment, um, the, the, loss, the losses that this company utility is incurring are just so huge that they have to spend that type of money. And then BP looking to spend annually 5 billion on renewables. So these are massive shifts that we are seeing. All right, and then Bloomberg came out with a survey. In fact, it's still being flighted on, on the television Bloomberg channels at the moment. Uh, it was sponsored by the uh, uh, Mabudala Investment Company. Uh, that's the OEE um, investment company. And what they looked at here was, what are the three top motivations for considering ESG? And greater returns was highest at 44%. And then when they asked social responsibility, 40% said yes. And greater diverse, a greater opportunity due to the disruptive nature, i.e. more opportunities coming, uh, that got 39% of the vote. And then when questions around sort of sustainable Sustainable investments uh, will increase by at least 20% in the next five years. 45% said yes. Um, that investment is a powerful driver of a more sustainable future. I think that makes sense. 86% said yes. And then 71% agreed that eventually no investment decisions will be made without ESG considerations. So again, the heat and the pressures on. Um, just some of the other comments that came out of the Bloomberg uh, future study. Uh, they predict now this ESG asset base will increase to 50 trillion from about 40 trillion at the moment. And that is 50 trillion out of 140 trillion of assets under management globally. So that is a very, very big number. Uh, and you'll see in the following slides um, how the big asset managers have focused on it. And really, I think one of the issues, and I guess in many respects, it is early stage, although there's great enthusiasm, but the lack of defined standards to assess performance then becomes a barrier to investment in this section. So we really need to grapple and get our minds around what answers do we really want? What goals do we need to achieve with climate change and ESG? Um, and then back that into the rules, the reg regulations, and the benchmarks. Um, otherwise, you'll find certain people um, making up their own tick boxes and their own set of rules. Um, and it's, yeah, it's a lot of hard work to get this all uh, aligned. Um, and then part of the other part of the study was 32% of respondents believe that renewables and clean energy yield highest return on investment. Um, and that's, again, I think a little bit of sort of brainwashing and telling you that if you do the right thing, you will make more money. I think most of us know that between that happening now and that happening is uh, we've got to get a lot of things right. And there's going to be a lot of costs in getting to this sort of utopian 
type of um, world that people hope we can get to. Uh, and then just interestingly, they found that although the E, the E, the environmental factors dominate at the moment, what the survey showed is that by 2030, that social issues will contribute more um, value to, to the whole ESG matter. Uh, and again, that then talks to how you're handling people, be it your staff, be it your customers, your shareholders, your stakeholders, communities. Again, just big pressure. Um, so while we're trying to get there, just sort of some sense, uh, Elon, just a quote at the bottom from Elon Musk. He attended a, a Norwegian conference this on Monday, in fact. Uh, I watched the interview. And, you know, he, as much as he is pushing through Tesla into the electric vehicle world, you can read it for yourself. He just says we have big ch challenges. The transition is going to be going to take decades to complete. And I completely agree with that. All right, so let's have a look at a, a big asset manager like BlackRock. Uh, they have now, they're the biggest fund manager in the world. You can see total assets under management. Note how they've streaked up since 2017, 2018, doubled. Last year, their funds under management hit 10 trillion. They, have, they went back in 2017 and they jumped onto this bandwagon in a big way. Uh, and position themselves as the global industry leader in ESG. And um, really that, that they have now pushed through their whole investment process. I mean, they have a huge department of people that is all they do is pull together these ESG and then talk to the rest of the analysts and the fund managers as to how that fits into the investment process. Now, a little bit cynical because we're a small asset manager and we can't afford this, but have a look at the financials last year. 10 trillion in revenue. On average, they charge about 0.2% fee, brings in $19.4 billion. Sorry, that should be dollars. Uh, their net profit after tax, 6 billion. I mean, they make a profit after tax margin of 31%. Now, with that amount of revenue coming in, they can set up big, big departments. And as all they do is pull this ESG story together and create tick, tick box guidelines for the analysts and for the fund managers. Um, and so, wow, you know, it's very difficult for anyone outside, say, the big top 10 to do the type of job that these guys do. So what, what they, they then went on a big, big marketing campaign and they just said, look, climate change is an investment risk, but we are in the best position to be able to integrate this into our portfolios and therefore we can build great portfolios that are more resilient uh, and achieve better long-term um, risk-adjusted returns. Uh, and of course, they keep pushing this narrative that we're on this cusp of this transformational change to sustainability, but they don't tell us when sustainability is going to be achieved. So investors are getting dragged along in the belief that it's imminent and things will be fine. Uh, and I think that's where the technocrat world needs to come and, and really make its voice heard that, that um, we're in for a long, slow road here. Right, and then you'll see the other marketing sort of spiel that they put here. We work on behalf of our clients and we feel a responsibility um, to integrate this ESG into our decision-making. And so that you're then, uh, we preserve your, the client's best interests. Um, and then, you know, they keep on again, the last comment there, integrating separately the E, the S, and the G metrics and showing how this can help you pursue long-term success as though it's a guarantee and it's not really a guarantee. All right, and then uh, a little bit of kickback from the industry. You may have seen recently uh, reports on both Goldman Sachs and Deutsche Bank uh, facing greenwashing allegations, i.e. in the and these companies manage many, many, many 
uh, different funds with hundreds of companies underlying. And so it's hell of a difficult to trace and track exactly how accurate is their ESG measurements and how do they filter that up into individual funds. But uh, they've, they've come under quite a bit of pressure and uh, we'll see what happens. But if you look at that, that industry, which is totally 40 trillion, um, people are starting to look inside and say, uh, what are you guys doing? Are you as good as you say you are? And uh, increasingly, uh, retail investors are becoming a bit skeptical uh, and they don't necessarily believe that it, ESG ratings can show you exactly what the impact that underlying companies are having on the environment, social, or governance. All right, let's jump to local South Africa, one, Coronation Fund Managers, uh, one of our top two, three biggest in asset managers. They manage about 600 billion rand. Again, uh, huge fees are drawn off that and they are then able to staff up accordingly. What they'll tell you is that all their reports that they compile uh, are compliant with all of these um, guidelines and statutory requirements, uh, which you can read through at your leisure. Um, but you can imagine the amount of work that you've got to do. You've got to understand all of these documents and then integrate that into your process. So the way coronation handle things is they, they look to integrate this into their process. They do, they do recognize that this is a continuing journey. Um, and what they do is a three-pronged approach is, is they look at integration of ESG into their decision-making process. At the same time, they fully engage, so they say, with, with the underlying companies that they invest in. And they would rather work along on a collaboration sort of mode uh, rather than not having a discussion and just sell the shares. So they're also trying to encourage and support companies in achieving uh, ESG goals. So I thought this just gives you an idea how, how big this gets, certainly for a, a, on the fund management side. So if you're gonna go down the road of engaging and collaborating, um, you're going to have um, meetings, could start off with being emails, eventually it gets to meetings, second meetings, third meetings. Um, they found that on the engagement, positive outcomes was 39%, ongoing is 48, and they had 13 negative, 13% 13 of the engagements were negative. On the number of interactions with companies, um, that's when they physically now go and visit. 51% had one engagement, um, where they had to engage two or th a third time, 33%, and where they went back more than three times was 16% of the time. Now, how big is all of this in the life of a, a fund manager? Is that they engaged last year, 256 engagements across 121 companies. Well, if you take 250 working days a year, that is one engagement per company every working day. And then if you look at, at resolutions and voting and, and attending shareholder meetings, 6,400 resolutions voted on. If there's 10 per, per company, that's 646 companies that you could be covering. And that's local and international companies that they invest in. If you're gonna have 524 share, shareholder meetings, well, then that's literally two shareholder meetings every single day. Um, so you can imagine the staff and the skills that you're going to have to put into these ESG departments. And this is part of the problem is that only the big can really afford to do this properly. Let's jump across to the miners side. I've used Impala Platinum. And again, they'll start off, I guess, as a starting point uh, and say so you've got to be globally aligned and they will use the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And I'm sure many of you know um, what those goals are and most of our companies abide by that or try to at least. Um, 
this was an interesting summary, and I hope you can see some of the fine print, but Impala then rank their material matters and they scorecard it. And you can see safety ranked first, 9.22%. Um, you can go through that whole long list, but this is typically, apart from actually getting down the, getting down the mine and producing, these are the issues that management and in fact the workforce are being confronted with and it's uh, it is endless uh, we've got to find a way where where people grow up just understanding all of this and you don't have to be taught it um, you know i guess by the time you leave home you should be you should have this uh, as a way of life but what the miners, what I've said up at the top there is that miners' tick boxes have increased to match the tick boxes of, of the investors. Goldfields reported recently, and I just thought I'd show you what out there, there are so many organizations. Some of them are linked to stock markets. Some of them are outside. Some are auditing type firms. And they are all running around trying to rate and rank you in terms of your ESG. And, you know, now we've got to get our minds around is just how accurate is this? Uh, who are the ratings for uh, and what has exactly been achieved here? Um, we use Refinitiv for as our database. That's the old Reuters. A lot of people use uh, Bloomberg would be similar. So all your listed companies, all their historic financial information are on these systems. They're massive. And when you click on a company, and I clicked on Impala, they also now provide uh, an ESG metrics and, and scoreboard. Uh, and then if you click individually on the environmental pillar or the social or governance pillar, you click on those numbers, and then you can go and see how they derive the number. I must say I looked through this, and they don't dig too deep, but the problem I have is that when most investors just looking for a general feel about, in this case, an Impala, they're going to look at this and they're going to believe it. Um, Where we've got to get to is understanding how accurate the underlying search and information is underneath the ES and the G. Right, so... You know, what I want to get to is that the investors are way ahead of the technical engineering world. This is typically uh, a one-page fact sheet that a fund manager would put out on their little fund. Left-hand side top are characteristics, number of shares in it, the top 10 holdings, um, some long-term earnings projections, market caps. On the right-hand side is within your fund where is your money allocated to information technology, health, financials, wherever? You can see that there. And more recently, they are starting on the bottom left to put carbon metrics. And in this case, there's only two. There's carbon emissions and carbon intensity. And note, there's also a benchmark that the company or the fund is ranked against. Difficult to see, but in the small print, they will tell you that, again, only scope one and two are used. Um, if any of you are interested, MSCI, that's Morgan Stanley um, Index, uh, I've given some, some of the sort of uh, examples of what they would exclude, uh, nuclear weapons, tobacco, coal, oil sands, et cetera. If anyone's interested, on the right at the bottom, I've, I've put the website in there. Uh, msci.com.documents and if you just add msci esg screened indexes you'll then access a lot of very useful information of what these investment rating agencies are looking at um, so just trying to get to a little bit of reality is um, a couple of years ago statistic put this this together and this is the united states and whilst there's this great focus on renewable and green infrastructure, here we are in a country as advanced as America is. And what this analysis showed that 171 and a half million crossings on over 45,000 structurally deficient US bridges. Every day, people are subjecting themselves to danger. 
And we are so quick now to run and build a whole new infrastructure and we can't even look out after our old infrastructure. So that just speaks to the enormous amount of metals that are gonna be needed. Uh, this research was done uh, in Europe. Uh, Euromato came out in April and really what they did for the European Union was to look at the heading was the energy transition is a commodities transition and what increases in metals are gonna be needed and how is Europe going to cope with it? And you can see the increases are just potentially insane. You just have to shake your head and wonder where all the metal will come from. And so really uh, just finally to end and say, have, have investors run ahead of reality? And I would say without doubt, yes. No doubt that we need to clean up the environment. Um, these themes are, are very, very compelling uh, uh, and they are gathering a lot of community so support to, to embrace ESG. Um, the big investment houses, were very, they moved very, very quickly to create new brands. This was a whole new stream of revenue. Of BlackRock's 10 billion, 3 billion of that, those funds are uh, 3 trillion rather of the 10 trillion or ESG funds. So you can see uh, they, they're onto a good thing there. Uh, but they are advanced. They have ESG reporting. They have ESG benchmarking. It's all in place. It's supported by powerful media and marketing campaigns. And, you know, on our side, and I say our side, I put my mining hat on. Uh, SAM codes now still needs to fully integrate ESG into the codes. Um, and really my, my abiding question is where are the qualified ESG practitioners to sign off as competent people? Um, so I think you can see that there's a lot that the technical side has to do to catch up. Uh, and I'm urging you all to actually get your voices heard because the investment community are just deciding on, on how the world's gonna work. And then they decide on whether they're gonna give you money or not for projects. Uh, well, the technical world is, are the people who are gonna supply the metals and minerals. So the reality will dawn this gun to the head of fossil fuel producers, uh, exacerbated obviously by the Russian invasion. This has led to a, a global energy crisis. Um, the green energy transition is gonna require huge amounts of additional quantities of metals. Um, the, the more we put ESG regulations and guidelines, the more we potentially hamper and slow down exploration and project development. And then every single company that is reported now, mining company, are talking about a severe global shortage of critical mining related skills. I just think in closing that there is a massive opportunity awaits for people in the technically related areas. Um, you guys have got to get out there and beat the drum. Um, it's, it's, in fact, it's desperate in terms of the lack of skills that are coming into this industry. And there's a lot of experienced people that are going to be shifting out of it shortly. And uh, it's not a case of fighting back against the investment community. It's a case of catching up and being able to have a sensible debate with people as to how we're going to fund and finance um, the metals and minerals that are needed. Right, thank you. So much, Bruce. Um, oh, there's already a question from Tulani. Hi, thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Bruce, for an interesting talk. It sort of like triggered a lot of questions or comments I've been meaning to make uh, after each and every speaker, but I suppose it's easy to sum it up after your talk, because it seems like as technical people, we are now caught in between. We are just tools who are caught between the investors and the communities. Because this is one question I've been trying to see in most, or if not all the presentations to say, where do the communities fit? I'm sure the issues we've had in the East Coast where some exploration was stopped because of community participation and involvement uh, is, is, is notable within this audience. Because for me, the question is how much 
uh, is all this ESG costing, especially to the developing country. Because in one moment, I was talking about the universal access to energy, which we know as Africa is still lacking. And yet at the same time, we have these projects that we want to do. I mean, for the longest time, we battled to answer this NIMBY question, not in my backyard, where we want to take this waste to a rural case at end, people who have no access to electricity. And the question is, why do you want to bring it to our backyard? Because we don't benefit from this electricity generation from ESCOM. So the question is, how much do the communities have in terms of a say? Because on one hand, we have the investors, we have the money. And on the other hand, we have the other guys who have nothing but have just their piece of land that they are residing on. I've also noted with concern, a few weeks back, I was visiting some of the mines in the, in the Mpumalanga area, Delmas area coal mines, how most of these small mines are now trying to scramble to start up because I was even shocked that most of them were on care and maintenance, I suppose because of the COVID and everything else that followed after. But now that the coal price is sitting $400 a ton, like Leslie said, everyone is scrambling to try and resume operation and they can't even get to start because the operation is either flooded or the, the plant is something or the other. So this is just the one challenge. In fact, yesterday or day before I was listening on the radio and there was an interesting comment from a lady in the UK who was talking about energy prices that they now need to find about 12,000 UK pounds per annum just to pay for their energy need. So it seems like it's going to be to be a hectic winter for the for the northern hemisphere this coming winter. And I don't know what's the comment in terms of also Sasso. Last week there was, there was talk about gas prices going up about 90 something percent uh, that Sasso wants to start charging. Because in all for me it comes back to saying what are the investors willing to do to assist the developing uh, countries? Because at some stage, banks were even saying they are not to touching any coal investment uh, projects. If you are going to be mining coal, they are not even going to look at you. But how much is that cost to us as a people, as a developing country? Thanks. <clears throat> Yeah, Talani, okay, yeah, I mean, you, you're right. Uh, all your questions you had in, in your mind have sort of come through now. Okay, so so there's a whole lot there. Um, maybe just start because it's slightly separate with the, with the UK and the energy prices. Yeah, this is e exactly the issue when people ran off and, and put a gun to the head of fossil fuels, oil, gas, coal, um, money was withdrawn, working capital gets withdrawn, insurance becomes more tricky, and they just made life difficult. So th those companies stop exploring. They're not going to put new capacity in place. And you know what happens when you stop spending, and even, even on maintenance, things can deteriorate very, very quickly. And we were heading into a squeeze, on the energy side, and with the Russia invasion, boom, that just blew it right open. So there are serious shortages, and to get back on track, it's going to take it's going to take years to do it properly. And uh, so, yeah, uh, bad decisions, uh, not talking to the technical world and listening to them carefully, has meant that now we have this this energy gap. And yeah, it's going to be really hectic uh, for a lot of people around the world. Uh, I don't see how they're going to fix it quickly. Um, coming back to some of your other things, and I mean, when when you when when if you take the East Coast where where the projects were stopped, and you've got communities on the one hand living there and saying, well, you know, where's our share? And really, I I think we've got to go back and. It, you can't have every single community jumping on every single project in my mind. It's got to be coordinated through government. It's governments, government earn the taxes or, or pull the taxes in. They've got to fairly go and spread the taxes across the country. 
and often the communities arrive after the projects. Uh, they gather around the project. I grew up in, around gold mines. There were never any communities there. Only came much, much later. But we need to point big fingers at government. Government, you need to get really smart long-term policy in place, including tax policy. Uh, and then they look after the communities. I had a debate with Northern Platinum on last Friday. There's such ongoing problems on the eastern limb of the bushveld. So I said, why don't you tell government you're going to take the royalties instead of paying them over to government. If all the PGM miners took the royalties from the eastern limb and invest them back along the eastern limb, it would be a far happier situation. But government won't let them do that. So, yeah. Government, if you want to talk communities, I think we need to talk to government. And then your issue about where new projects are, just remember that typically uh, you're not going to find new mining, new metals and minerals in Europe and the UK. They are all typically in the Southern Hemisphere, or a bit in Eastern Europe, Asia, but they are in poorer countries. And so they've got to take their hard-earned strong currency, dollars, euro, and go and invest it in emerging markets if they want the metals. If they want the consumer materialistic life that they enjoy, they're going to have to risk taking the stronger currency and invest in an emerging market. Um, yeah, and, and if you pile ESG, uh, shortage of skills, you just have to wonder how are we going to get enough metal out of the ground. So, uh, yeah, those are important questions. And I want technical people to engage with government uh, far, far more strongly than they are doing. Zara? Is there anybody else that, that has any comments? And, and thanks, Bruce. I, I completely agree with you. And, yeah, it, it's, um, it's a multidisciplinary um sort of solution or, or problem that everybody needs to be aware of and 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 participate with including like you say the government uh, the two are somehow linked because of me the umusa group and etala group in etala group we develop from scratch renewable energy projects and the renewable part of it is the biomass rather than the solar wind and, and, and other natural resources. Uh, and the Musa group is a little bit broader in, in looking at the energy opportunities. Even though it might be green, there might be some transition parts, including the talks, the touchings, the consulting that I'm doing, right? Uh, so start to separate the confusion that might arise if we're saying Etala is on the green side, and then I do the transition, I address some oil and gas issues, or even look at an opportunity that might be uh, using coal, for instance, as, as a feedstock. Then that's why I've set up a separate company that looks at a slightly different approach to addressing the same thing in the energy now and in the future. My background is both in manufacturing, corporate management, as well as entrepreneurship across different sectors. So it, it's uh, even though I'm a trained scientist, but I've got a very strong hands-on social entrepreneurship and social work uh, that I do. On the green side, for instance, the biomass side is addressing what Tulano was talking about earlier on, where we say, how can we make sure that the rural communities get to benefit by being in the mainstream economy in the energy space, not just by putting in the wind and the solar, but by using the rural land that are grossly underused. So let's farm the feedstock. We don't have to talk language of raising the land bank money or any other bank money then these people would have to have business plans and all sorts of things and capital, and then use this very same land as collateral. Uh, so it's a risky operation. Let's rather work with them 
be the end, be the market in other words. So we will farm with them, but then we take the feedstock from them. So we provide a different approach to securitizing the very feedstock. Uh, and if anything happens, we take the land away. So we don't talk the language of wanting to buy the land that way it's dispossessing the very people. Instead, we just want to have access to the land without them being dispossessed. So they become a stakeholder in the business that way. And many other innovations that uh, in, in approaches that to look at in addressing the energy situation. So if you can flip to the next uh, slide, uh, Sarah, please. Thank you. Right. So in this case, on the topic, what are the challenges and how can they be addressed in the in the mineral space? So we're suggesting what, just like what uh, uh, a few other people also said, one way is to produce the clean energy on site or have the company coal mine or any other uh, having access to clean energy so that they can use the clean energy themselves and then i've made examples where exaro not so long ago bought a company tata was involved and now uh, we've just spoken about uh, 30 with the with, with wind power now that one to me is even more interesting because it's addressing the transition where those coal mines are, whereas the other options are having the wind mines and the, sorry, the, the, the wind turbines and the solar panels, obviously where that resource is in abundance, but it tends to be a little bit away from where the current operations that will have to be scaled down or eventually shut. So, but this is where Umusa comes in. With the coal fines, you can gasify. So you can then use that using a technology that Sasol pioneered to generate synthesis gas, which is combustible. So you use that gas to then generate electricity, power of any kind, which can still be fed to the existing infrastructure, the ESCOM lines, transmission lines, to anywhere. Uh, but the whole point initially is to use that power on the premises of this feedstock. In this case, the current coal mines would have this unsellable waste in the form of coal fines. Even the ESCOM, you know, um, whatever around the dams, those coal unused or low grade to be bent, then can also be part of the feedstock to then generate the electricity. So in Umusa, that's what we're talking about. So whereas with Etala, we only develop our own projects. Whereas in Umusa, we can help companies to be part of a generation for themselves, or we can also be a partner in owning that operation, provide the technology or provide the advice, whichever way would suit all of us that way. Uh, uh, so another one is value add. So beneficiary and all in all, instead of extracting the resources and as South Africa has always done for many years, including right now, the coal that we extract, most of it is exported. The little bit that then is used is really for power generation, but very few other beneficiaries then come along. And there's so much that can be done. Um, I think it was, um, can't remember who was talking about the graphene and the fire and the coal that can be value added to graphene. And there was also a char, which is uh, you know waste from from coal. So from the gasification technology that we we plant very much, not just coal gasification, we also talk a uh, biomass gasification. So gasification is more efficient than uh, having to ban any feedstock, and then you boil with that heat, the water, South Africa being a water scarce country. So we're avoiding all the energy and other resources, competition and NAX problem and pollution issues at the same time. So we improve the efficiency by proposing such sorts of technologies that way. Uh, so in this case, 
we're saying uh, when you are using gasification and the, the way some of it could be the biochar. And that biochar is char that is very high and pure in carbon, which can be used for steel manufacturing. It can also be used like the person who was uh, speaking about graphene, you know. So you beneficiate even the waste that you generate in producing power that way. Just one example. Um, and then um, a beautiful one is when you're talking about the actual technology improvements or getting involved in developing technology as a miner. A classic example is Angloplat, which has developed a hydrogen fuel cell for their damper, uh, the, the big dump trucks. If you can flip to the next slide, please. Thank you. So with the renewable energy, there tends to be a little bit of um, a one-sided view, purely because South Africa has had the issue of load shedding. So firstly, when you speak energy, most people think electricity and that's it. Yet we all know that there's more to energy. There's transport fuels, there's, uh, in this case, heat. Well, South Africa doesn't really use it much, uh, the, 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 the heating for houses, because it's not that cold like in Europe and those countries. But yes, in the renewable space, it's not just solar and wind. There's hydro, there's geothermal. Uh, one of, I think it was Leslie was speaking about geothermal. Uh, and there's also the biomass. And then and, and the, 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 the municipal solid waste uh, is regarded also as biomass. And that can be part of the feedstock in generating different types of energy. So in this case, we then differentiate it between the states of matter. So we talk solid, liquid, and gas in this case. So with solid, we talk charcoal, we talk uh, wood chips, we talk wood pellets, those being the renewable resources or feedstocks. Then on the liquid side, we talk uh, biofuels, which could be bioethanol, biodiesel, or biojet, uh, uh, which falls in the category of sustainable aviation fuels. Or we talk synthesis gas, synfuels, which could be petrol, diesel, jet fuel, as well as hydrogen. So the difference between syn gas or synthesis fuels, synthesis, as most of you would know, is when you are manufacturing something. So it's manufactured fuels, where else the oil industry is not really manufacturing, it's more refining. So it comes as an energy, and then you separate it out, fractionate it, and come with different products uh, of different other energies plus chemicals. Whereas with the thin process, you convert not necessarily something that was energy, by then start producing a, a base molecule, which is a gas. From that gas, you can then either combust it, which is syn gas, or you use that as a, as, as a building block to manufacture chemicals, which could be fuels as well. That's a big difference. Then biogas is a waste in itself because it comes from, in this case, the sugar uh, processing or the abattoir waste, or um, yeah, it could be agricultural in many different ways. When you then put that in a big anaerobic digester, it ferments on its own, and then the gas that comes out of that is combustible. It just works just like LPG. So in other words, we're saying you can manufacture different types of gases, which then goes to what all the people who are talking about the, the gas in the world actually now is talking about the gas fueled type of uh, energy. So instead of having the natural gas, which is cleaner than uh, coal and oil, but you can then have a bio or a, a, an even cleaner gas that you can manufacture, syn gas or uh, biogas and, and, and such gases, as well as hydrogen as a gas. So there are different, many different renewable energies other than solar and wind, that's what I'm highlighting. And the, the, the last point would be the green electricity itself can be generated from these different energy sources that are renewable. Again, let's remind ourselves that when you talk about renewable uh, is about replenishing the very resource you're using 
either it replenishes itself or you find a way to recycle it in much quicker way because even coal was something else before it must have been an animal or a tree with different animals but it has taken so many years to get it to crude oil or gas but we are extracting that much quicker than it can replenish itself so renewables is about a, a, a quicker way of replenishing what you've used so in the case of uh, uh, timber you're planting trees and then you use the trees but you continually plant the trees so in terms of uh, sugar or energy crops it's the same sort of thing so and then you find a way of generating the energy in such a way that you don't then in the process pollute or create waste so it's, it's a full value chain that you need to look at then if you can flip to the next one please thank you all right now the biofuels oh by the way if i can ask that we be more interactive so if you can just raise your hand quickly um i might not see your hands all the time but Sarah will help me out on that one then we can ask questions at the time instead of waiting necessarily for end of the presentation feel free to do that please all right on the biofuels again it's a renewable liquid fuel it can be in this case a bio diesel or a bio ethanol process now biodiesel is in terms of uh, the the, the, the chemical, com chemical composition for its use is substitutable with diesel so if you are running a vehicle or a generator using diesel you can swap it around just like that you know with the biodiesel or else with the petrol it's a different arrangement in south africa you need to have an engine that is able like in brazil to switch from one to the other so it is a replacement for petrol now in south africa and most of other countries we don't have engines the vehicles that run on engines that can do that so let's find a way to have the technology that is currently in use that can use an alternative fuel without tempering with the very engines so bioethanol gets mixed with petrol so it reduces the the emissions of petrol it makes it greener so that blending of bioethanol with petrol is is what we talk about in south africa with diesel same thing you can mix the ethanol or bioethanol with diesel but biodiesel itself it, it, it works just uh, as well the difference is with biodiesel it comes from the oil crops canola uh, red seed uh, sunflower oil or you know uh, soya now again in africa and in south africa you have to be sensitive to using or not using anything that might affect the price food prices so with soya and sorghum uh, and, and sugar, sugar cane and that, uh, we would rather make sure that you are using, unlike in Brazil, a feedstock that is not currently or can be used as a stable food. In Brazil, we know, and other countries, what they do is they look at the market. If there is all of a sudden a bigger price to get when you are producing table sugar, then they switch their bio on the furnace to manufacture table sugar. But if there is a bigger demand, that the price uh, it fluctuates in such a way that it favors uh, either a, a sugar or an ethanol, then they switch over again. Now, we can't afford that in South Africa. That's why we're not using maize to generate bioethanol. But sugar, there is a glut of it. Uh, and even then, we are promoting that we rather use new areas to farm sugar in this case sweet sorghum or sugar cane or any other crop for that matter without changing or channeling the existing sugar fields to using to produce the an energy product okay so on the biofuel side which we blend the liquid pit stocks with the existing fossil fuels diesel or petrol or jet fuel uh, then the next one would be the synthesis synthesis of synthetic fuels where you're converting 
the solid waste, so sorry, the solid fuels into a syn gas. Now, the solid fuels could be coal, could be even biomass. When you're using a technology, a reactor called a gasifier, which is, I use an analogy of, for those that are not familiar with it, of instead of burning the feedstock, you subject it to heat in a contained environment. So there's very little oxygen or no oxygen at all. Uh, and then uh, you can just ignite so that it just starts the fire inside the reactor, but then there is no oxygen, so it doesn't burn. So you, 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 you allow the heat to rise and the heat in fact, that commas, the biomass or the feedstock could be coal. And what you then move that from a solid fuel past a liquid phase to a gas phase. This synthesis gas is a concentrate of hydrogen and carbon monoxide gases. Both of them are combustible in their individual rights, but they, as a syn gas, can combust. So you can, as it is, you've now created a gas that doesn't appear in that form in nature, thus it's synthesized, and then you can generate electricity and heat uh, wet, which you can then use to run your very plants. You then either can use that as building blocks to manufacture other chemicals, including fuels. So that's what we're talking about there. And the technology is fissure troughs that convert the, the syn gas to the fuels. Uh, and there is another technology uh, that uh, is using syn gas to hydrogen. Now, with that is green hydrogen, because green hydrogen is, is, is about, uh, okay, when you are color coding hydrogen, it's more about the source or how you got to make the, the hydrogen. So if it's coming from renewable, either source itself or the energy that you use is renewable or cleaner, then that is seen as green hydrogen in, in short. Now, in South Africa, the oil refineries have been producing hydrogen for many years. Only they've been using their own processes, which are obviously not green, using the fossil fuel feedstock and whatever. So you, there's now an opportunity to then have, for those that might be coming back online, to use green hydrogen to feed to the oil refineries so that they can then green their processes or the product that they manufacture out of there. And then the natural gas is another, where uh, it is greener because gas burns cleaner, more efficient, and there's got less impurities than the other fossil fuels. So in that case, we talk about uh, uh, Petro SA, but only let's talk about that. Uh, but now, Sasol is also talking moving that way. So yes, on the natural gas side, uh, there are opportunities. Now, we being in this case um, on, on, on a platform of the, 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 the Jolob gist. So the interest would be, how can we use the mined materials to go green? Uh, earlier on, somebody mentioned that engine, I think it was Bakoil again, who said engine uh, had moved, I think they switched their fuel. They were not really going the same way as, as Sasol and Petro SA to using a gas to manufacture their products. Instead, they decided instead of using their own energy, in other words, uh, crude oil being refined, and then you use the same product out of that process to generate electricity or energy to fuel the processes, they decided that let, let, let them rather use a cleaner energy source. So they then tapped on fossil gas that was passing in Devon in front of their gate, which is cleaner to fuel or to generate the energy that they were using at the oil refinery down in Devon. So that's uh, uh, just the difference as to uh, what they were doing, just to clarify that part, uh, because when you talk about engine, we talk about Petro SA, well, then we talk about Sasol using a gas source. That was the main difference that I wanted to highlight there. If you can flip to the next one, please. We've touched on this in a way. Renewable gas fuels 
would be the biogas, would be the thin gas, would be the flue gas. Flue gas, there is a technology by Lanza Tech which can convert that to ethanol. So there are technologies out there that uh, you know are able to process and value add what otherwise is waste. Now we propagate or we promote uh, issues of being more efficient in your process. For instance, flaring. Flaring is an indication of either a planned or an unplanned leak of, in this case, could be the oil refinery, and then uh, the gas that gets released could be because of an efficient, inefficient in the process or uh, a, a shutdown or a problem or a leak. Then it automatically ignites on the chimney stack when there is uh, going to be a gas that would otherwise be polluting. But that is energy straight away. The mere reason that it burns is energy that gets wasted. So we can look at, we promote that uh, you can reduce less of the energy that you're using by being more efficient or looking at how uh, the inefficiency is addressed or even changing some parts. You might be investing a bit of money upfront, but then you reduce in the process. By using less energy in your processes, you reduce your carbon footprint. That's just one part where the renewable gas fuels that could be even the flue gas or uh, the, the chimney stack could be reused or maybe make other products or even uh, generate electricity. Hydrogen is one of the gases uh, that is becoming a flare of the moment. Hydrogen itself is most abundant as a gas in our planet. Yet hydrogen itself doesn't, is not as much out there as a gas in its own. So it's trapped in water, trapped in hydrocarbons of many different other. So to then extract that for use is a challenge. At the same time, storage and transportation is a challenge, but it is a clean gas. It is uh, without any waste when you're burning it, uh, you only produce water. So it's a, it's a beautiful, usable for transport or stationary uh, generation, stationary vehicles and uh, generators as a liquid fuel, even though it's a gas, for it to be transportable and storable, you then have to compress it so that it is transportable as a liquid. So there might be that confusion, say it's a gas, but then it's a liquid, well, which is which. Hydrogen itself, I think somebody mentioned again, that uh, for vehicles, you can use the current system where you've got a, a tank which you can fuel, just like you're doing with the liquid fuel, with a gas, in this case would be a hydrogen gas, which then feeds an engine, in fact, that commas, which we call a fuel cell. So that it's, it's, it's a mixture of a, a combustion system as well as a, an electric system. So the gas goes in to fuel a battery, and then that vehicle is actually, in essence, an electric vehicle. The only difference is you don't plug it onto the mains, you're using a hydrogen to generate the very electricity within a moving car if, or truck or a, a generator. So that's how a fuel cell works. That's how hydrogen fuel cells work, basically. If you can flip to the next one, please. Thank you. All right, um, I've just touched on this in a way. Even though hydrogen is known to be cleaner burning, more efficient and uh, no, no waste that is polluting, it is, challenging to, to manage. I've used an example there that you need 350 to 700 bars compression just to store it. And uh, now an equivalent uh, is just to simplify it. The four by four vehicles use about two and a half bars. So if you're talking about 300 to 700 bars, you can see the difference in pressure that you need to uh, put hydrogen in some type of a container and or you lower the temperature to minus 200 degrees 253 degrees now any gas to be converted to a liquid you need to take the energy out of it you then lower the temperature now compare contrast the hydrogen to uh, liquid nitrogen gas you talk about liquid nitrogen gas in a liquid form, 162 degrees centigrade. And this is 252 degrees centigrade 
minus versus the minus 162 degrees centigrade for LNG. So yes, so there are challenges, but there are many different people working on how best to maybe instead of doing this, but have some type of an absorbent that you can move around that uh, like a sponge, uh, one of those would be the LOHC, which is liquid uh, oxygen, um, sorry, liquid uh, organic hydrogen carrier uh, and many different ways of how to get that. And South Africa is involved in that technology development uh, through uh, I think University of um, Northwest as well as the University of Western Cape through the department, DSI, Department of Science and, and, uh, and Innovation. Okay, uh, then we will talk about uh, the, the water, in this case, which has to be split with most people talking about electrolysis. Besides the, the splitting of the water, which in itself is high demand for other things. So you can either maybe consider using seawater, but seawater has to be desalinized first. So, so whilst the electrolysis method is tried and tested, it does appear they still work even there to further make it to address not just the energy, but also the need for water. So the ESGs that uh, we just spoke to Ella about, um, uh, that would also be something to look at. So whenever you could, we have industrialist minds with means of getting water and using the water in the, the communities around there uh, don't really have reticulated water. Same with some farms. You would find a farm that is irrigating, uh, able to extract water from miles away, kilometers away to their area. Yet the communities where the pipe is going past don't have water. So how can you then coexist such that you don't use water only for generating commodities and yet there are social needs that are not being addressed? So it's one of the things that we, 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 we will talk about and try and uh, highlight to investors and uh, to industrialists uh, and, and scientists like yourselves. If you can move to the next slide, please. All right, so green hydrogen, we've touched on that uh, in, in, in the, the challenges that are there. Yes, it's going to grow. And uh, we're talking about uh, replacing fossil fuel once you have fossil fuel generated hydrogen from gray, blue to green. There is a lot of work to be done there. But yes, there's going to be a demand to green our environment many different ways. Um, and this can be shared, I'm sure, Sarah, this will be shared with everybody that uh, either everybody that registered or those that are interested can have access to the to this presentation. So I will not be reading line by line as I'm going through this. If you can flip to the next slide. All right, I alluded to something like this. That's a big 200 and something ton uh, truck for open cast mines, the dump truck. What Angloblad did, it runs on diesel. Some of you are familiar with this. And what Angloblad did is in an attempt to not only reduce the diesel use or to be cleaner, but also have a product that they'll also use using some of what they mine. So this is a fuel cell driven truck. Now, a fuel cell has platinum in it. An Anglo plate, one of the products they currently, that currently uses platinum is uh, the uh, catalytic converters. So in the liquid fuel engine exhaust system, to reduce the emissions that come at the back of the exhaust, uh, it converts and uh, you know it reacts, it reduces the, the the negative impact to the environment. So that's one way, not the only way that platinum can be used in the energy sector or the market itself. So fuel cells, Angloblad recognized that instead of sending it to anybody out there, 
would then produce the fuel cells and bring the fuel cells back. There wasn't anybody anyway that has the fuel cells to size that can fit in this truck. So they started not only to bother about creating the market, but they decided to let them be the market themselves, but not just the market of using what is there because there was nothing. Then they created a fuel cell that can run this size of truck. So it's the first in the world to have a fuel cell that led. It's the first in the world to have not just a prototype because that is that was uh, uh, launched, I think it was about two months or so ago. So it's working. The idea is to have all their dump trucks running on fossil fuel, sorry, on, on platinum um, embedded technology that uses hydrogen as a fuel to generate electricity to run these vehicles that have got the fuel cell with platinum in it. Now that technology obviously can be for anybody out in the world, not just for the mines that Anglo has in the world. So there is just one example where South Africa on the resources that they have, vanadium, thorium, or any other mineral, graphene, coal, you don't just produce to use within yourself, but you can develop technologies that themselves can be sold out in the world. And then we reduce the balance of payment when we have got not just consuming materials that come in, but we can also export some of the materials and the commodities.